Miniature, starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Ellie Weingart, Elissa Fraden, Jeff Lupiton, Joby Cerny, Roger Mueller, Elizabeth Lido, Christian Stolte, Doug James, Kurt Nabig, and C.J. Amari. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Finally, 12 o'clock. Let's go to lunch. Hey, Charlie. Charlie, it's recess. Oh. Thank you. I just want to finish up here. Trying to make us look bad? What do you mean? Now, just what do you think I mean? Hey, just forget it. Come on, we'll be late. Look at him. Little goody two-shoes. Why don't you guys lay off him? Because we're mean, heartless brutes. Right, Fred? <laughs> right. Well, I think he's nice. Hey, Mama, don't forget to change his diaper. Charlie? Hello? Aren't you going to lunch? Oh, yes. Any place in particular? Yes, in a way. Where? Well, it's in, in the museum, actually. The museum? They have a, a very nice cafeteria. Uh, it's quiet there, and, um... Would you like some company? Well, I, 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 I mean... It's okay, Charlie. I understand. See ya. Hey, look at the dinosaurs. Wow, that's the biggest elephant I ever saw. It's a woolly mammoth, you dope. Come along, children. Keep up with the class and don't touch anything. Cafeteria closed. Oh, no. And here we have one of the world's greatest collections of primitive art. Excuse me. Pardon me. There are selections from every period. I direct your attention to the New Guinea exhibit. Some of the pieces, the sepic shields, for example, are hundreds of years old. But some were made as recently as 1950. Now, this is because New Guinea is still a largely unexplored and therefore unspoiled land. Most natives of the interior will live and die without realizing that the world extends beyond the limits of their jungle. Sorry, I'm not part of the group. Uh, let's stay together, please. Now then, the natives speak over 500 different languages. However, uh, you'll notice that their art has a great unity. Of course, they don't think of their carvings as art, not in our sense of the word. Uh, this first piece in the glass case was meant to frighten away evil spirits. Uh, this one is a protection against disease. Oh, and this one... If, 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 I, if, I, if I could just get by, please. I'm, I'm on my way out. Help you, sir. What? You look lost. Can I help you find anything? Oh, no, that, that's all right. I just got turned around. Is, is the cafeteria closed? For the rest of the week. They're remodeling. Well, I'll be leaving then. Main entrance is that way. Thank you. Have you seen the Egyptian wing? Pardon? Egyptology. They have a nice exhibit. Is that right? Just downstairs, next to the Hall of Miniatures. Miniatures? You know, the model houses. They have the palace at Versailles, a log cabin, a New England church, a whole room full of them, all made by hand with little dolls inside that look just like real people. Pretty amazing. Have you been there yet? No, I, I, I only come here for lunch, you see. Well, you might as well take it in now that you're here. Not many people go there, but it's really something. All right. I think I will. Turn left at the bottom of the stairs. You can't miss it. Thank you for the suggestion. I'll, uh, I'll have a look.
To most of us, a museum is a place of knowledge, of beauty and truth and wonder. Some people come to study, others to contemplate, others to look for the sheer joy of looking. Charlie Parks has his own reasons. He comes to the museum to get away. It isn't really the low-priced cafeteria meal that draws him in here every day. It's the fact that in these cool, inviting halls, he can be alone for a while, really and truly alone, away from his work and from people who don't understand, which includes almost everyone in the world. But Charlie should be careful. He doesn't know it, but there's always a chance he might wander too far and get lost in the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Miniature, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Nineteenth-century townhouse, home of Boston residents, Mr. and Mrs. Copley Summers. The figure represents their daughter, Alice, and was carved in wood taken from the original balcony. Hmm. Will you look at that? What in the... Found it okay, huh? I excuse me, but... Yes, sir? I guess this will sound silly to you, but... How do they manage that? How do they manage what? In there, in the, in the glass case. Oh, well, I couldn't say exactly. I know they use magnifying glasses, little tiny tools, single hair brushes, that kind of thing. Must go blind making them so small. But the girl... She's so realistic. Isn't she, though? Long black hair, lace dress. Look at her fingers. They didn't miss a thing. Little rug, chair's got teeny tiny doilies on it. But how, how do they get the girl to move? Servo motors? Microchips? How's that? The girl playing the piano? It's, it's stopped now. I don't think I... There, see her sitting at the piano? She was playing just a, a few seconds ago. It was, um... I, I don't know, um, something, something like this? Didn't you hear it when you came downstairs? I don't like jokes, mister. Not when I'm on duty, anyway. I'm not joking. Then you're hearing things. There isn't any mechanism inside that piano, and the doll's carved out of wood, a single block of wood. See the sign? Yes, I know. Carved in wood taken from the original balcony. But I, I could have sworn... Yeah, it was probably some kid with one of those pocket radios. They sneak them in once in a while. But I, I saw her move. At least I, I think I did. Well, you know better now, don't you? Yes, I, I know better now. Here he comes. Finally. Where do you think he's been? At the zoo. Visiting his relatives. <laughs> Charlie? Yes? There's a note on your desk. Mr. Demo wants to see you. How do you do, Mr. Demo? I. Yeah, I'll sit down, Parks. I'm sorry I'm late getting back from lunch, sir. Well, I'm sure you have a good excuse. No, no, sir, I don't. I just let the time slip away. I, I don't know how it happened. You know, Parks, that's the first sign of humanity you've shown in almost four years. I beg pardon? Up to now, you, you've you come and gone like some kind of wind-up toy. Never early, never late, always keeping to yourself. What, don't you like us, Parks? I've never thought about it, sir. Well, think about it now. Do you like your co-workers? I suppose so. Oh, you, you suppose so? I mean, that is, I, I, I don't d dislike them. I'm afraid that isn't good enough, Parks. An office is like a, a team or a platoon. Either it works together or it doesn't. And here, it doesn't. And the reason is you. I knew you were a square pig when I hired you, but you were bright. and uh, Well, I thought we'd wear those edges off. We haven't. No, not at all. You're still a square pig. You understand me? Yes, sir. I think I do. I'm going to use the excuse of your being late, but I can't. The fact is... I'm letting you go because you just don't fit in. I understand, sir. Um, Parks. Yes, sir? 
No, this isn't any of my business, but how old are you now? 37, 38? 35. Yeah, yeah, 35. Don't you think it's about time you gave up living with your mother? She needs me. Oh, why? Is she ill? Not actually ill, but my father died some time ago, and my sister is married, and, well, she needs me. I see. Look, you're welcome to stay on a few weeks. If... No. That's very nice of you, sir, but I'll manage. Well, you can pick up your check tomorrow. Thank you. He had no right. He had every right, Mother. Hiring and firing people is his job. But why you? He doesn't think I fit in. That's ridiculous. What are you doing? I'm going to phone that man and find out why you're being persecuted. Mother, please, it, it, won't, it won't do any good. Oh. oh, Charlie, what's going to become of you? I've worked so hard to bring you up right. Maybe if I'd let your father punish you the way he wanted to. It's all right, Mother. This is just a, a minor setback. You say that every time. Why can't you keep a job, son? Why do you always end up making people uncomfortable? I don't know. I suppose they blame me. Well, I'm not keeping you here. I know that, Mother. Nothing in the world would make me happier than to see you settle down with a nice girl, raise a family, live a normal life. Please, don't cry. I can't help it. I hate to see you hurt, son. I'm not hurt. Well, you should be getting fired. It would have killed your father. It would have absolutely killed him. <laughs> I'll go to the employment bureau tomorrow. Here. Take my handkerchief. Uh, where are you going? To my room. Get me my heart medicine before you do. Yes, Mother. Charlie? Why were you late getting back to the office? I, I was... detained. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. I was detained. That's all. Open your mouth. Charlie, do you feel all right? Yes, Mother. I'll, I'll go to my room now. What's that you're whistling? Pardon? You were whistling. I don't remember. You should lie down, Charlie. Take a little nap. Mother, please, I can take off my shoes. I'm only trying to help. I know, but I'd prefer to untie my own shoelaces. Very well. I'll bring you some cocoa. Not now. Why? You always have your cocoa. I, I think I'll, I'll go out. At this time of day? We'll be having dinner soon. I want to get a head start with the Employment Bureau, see if there are any jobs. But they must be closed by now. Th there's still time. I think I'll walk over. It isn't far. Are you sure you should? Why not wait till tomorrow? Get a fresh start. Do you want anything at this store? Not that I can think of, but... Sit in your chair in the living room. Put your feet up. Are you sure? Try not to worry, Mother. I'll be back in an hour. Back again, huh? Yes. Anything in particular? Is it still open? What's that, sir? The, the the miniature room, you know, downstairs next to Egyptology. Oh, sure. Thank you. I came back. Wait. Where? Hello? Hello? There. I was afraid you wouldn't be here. Oh, well, you've changed your dress. That's a lovely gown. Very lovely. 
Are you going out? Who's that? Oh, you are going out. That's why he's wearing a cape and a top hat. Your gentleman caller. Does, does he have a carriage waiting? I hope so. I wonder where you're going. To dinner? No, something grand. The opera, that must be it. Hi. Oh, hi. Be closing soon. I see. What time do you open in the morning? Hmm? Nine o'clock, Monday through Saturday. I'll be here. What's that? Nothing. I'll be along in a moment. I want to study this dollhouse a while longer, if you don't mind. Okay, sir. Just a few minutes, though. It's almost time. I, I see. Thank you. Have a nice evening. I have to go now. I, I won't be here when you come back. But I... I hope you have a... a nice evening, Alice. Where's old Charlie this morning? Don't worry about him, buddy. My brother never misses breakfast. Charlie, your breakfast is getting cold. You see, late for his meals, awake every night, tossing and turning. I tell you, I'm half dead with worry. Mother. He's sick. I know he is. Sounds to me like he's got a girl. Don't be silly. It's silly about it. He's not a bad-looking guy. A little peculiar, maybe, but, you know, he's not... If he had a girlfriend, he'd tell me. He hasn't told me, so it isn't possible. Okay, okay. Nothing would make me happier than to see Charlie settle down. He knows that. I'm not one of those mothers who won't let go of their children. Ask Myra. Pass the butter. Charlie! I'm here. Your breakfast is on the table. Sorry. Hey, Charlie boy. Hello, buddy. How are you? Couldn't be better, Charlie boy. Couldn't be better. Good morning, Myra. You're looking nice. I wish I could say the same for you. I, uh, I, I, ha I haven't been sleeping very well. Because of the job? Yes, I, I suppose so. It's been terribly hard on him, pounding the pavement every day. Boy, that can get you down. Charlie. Yes? We've got a surprise for you. Tell him, bud. Well, it's like this. I heard they gave you the pink slip, and see, I uh, I know the dispatcher pretty well over where I work, and uh, well, I uh, I told him about you, and uh, he said he said he'd give you a job. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Oh, yes, I I guess so. Charlie, it's very nice of you, buddy. Really, you have experience in billing, don't you? Yes. Then what? I. Well, you see, I, I don't know if I'd want to travel that far. It's out of the city, isn't it? Nobody could pick you up. Sure, till you get yourself a car. Charlie, for heaven's sake, Buddy's offering you a job. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I appreciate it, really. But I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. You got something better, Charlie? I, excuse me, I, I have an appointment. Charlie! Charlie! Oh! I don't recognize him anymore. My own son. Does he have something better, Mother? No. He doesn't have anything. He isn't even looking. How do you know? The employment agency called. They sent him on two interviews, and he never showed up. Well, then where does he go? I don't know. Like I said, he's got himself a girl. Oh, shut up, will you? Henry, look at that. A real log cabin. Isn't it wonderful? Mm hmm See, there's a little spinning wheel. Your grandmother had one of those, remember? How did they make it so small? Mm-hmm. Oh, 19th century townhouse, Boston. Isn't that something? I've never seen anything so perfect, have you? 
Just look at the miniature piano and the doll there in her little handmade dress. Come on, let's go. Oh, I'd love to live in a house like that. Sure you would. No air conditioning, no central heating, no television, no phone. Sure you would. Uh, excuse me? Are, are, you, are you finished here? Uh, I, I, I mean... Yep, on our way to see the mummies. Come along, May. If we must. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you were still in bed. I, I wouldn't be here so early, but my sister and her husband came over and... Oh, I, I understand. Uh, of course you need to get dressed. I'll, I'll, I'll turn my eyes away so you can have your privacy. Hi. A little early today, aren't you? Am I? I guess you must get a real kick out of these displays. Yes. This one in particular. What do you see in there, mister? Nothing. Man doesn't stand for four and five hours at a stretch looking at nothing. Uh, I'm not breaking any rules, am I? No. Then, then leave me alone, please. Suit yourself. Forgive me, it, it won't happen again. Oh, well, I see you're having breakfast. It isn't any of my business, but I really do think you should eat more than toast. Mother says breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Have I told you about my mother? She's very nice. Of course, she still treats me like a child, but <laughs> I can't blame her. I'm all she has. I suppose that isn't very much. I have a sister about your age. Her name is Myra. She's nice, too, but she's not as pretty as you are. I think you're about the prettiest girl in the world. I don't mind saying that because I know you can't hear me through the glass. But I, I think I'd say it even if you could. Because I hope it's all right, but I have to go now. Just just for a while. I didn't get much to eat this morning myself. I'd better have something. But I'll, I'll be back soon. I promise. Hello, Myra. What are you doing here? Oh, I was driving by. Saw you come out of the museum. That's nice. Well? Buy me a cup of coffee? The cafeteria is closed. Then we'll go somewhere else. <sighs> All right. Here you go, folks. Thank you. Charlie, I'm going to be honest. I didn't just happen to see you today. I followed you. You did? Why? Because Mother asked me to. She's worried, and so am I. You haven't been yourself. No. You go to that place every day? I, I thought it might be a good idea to improve my mind. That isn't why. I'm your sister, Charlie. I grew up with you, and I know you. You go there because it gives you a chance to be alone. And you want to be alone because you're scared. Myra. Listen to me. This is important. You're over 30 years old, Charlie, but you're living the same way you did when you were 14. Some of it's mother's fault, some of it's yours. But it isn't natural. It's sick, Charlie, and you know it's sick. And that's why you're scared. You're probably right. Stop agreeing with me. I could say you were a blue monkey and you'd agree. But I... Look, I don't know about psychology or anything like that, but I think I know what's wrong with you. You need a girl, Charlie. You're at that time in your life. You know what I mean? Not exactly. Well, it's hard to explain, but... You've never had a girl, have you? Not as, as such? That's what I thought. Well, we're going to change that. How? 
I'll introduce you to Harriet Gunderson. She works at my office, and she's a lot of fun. You'll like her. <sighs> Myra, please. Charlie, please. This one time try. For me. If you do, I promise I won't bother you anymore. All right. Here's her address. You don't even have to phone. Just stop by, say, around 7. And you don't have to buy her dinner. Take her for a walk in the park. She'll like that, okay? Okay. Word of honor? Word of honor. Charlie? Hmm? What you thinking about? Nothing in particular. You sure are quiet. That means you're the dangerous kind. You can't trust the quiet ones. You can trust me. Who said I wanted to? I only meant... Look, why don't you relax? Come on, let's sit on the bench. If you like. Lean back. Take it easy. There. That's better. You like me, Charlie? Very much. Then why don't you show it? How? Well, you could try kissing me. But we only met this evening. <laughs> Oh, come here. We hardly know each other. Quiet, you man, you. Oh! I, I, I didn't mean to, to push you off the bench. It's just that you, you, you surprised me. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll help you up. Forget it, Buster. Just forget it. Tell your sister you don't need a girl. You need a doctor. Wait, please. Of course, I realized she was doing it as a favor to Myra, but even so, I didn't mean to be rude to her. It must be hard for you to believe, but that's the way things are these days. Who's at the door? Oh, it must be your gentleman caller. Wait! Tell the maid not to let him in. You, you mustn't! Why, he's drunk! Look at him! Run! Run! Don't, don't touch her! Don't lay a hand on her! Stop! He's got to stop! No, no, let go. Let go, please. I can't help you! The glass is too thick! I, I, I need something to break it! Hold on! There, there, there's a fire extinguisher on the wall! What are you doing? I, 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 I had to. He was, he was trying to harm her. Hold it right there. He tried to kiss her last night, but she wouldn't let him, so he came back. Don't move. I'm calling for backup. But I had to. He grabbed her, and she got away, and he went after her. She, she fainted, and he carried her to the bedroom. I, I, I had to stop him. You can see that, can't you? Sure, buddy, sure. Put your hands where I can see him. This is museum security. I need a unit over here right away by the miniatures. Better bring a butterfly net and a straitjacket. This one's a doozy. Now, Mr. Parks, I want you to understand that no one is saying you didn't see these things. There's no doubt that you did. But you saw them in your mind. They were real, Doctor. To you, they were. That's the way it is with hallucinations. Ordinarily, the eye sees and transmits a picture to the brain. But sometimes, that's reversed. In certain cases, the brain sees and transmits a message to the eye. Do you follow? They were real. Then others would have seen them too. Isn't that so? But no one else did see them. How would you explain that? I can't. Think about it. Mr. Parks? I don't know why nobody else saw them. Maybe they weren't looking. You say there were three figures. A young girl, her maid, and a man. He had a big black mustache. All right. Now let's reason it out. According to the museum officials, there was only one figure, the girl. Where did the others come from? Well, 
The maid always comes from the kitchen, and, and that fellow... Yes. Where did he come from? Outside. Outside the case? No, outside the house. Mr. Parks, there was nothing outside the house but glass. And beyond that, other displays. Isn't that true? Yes. But he came to the front door, and they went out together once. To the uh, opera or something, I don't know. She didn't realize what he was like then. I could have told her. You only had to look at him and see what kind of person he was. But she's so innocent and trusting and helpless. Not like other women. No, not at all. Have you seen her? Yes, I have. Is she all right? Would you like to see her now? Yes! She's here. In a box in the drawer of my desk. Careful! You are holding a piece of wood in your hands. A beautifully carved piece of wood. About six inches tall. Do you have to take her back? I'm afraid so. It's museum property. Now I want you to go back to your room and think about what I've said. Will you do that? And remember, what you saw isn't the important thing. Our job is to find out why. Once we accomplish that, you won't have any more hallucinations. Yes? Oh, yes. Send them in. And ask Dr. Geisner to prepare the patient for checkout. Nice to see you, Mrs. Parks. You remember my daughter, Myra. Hello. Hello, Dr. Wallman. And my son-in-law, Buddy. Hi, Doc. Uh, where's Charlie? He'll be along in a few moments. Is he really normal, Doctor? <sighs> That's a word we try not to use. Why not? Because it's meaningless. It refers to the behavior patterns of the majority. If 99.9% .9 of the people in this country went to bed with their socks on, then that would be considered normal. And if you didn't? I go to bed with my socks on all the time. <laughs> well, uh, what I'm trying to say is don't judge Charlie's emotional health by the degree to which he conforms to other people's standards. Don't expect him to be like everybody else. Then you don't think he's sick? Not now, no. He was when he came here. The constant pressure to be something he wasn't, to act and think and feel the way you wanted him to, instead of the way he wanted to, he was unable to cope with this world. So he created another world. But he knew it was false, so he destroyed it. And with that act, he made his first step toward mental health. Of course, he insisted it was real for a long time, but that's standard with hallucinations. Charlie! Hello, Mother. Myra? Buddy? How are you feeling, Charlie? Wonderful, Doctor. Really, wonderful. No more dreams? I've been sleeping like a baby. Not worried about the girl in the glass case? There was no girl. Just a doll. I know that. And I know what made me think I saw what I saw. Thanks to you. Thanks to you, Charlie. You figured it out, remember? I didn't tell you anything after that first day a few weeks ago. Oh, Charlie, I was so worried. Now, Mother, I know you were, but I'm fine now. I'll find a job and everything will be the way it was. You'll see. I sure missed this. Did they hurt you, Charlie? Well, they were going to use shock treatment, but they decided not to when I got well. <laughs> A lot of nuts in that place, I bet. Buddy! It's all right. I don't mind. May I have some more cocoa? Charlie, we have a couple of surprises for you. Oh? The job at Buddy's office is still open. Really? And I talked to Harriet. She forgives you. 
but she can tell you herself. She's coming over tonight. That's great. Thank you, Myra. And thank you, buddy. Well, it took some doing, let me tell you, after where you've been and all. Well, I'm sure it did. But you won't be sorry. I, I intend to work very hard. Now, if I'm going to be ready for tonight, I'd better get a little rest. You'll excuse me? Have a good nap, Charlie. Thank you. Would you like to fix my bed, Mother? I turned it down and fluffed up your pillow. It's all ready. That's great. Just great. See you all later. If you need anything, just holler. I will. All right, I gotta go by the house. Uh, be back in a while. Okay, honey. You want me to pick up some chow? That's not necessary. We're all going out tonight. We are. Okay, then. See ya. Take your time. Drive carefully, buddy. Sure. No problem. It's wonderful having Charlie home. I think the hospital did him good. Shh, not so loud. Don't you? I still don't understand what happened to him. The doctor told you. He didn't tell me anything but a lot of gobbledygook. Mother, I hate to say this, but if you want Charlie to stay well, you're going to have to let go. What in the world do you mean by that? Just what I said. You don't know it. You really don't. But you're keeping Charlie here in this apartment. You're keeping him from growing up. That isn't true. I've told him a thousand times nothing in the world would make me happier. No, Mother, that's wrong. And don't go clutching your heart because it doesn't work with me. There's nothing wrong with your heart. And there's nothing wrong with Charlie that getting out of here won't cure. He's not your baby boy anymore. He's a man. Let him be one. I love Charlie. We all know that, Mother. But if he doesn't leave, he'll be back in that asylum. And this time he'll stay. You don't want that, do you? No, of course I don't. Then you help me tonight, when Harriet comes over. How? By going out to a movie with Bud and me and leaving them alone. <sighs> all right. If you say so. Pass the sports page, would you? Here. You should check the movies. Oh, yeah, sure. There's Harriet. Already? You better tell Charlie to get ready. Charlie! Hi, I made it. Ooh, new dress? Yeah, cost me something, too. Hi, bud. Hey, Harriet. Charlie, your company is here. Charlie? Charlie! What's the matter? Can't wake him up? He must be tired. It's locked. Charlie never locks his door. Hey, hey, Charlie boy. Up and at him, pal. Maybe he doesn't want to be disturbed. Nobody could sleep through that. Break it down, bud. Gee, I don't know. What... Break it down. Okay. <gasps> the window's open. Take it easy, mother. He must have crawled out. Why would he do a thing like that? I don't know. He's your son. <laughs> oh. What did I ever do? Mother, be quiet. Hello, operator. Could you give me the number of the city museum? The main one downtown. Thank you. He couldn't have gone there. The doctor said he was well. Hello? Yes, could you tell me, please, are you open tonight? I see. Thank you. Well? Well, they close earlier tonight. Thank God. But they were open until a little while ago. Hello. I see they got your glass case repaired. I'm so glad. They tried to tell me you weren't real. Of course, I knew better. But I had to pretend. Otherwise, I never would have seen you again. I love you, Alice. Maybe if I keep telling you, you'll believe me. 
Your world isn't simple, is it? No world with people in it ever is. There's loneliness and misery and heartache. Oh, look at you crying because you're alone. I've been alone all my life. People try to understand, but they can't. You could. We could understand each other and help each other and love each other, if only. Wait! Someone's here. I, I have to hide. But where? This is where he always went, every day. Are you sure he's here, Doctor? I'm almost positive. Place is empty, I checked. He could have come in earlier and hidden, couldn't he? Where? This place is deader than a doornail. Shine your flashlight over there. But what about those Egyptian mummy cases? Say, that one isn't supposed to be open. Could a man hide in there? I guess. Nobody's allowed to touch him. It's against the rules. Mrs. Parks, would you do something? Anything for poor Charlie. I'm sure he can hear you, wherever he is. Are you going to take him back to the hospital? I think it would be wise, don't you? Before anything else happens, call him. Ask him to come out. Charlie? Louder. Command him. Charlie, this is your mother. Come here. Again. Charlie Parks, you come here this second, young man. You hear me? It's too late. He's not going to listen to you now, mother. Hey, Charlie boy, let's go. What do you say, huh? Can you turn on the lights? Yeah, at the main switchboard. Do it. We're gonna have to search the whole place. Hey, is this the doll house? That's the one. And the doll, is that her? Yep. Say. What? There's... There's two of them now. A man and a woman sitting on the piano bench. I don't remember that. All right, uh, let's start looking. Yeah. Yeah, I I'll get the lights. Charlie! Charlie, please. This isn't funny. Yo, Charlie! Come on, Charlie! They never found Charlie Parks because they didn't look closely enough at the house in the glass case. The guard didn't say anything more about what he saw. He knew what they'd think, and he knew they'd be right, because seeing is not always believing. Especially if what you see happens to be on display in an odd corner of the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone.
This is where the hotel will be built. But I thought this is sacred ground. Uh, it was. That's all been taken care of. Over there, a shopping center with restaurants. A lot of jungle to be cleared. Nothing but trees and vines. We may burn the rest of it. I haven't decided. Hey, Mr. Richards. Yes, Wolf. I just hit something. What do you mean? In the ground. Now, well, let's have a look. What is it, a boulder? No, I don't think so. Looks like a wooden chest of some kind. Here, let me break it open. Use the shovel. What in the... Oh, I know what it is. So do I. More mumbo-jumbo. Get rid of it. Yes, sir. Not so fast, Alan. These are artifacts, hand-carved effigies. Devil dolls. Strings of beads. The museum will want to see them. Nonsense. They're a dime a dozen. The natives think that if they bury them here, it'll stop the project. Well, it's not gonna work. Just the same. They're sacred. They're junk. Superstitious nonsense. What do you want me to do, Mr. Richards? Cover them with a bulldozer. We've got five acres to clear by sundown. Yes, yeah, sir. Hold on. We're not alone. Bokwa? I told you to stay away from here. Who is he? The Kikuyu medicine man. A troublemaker. Mr. Richards. Listen, Bokwa. I've had it up to here with your voodoo. You are the one who does not listen. I've tried to explain. The government of this territory signed an agreement. Your tribe will be relocated. Too late. You have killed us. We haven't killed anyone. You have everything you asked for. Fertile land, goats, chickens. Our land is here. It was. By next year, 5,000 people will live in Nambara. There'll be new roads from the airfield. They'll bring money, old man. Money for everyone. For your tribe. If your people come here, they will know what it is to die. Hear me well, Bogwa. Right now, my company is sending a full construction crew. If you do anything to harm them... What, Mr. Richards? You'll be eliminated. Ah, the bringer of death. Bar is my dream. I've been planning it all my life. This will be the greatest development in East Africa, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And what of our dream? What must we do? Wait while you make your city and others come? While Uchui does its work? What are you talking about? Uchui? It means magic. Magic, huh? I have a permit to build on this land, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Keep your dolls and amulets off my property. You will not find them all. Some are buried deep. They will join with the earth and rot, as your people will rot. Like this one. Alan, that doll. What about it? The long hair? It looks like Doris. <laughs> your woman. How do you know what my wife looks like? In our dreams, Mr. Richards. In our dreams. Get out of here, now. And if any harm comes to my wife, I swear I'll kill you. Easy, Alan. Goodbye. Do you understand? <laughs> I'll kill you! Mr. Alan Richards, from the engineering firm of Richards & Cooper, who hates with all his heart something in which he does not believe. Add a few buried dolls, strands of human hair, a handful of glass beads and native charms, and you have the ingredients of fear. The kind of fear that quickly turns to terror. Soon, Mr. Richards will make the long journey back to civilization and a high-rise apartment building in New York City. But his trip has just begun. Although he doesn't know it, he's about to take an even longer trip. The longest one of his life will lead him from the Upper West Side across Central Park and directly through the heart of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Jungle, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Oh, great. Doris? Yes, dear? Where are my cufflinks? In the jewelry box on the dresser. Ah, I've got it. What? I say I've got it. What's this? Find them? Yes. Doris? Then everything's all right. Oh, you look great. Very handsome. Thank you. Doris? Hmm? What's this? What's what? A little cloth pouch. I found it in the jewelry box. Oh, that. Did you get it in Africa? I don't remember. Well, let's open it. See if that refreshes your memory. Alan, please. Polished stones, bits of glass. What's this? A bit of fur. A lion's pelt. Just a tiny piece. And the straw? It's from a swallow's nest. Oh, for the love of... Well, what about it? You tell me. There's nothing to tell. I decided to bring back some souvenirs. That's all these are to you? Souvenirs? Of course. Even this one? What? 
For God's sake, Doris. It's a preserved human finger. It's supposed to bring good luck. I won't have this garbage in my house. Alan, they're only mementos of our trip. You sure? I'm sure. Good. Then you won't mind if I dispose of them in the fireplace. Alan, don't! Why not? It's a capitu. You mustn't. Why not? Forget it. You wouldn't understand. Are there any more souvenirs? No. Doris, listen to me. We aren't in Africa now. We're in New York. Do you hear what I'm saying? Please. I don't want to talk about it. This sort of thing is for weak people. Ignorant, uncivilized people who don't know any better. Not for you. Not for me. All right. You're not listening. We have done nothing wrong, and we have nothing to fear. Least of all from a bunch of witch doctors 5,000 miles away. You think I'm afraid of witch doctors? What else do you expect me to think? Uh, no, Alan, no, it's... It, it's not that. Then what? What is it you're afraid of? Africa. The land itself. You remember what the old shaman said a long time ago, when the men started drilling and clearing. Who, Bokawa? That shriveled up faker? He said we were wounding the land, hurting it, making it bleed. He said the land would make us pay. Doris, we left Africa weeks ago. Did we? I wonder. Sometimes at night, I feel it all around me, closing in, like a great dark animal. Alan, please, tell them not to build there. Tell them it won't work, please. There's still time. You can stop them. Is that it? Do you have to go? You're welcome to go with me. There's a dinner before the meeting with International Development. Do you good to get out. I don't feel well. Then call a doctor, and don't put any more logs on the fire. This place is hot as a compost heap. I need it this way. I'm cold all the time. I'll try to be back early. You'll never be back. What? Alan, do you hear it? I hear a lot of gibberish. Alan, don't go. Good night. Don't. I'm begging you. Good Lord. What is it? See for yourself. It appears to be the carcass of a dead animal of some kind. It's... it's a goat. The throat has been slashed as if by some kind of claws. Blood all over the hall carpet. Call security. I knew it. Knew what? The shaman was right. Someone's playing a joke on us. A horrible, tasteless joke. How did it get up here? How could it? It's seven floors to the street. There's a guard in the lobby. Pass keys. Oh, Alan. Alan. Now do you believe? So, to sum up, the site is clear. Drainage and leveling have already begun, along with preliminary work on the diversion of the river. Then it's behind schedule. Not seriously. What about the cost? We'll have to add an estimated three to six months for completion, but the cost shouldn't vary by more than a few hundred thousand, at most. You recommend that we dispatch a full crew, Richards? Yes, sir. That's exactly what I recommend. And your partner, Mr. Cooper. What do you say? I concur, Mr. Templeton. In short, we've done what we said we'd do. Allowing for delay because of weather, we're on track. Mission accomplished, or very nearly. Here, here. Well done, gentlemen. A few questions first, if you don't mind. Certainly. Of course, sir. I'm sure you've considered this aspect carefully, but for my own curiosity, what about the native population? What about them, sir? Environmental impact, relocation, that sort of thing. How are they reacting? To be perfectly frank, not as well as I'd hoped, but better than I'd feared. The Kikuyus have a violent tradition, Mr. Templeton. They resent the loss of their village. They resent the project, even though they're going to benefit from it eventually. Point of fact, they resent us. But I doubt that they'll cause any serious trouble, except for Wukawi. What? Magic. A kind of witchcraft. You see, a number of the shamans have decided to put a curse on everyone connected with this enterprise. Effective upon the decision to go ahead with the project, that is. What sort of curse, Richards? The evil eye. <laughs> <laughs> the usual. A slow and painful death. <laughs> I assure you, gentlemen, there isn't anything the least bit funny about Okawi. You're not serious. I am, because I've seen it work. I've seen healthy men sicken and die within ten minutes of the time set by the witch doctors who curse them. Of course, not in this case. Well, then where? 
Well, I included a section about it in our background report, but for our men, there have been only the normal intestinal infections, you know, that sort of thing. Then why bring it up? Healthy men and women who weren't touched or poisoned or harmed in any way, who just died. I'll leave copies of our report for everyone. Then you mean to say you believe in it? No, Mr. Sinclair. But they did, and their belief made it real. An important distinction. I simply can't imagine that anyone in this day and age would go in for magic. Oh, you can't? Well, as it happens, Mr. Sinclair, several million people go in for magic. And they're not all in Africa, either. Some of them are right here in this room. <laughs> Come now, Richards. Don't talk rubbish. Uh, we better be going now. What's that on your keychain, Mr. Sinclair? Why, uh... On the table with your keys. A rabbit's foot, isn't it? Yes, but I don't see... Why do you carry it? My daughter gave it to me. Now, see here. Is it for luck? Yes, I suppose so, but I don't see what that has to do with magic. Mr. Sinclair carries around the severed foot of a dead animal in the hope that it will bring him good fortune. And he doesn't see what that has to do with magic. Well, Sinclair, he has a point. Mr. Hardy is amused, although it's a known fact that he's practiced witchcraft for years. What? Or have you finally given up astrology? A sophisticated man with an educated mind who reads his horoscope every day and allows the stars to run his life. And a fair job they've done so far, young man. That, Mr. Hardy, is exactly what a Kikuyu witch doctor said to me when I suggested that panther bones could not foretell the future. <laughs> He's got you there. Oh, you needn't smile, Mr. Templeton. I've seen you knock on wood more than once. And you, Fielding. <laughs> Don't try to pull me into this. How long has it been since you walked under a ladder? And the rest of you, do you cross your fingers? Throw salt over your shoulder? Worry when a black cat walks in front of you? All right, Mr. Richards. I think you've made your point. Think of it. A multi-billion dollar corporation run by witches and warlocks in a 40-story building that doesn't even have a 13th floor. Mr. Richards. Sorry. All of you. Please. Mr. Cooper and I will be leaving now. Well, gentlemen, what do you think? Well, he's quite competent as a project manager. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes that's true. I'd say he may have left the jungle behind, but the jungle hasn't left him. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I guess I blew it. Not necessarily. Oh, come on, Chad. Oh, I'm serious. They're not about to cancel the project at this point. They can't with the figures we gave them. I wish I hadn't shot off my mouth like that. All right, I'll bite. Why did you? That's just it. I, I don't know. You sure about that? Why wouldn't I be? I couldn't say, but it wasn't like you. Something's happened. Hasn't it? Maybe I'll tell you about it sometime. And tell me now. I'm not going anywhere. You're not? Let's stop off for a drink. Uh, I better get home. <laughs> you don't sound like you're looking forward to it. I'm not, I guess. Trouble? Oh, it's not her fault. But something funny did happen tonight. Funny haha -ha or funny peculiar? You don't have to answer. It's not what you think. I don't think anything. Come on, uh, here's Riley's. We'll have a beer. Help you sleep. Besides, uh, I want to hear it. Whatever it is. All right, but just one. Well? Well, what? Are you coming? Yeah, yeah, sure. I just thought I heard something. So did I. <laughs> That cab better get a new fan belt. Sounds like fingernails on a blackboard. Yeah, yeah, that must have been it. Here you go. Hmm? Two drafts. Oh, sure. Thanks, Riley. No problem. Don't drink both of them now. What? Your partner, what's his name? Chad. Made your calls, huh? Been gone a while. He had to phone somebody. Huh. Okay, Mr. Richards. Enjoy. Well, I got through to Sinclair. What's that? Sinclair, on the phone. You did? Hey, just got home. Says they voted to go ahead with the project. I see. You almost sound disappointed. Oh, no, no. What's the matter? Nothing. Hey, this is me, remember? Your body's here, but your head is somewhere else. You look like you're a million miles away. Only a few thousand. Sorry, Chad. So am I. You want to talk about it? I seem to have done enough of that already. So I'm surprised the project's still on after my outburst. Now, you've been under a lot of pressure. They understand. I wish I did. What happened anyway? It's hard to explain. It's about Doris, isn't it? Why do you say that? 
Well, I talked to her yesterday when you were out. You did? She sounded bad. She hasn't been feeling well. When did it start? About three months ago in Africa. At least that's when I first noticed it. I guess it's time to define it. I don't know if I can. She found a swallow's nest outside our tent one morning. Usual Mganga sign. I didn't think anything about it then. That afternoon I had an accident in the Land Rover. Nothing serious, but that's all it was. An accident. Only she didn't think so. Right. And then there wasn't any such thing as an accident, as far as she was concerned. Every time I ran a fever or stubbed my toe, it had to be magic. Witchcraft. Like the crew, the skin infection. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, jungle rot. A tropical infection, that was all. But not according to Doris. All that mumbo-jumbo got to her. I thought it would wear off by the time we got back, but it didn't. She actually believed in those little dolls, with the pieces of hair, the fingernail clippings. But you didn't. Of course not. What happened to change your mind? Tonight, before I left for the meeting. Chad, tell me something. If you wanted to get a hold of a dead goat... A what? On short notice, in New York City. Where would you go? <laughs> to a psychiatrist. I'm serious. So am I. You want a dead goat? No. Then what? Never mind. It isn't important. I'd say it is. A question like that out of left field? Let it go, I said. Take it easy, buddy. We're only talking here. Strictly theoretical, I'm sure. Drop it. Hey, careful. Sorry. It's all right. It's only beer. I'll get some napkins. Use my handkerchief. What's this? Uh, I don't know. Yes, you do. It looks like a tooth of some kind. It's a capitu. A protective amulet. And you've been carrying it around in your pocket. It was Doris's idea. A lion's tooth. I guess that means I'm protected from lions. In the city? Lions? Oh, yeah. Well, you have to admit, it's kept them away so far. I'm sure that's the way Doris looks at it. Why lions in particular? Because they symbolize the country. And the whole country's out to get you? Uh, not just a few witch doctors? Close. You see, Doris isn't afraid of the witch doctors. She's got it all worked out in her mind. She thinks Africa itself is out to get us. The entire Dark Continent because of a little development work. They told us that the country was a living thing. That when I sank the drills and diverted the river, I wounded the land. And that the land would hunt me down. Or its spirit would. Unless I turned in a negative report and kept the others away. Then maybe I'd be forgiven. I was right there beside you over there. But I was in charge. The head criminal, so to speak. And you've been carrying that on your shoulders all this time. Oh, I didn't take it seriously. Even if I am the responsible party. What are you going to do? About Doris? I don't know. She's sick, isn't she? With delusions. You must realize that. Of course, but so are half the people in this city. Maybe more. The president of international development carries a rabbit's foot. My wife carries a little bag full of nail clippings and amulets. And I've got a lion's tooth in my pocket. It's all the same thing. All the same rotten disease, eating away the strength, the will... The very soul... Hey! What? Alan, I'd take it easy if I were you. A person doesn't get this steamed up over something if he doesn't believe in it. What are you getting at? Nothing, just a piece of friendly advice. Germs aren't the only thing that's catching. Depression, obsession, they can rub off on you too if you let them. Come on, drink up. I'll get us two more. What time is it? Doris will be worried. I'll call her. Sounds like a plan. Hey, Riley? Yeah, Mr. Cooper. Another round over here, please. You got it. Be right back. Hello? Honey? Where are you? We just got out of the meeting. At this hour? The dinner ran long. I'm with Chad. Was everything taken care of? Security took the carcass away. They had to call animal control. Then they scrubbed the floor outside our door, but the blood wouldn't come out. They're going to recarpet in the morning. Good. Doris, how you feeling? Oh, just dandy. How do you think I feel? A sacrifice on our doorstep. Take a sleeping pill. I took one. Then take another one. I'll call the doctor tomorrow. He can't help. It's not a question of nerves anymore. It's bigger than that. Can you see? Be home as soon as I can. Chad? Chad? Something the matter, Mr. Richards. What happened to Mr. Cooper? Who? The man I came in with. Where is he?
Where did he go? Mr. Cooper? Uh, right over there in the corner. Well, here he comes. I didn't see you. For a minute there. <laughs> I thought I'd put a quarter in the jukebox for you. Very funny. <laughs> like it? Lay off. Uh, I thought you had a sense of humor. You don't know what you're dealing with here. Then why don't you explain it to me? I've done that. Oh, come on, Alan. All I've heard about is voodoo and witchcraft and magic. I don't know what. Doris is depressed. You are, too. You should both be going to a shrink, if that's all it is. Look, we've got a lot riding on this contract. Everything, in fact. If you can't handle it, take some time off. Get your head together. I can handle it. I'm not so sure you could. Yeah, right. Closing time, fellas. Last call. Let's get out of here. That late already? That late. Thanks, Riley. Don't mention it. See you again. Count on it. Come on. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Yeah, you forgot to go to bed. You okay to drive? I'm fine. Look, if Doris gives you any trouble, blame me. I'll back you up. Sure. Now, give her a few more weeks in the big city. She'll come around. And when she does, you'll snap out of it, too. I hope so. As for yourself, uh, get some sleep before the sun comes up. Make a new man of you. Ever watched the sunrise in Africa? Yeah. So? The sky is like a bowl of ink. Then all of a sudden somebody pours a little milk into it, right at the horizon. It begins to spread and you can see for miles. Every detail. Trees, rocks, and any animals that might be in there. Waiting. But just before that, black as... is the space under the bed when you turn the lights out. Alan, old buddy. Hey, you ought to be a poet instead of an engineer. You got your keys? Got them. Okay, then. My car's across the street. Say goodnight, Alan. Good night, Alan. Look, I'll call you in the morning. And drive carefully now. Don't let the pussycats bite. You too. Oh, great. Oh. Chad? The lion's tooth. Hey! Hey, Riley, open up! It's Alan Richards. I left something on the table. Riley! Riley! My car won't start. At least call me a cab, will ya? Who's there? Hello? Is someone following me? Show yourself! <coughs> Just a cat. A cat, that's all. Where's a payphone? There. Knew I'd find one. What's the matter with this thing? Out of order. Of all the times. What? Yes? Hello? Hello, is anybody? No. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, cab! Over here! It's okay. Nothing to worry about. Just keep walking. All the way home. Get across the park first. That's all. No big deal. Hold on. Take it slow. You'll make it. Been through the park a hundred times. During the day. So what? Stay in the path. Nice and easy does it. Okay. Here goes. It's gotta be my imagination. Hey, buddy. Need a cab? What? Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Well, come on then. I ain't got all night. Thanks. Pretty late to be walking. Yeah. Yeah, it is. My car wouldn't start. Where to? Skyler House. You know what that is? Sure do. East side. That's right. Just around the park. Should have called AAA. What? The Auto Club. They'll get you going. I know. I tried to. Couldn't find a phone that works. I hear that. You know, this town, it's full of animals. They wreck everything. They do it on purpose. They break things, they write graffiti all over the place. Just get me home, please. 
I'll take care of it in the morning. You got it. Won't be long now. What's that? Till morning. A couple more hours, it'll be daylight. I must have lost track. If you could step on it, please. Well, I gotta wait for the light. If I run a red light, it's a big find. There's cops all over. Are there? I didn't see any. <laughs> That's because they're never around when you need them. Driver? You can go now. The light's green. It's just on the other side of the park. Driver? You hear me? The light's green. What's wrong with you? He isn't breathing. Help me! Somebody call an ambulance! Call the police! This cab driver is dead! <laughs> Not far now. Across the park. Just let me catch my breath. Who's there? Stay where you are. Spare change? Oh, I thought you were... Who? I don't know. Excuse me, mister, but I ain't had nothing to eat for two days. She sure appreciate it if you could help me out. I don't have any change. Here's a five. God bless you, mister. Wait, that sound. Where's it coming from? What sound? The drums. I don't hear no drums. Do you mean to tell me you don't hear that? Well, my ears, you know, they ain't so good. How would you like to make some more money? Doing what? I'm trying to get home. I live just beyond the other side of the park. If you walk with me, I'll pay you ten dollars. All I have to do is walk? Help me find my way in the dark. Make it 20. I don't know. Please. I just have to stay on the path. You're on your own, pal. I ain't into weirdos. Come back. I'll make it $20. 50! There. The other side. Gotta keep moving. I can see the building. Help! Help! Let me in! Let me in! Mr. Richards? The door. It was locked. No, it wasn't. I mean, I thought I left it open. I just need to get to my apartment. Sure. Pretty late tonight, huh, Mr. Richards? Pretty late. You okay? I am now. I'll get the elevator for you. My wife. She didn't go out, did she? Uh, no, sir. Not all night. Good. Thanks, Randy. Take it easy, sir. Don't know what's wrong with me. So tired. Need to sleep. Doris? Let her sleep. Mm. Ah, that's better. What? Doris? Doris, are you up? I didn't mean to wake you. Do you mind if I turn on the bedroom light? Just for a moment? What's wrong with the bed? Doris, is that you? What? No. Get back. Get It has been said that love is the greatest emotion, and the most creative. But hate, if it is strong enough, can create as well, and destroy. Alan Richards had only a moment to understand this, a brief flash of insight. But it came too late, for someone who, like most of us, has never seen a lion feeding. Unfortunately, to his great sorrow, it's a warning he will not be able to pass on to anyone else 
either in or out of the Twilight Zone. The Jungle, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Alyssa Fraden, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, David Darlow, Ivan Vega, Joseph Minoso, Tim Rose, Roger Wolski, Vince Amari, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Mighty Casey, starring Paul Dooley, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Joe B. Cerny, Jeff Lupiton, Alex Sopiner, Kurt Nabig, Derek Purcell, Roger Mueller, Elizabeth Lido, Carl Amari, Jason Mallow, Doug James, and Vince Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow. And it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Okay, Pete, let's mark it off. Starting where? The dugout. Run a chalk line in front of the fence all the way to the gate so they can bulldoze it flat. Wait, what's the dugout? Where the team would wait. They'd sit on the bench, shoot the bull... <laughs> Sometimes McGarry chew my butt good. Oh, I know what a dugout is, but why'd you call it that? I, I don't see any bench. Not now you don't. Used to be right over there, under the bleachers, near home plate. Okay, I get it. This place used to be a ballpark. Of course, that was before my time. Yeah, I'll bet it was. <laughs> I always thought this was a track for motocross and monster trucks. My old man used to take me before it was a swap meet to me. That right. There was just one truck, the Grave Digger. Oh, man, you should have seen it. Big old tires roll right over anything. How old are you, kid? Me, 22. 22? I was out of high school before you were born. You know what? You really missed a lot. Yeah, Pops, back in the day. Hey, you ever see the monster trucks? Afraid I missed that. Ever see the Zephyrs? The what? Only the greatest ball club there ever was. Sure. <laughs> That's why I never heard of them. Yeah, World Series champs, huh? They could have been. Let me tell you. And they almost did. One year in particular. We better get back to work, Corgan. Wait a while, kid. I want to tell you a story. You bring your lunch? Uh, sure, I brought it. In the truck. Then let's take a load off. Good time for a break. It's okay by me. We can sit over there in the pitcher's mouth. Of course, you can't see it anymore, but it was there. Fletch was the regular pitcher. He was a nice guy, but he had an arm like an old lady. Then one day he added a blue. Oh, well, you're not going to believe this. Oh, one day what? Well, it was... Uh, it must have been July. Yeah, that's it. 
middle of the season, everybody was talking about the Giants, how good they look, what a lineup, blah, blah, blah. The Zephyrs were stuck in the toilet. Then one day, McGarry, that was the manager, he called for open tryouts. Why not? Couldn't be any worse than what we had. And that was when he came along. Didn't look like much. But when he wound up, man, what an arm. Who? I'm getting to it. Better start at the beginning. It was a hot one that year. No rain, the sun beating down. You're standing in the middle of what used to be a baseball stadium. Now the grandstand is falling apart, the field is covered with weeds, and the men who played here are nothing but ghosts. But believe it or not, this was once home to a major league team known as the Hoboken Zephyrs. Never heard of them? That's not surprising, unless you're one of the old timers. Today it holds only memories, and no sound except the wind that stirs in the high grass of the outfield. A wind that on occasion still carries a faint, eerie echo of the crowd that once sat in those bleachers. We're about to travel back in time to a day when the Hoboken Zephyrs were still a part of the National League, and this mausoleum of memories was an honest to Pete attraction. But since it's strictly a story of make-believe, we must begin this way. Once upon a time in New Jersey, a most unusual event happened on the way to the ballpark. In a moment, you'll meet the cause of that event, a left-hander named Casey. Not the most original of monikers, but that's what he was called. So sit back, grab a hot dog and a bag of peanuts, and get ready for the playoffs. Because this particular broadcast is brought to you live from the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Mighty Casey, starring Paul Dooley, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. All right, new guys, let me see what you got. Give me 50 jumping jacks. Make it 100. Make it 100. Then take a lap around the field. Two laps. You got it, McGarry. Of course, if we burn them out too fast. Hey, you better learn to hustle or they're out of here. Okay, Six, Mouth, you say so. Seven, Let me hear you count. Eight, nine, nine, ten, ten, ten eight, eight, eleven, 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 twelve, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Uh, Morning, McGarry. Beasley. Four great looking boys, huh? The one with the black socks with the floor shimes brought a note from his mother. Who are you expecting? The All Stars? Post a sign for open tryouts in a last place club that happens to be 31 games out of first place. And this is what shows up. You never know, I guess. Might be some talent out there. Yeah, and you might be Yogi Berra. I can't make something out of nothing. You're the owner of the club. You gotta give me some ball players. Think you'd know what to do with them if I did? 20 games out of fourth place, and the only big average we've got is a manager with the widest mouth in the business. When the Zephyrs win one game, we gotta call it a streak. Buddy boy, when contract time comes around, you don't have to. Sure. You let me go. Who are you gonna get? Now think of something. You can always manage the team yourself. Ah, uh, one more time, Fletch. Ugh, try to get it over the plate. The okay monkey I must have slept funny on my arm last night. How's the team doing? Are you kidding? Last week Fletch pitched four innings and only gave up six runs. That makes him our most valuable player of the month. Hey! Hey! Okay, let's see some sweat out there. New guys, take a lap. Oh. I get it. Dugout. What? Who? Just a minute, I'll ask him. McGarry! Yeah? You want to look at a pitcher? You mean someone besides Fletcher? Now, why would I want to do that? Send him down. New boy? Gotta warn you, he's a lefty. Lefty, schmefty. If he's got one arm that works, he's for us. Hey, Monk! Yeah? Fletch can take it easy now. I got a new boy coming in. Catch a few for him? Yeah, sure, Moth. Yeah, okay, Fletch. 
Go on, shower up. Check. One more lap. Let's go. You got the lineup for tonight? I'm working on it. Who's the starting pitcher? I don't know yet. You don't know? Have to see how it goes. Whoever's hot gets a shot. Make that lukewarm. Oh, my. Chavez, that's enough with the laps. They look like they're going to pass out. Check. Take five, boys. All right. All right, Gary, I've seen enough. Yeah, you and me both. What's that? I said I'll see you on the sports page. I'll stop by later. You do that. Ah, uh, Mr. McGarry? Over there. Hey, Mouth, your new man's here. You gotta be kidding. Mr. Uh, Mr. McGarry, is it? Okay, what's the gag? I don't know what you... Come clean, Gramps. Did old man Beasley put you up to it? I'm afraid I, uh... Well, tell him I don't need a water boy. Thanks for coming by. Leave your name at the office. There must be some misunderstanding. I'm here about the pitching position. Right. Hardy har har. Oh, I'm not a pitcher, though I've thrown a few baseballs in my time. Of course, that was before the war. Yeah? Which one? The Civil War? You don't look old enough for Valley Forge, but come to think of it, was the winter really as cold as they say? I represent Casey. Oh, Casey. Straight from Mudville, I bet. <laughs> Even got himself an agent. How much do you get? Ten percent of nothing? Here he is now. Him? What is he? A hundred and fifteen pounds soaking wet? Listen, no offense, but if a wind comes up, those ears will start flapping and he'll take off like Dumbo. Say hello, Casey. Nice one, Miller. Oh, pleased to meet you. Hey, watch out. I said, watch out, the ball's coming down. Step aside, Casey. Now, boy. I said... Ooh. Ow! Right on the old bean. That must have hurt. You okay, fella? Oh, Casey's fine. Just fine. How come he's still standing? Must be out on his feet. I'll call an ambulance. Don't go suing us now. I wouldn't think of it. Casey, as I was saying... This is Mr. McGarry. He's the manager. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Do you want to lie down? Come on in the dugout. Shake hands, Casey. Yeah, that's all right. You remember how to shake hands, don't you? Yes, sir. Right hand, Casey. Your right hand. Put her there, pal. Oh, ow! You can let go, Casey. That's right. Release now. Ow! Whoa! My hand! What a grip! Sorry, Casey doesn't know his own strength sometimes. Some arm? Never would have guessed it. Well, let's see what he can do. Mind if I try him out? That's what we're here for. Right, Casey? Correct. Okay. See that guy over there with the great big mitt? Yes, we see him. He's what's known as a catcher. His name is Monk. Ah. Go out there and throw him a few. Thank you, Mr. McCary. This I gotta see. Quite. You his father? Casey? Oh, no. He has no father. An orphan, huh? Mm, not exactly. I guess you'd call me his creator. That a fact? It is, actually. Come from around here, does he? Mm, you might say so. Uh-huh. How old is he? Hmm. Well, that's a little difficult to say. What's difficult about it? It's uh, hard to discuss Casey's age in chronological terms. He's only been in existence for a brief time. What I mean is, he has the mind and physique of roughly a 22-year-old, but in terms of how long he's been here, the answer would be three weeks. Huh? Approximately. Would you mind going over that again? You see, I'm an inventor. <laughs> I made Casey. You made? In my workshop. Well, that's swell, pal. There ain't too many homemade left-handers in the league. You don't understand. I'm serious. Sure you are. Anytime you're ready. Yes, sir. Oh, jeez, Louise. That's his fastball. Uh, try a curve now, Casey. His 
curveball. Hey, uh, do that again. If you like. <laughs> hey! What was that? <laughs> we don't have a name for it yet. Uh, go ahead now, Casey. Don't hold back. Enough already. Something wrong? Wrong? What? You see him? That kid he picks up where Feller left off. He's got a fastball almost went through my glove. And a curve, and a hook, and a knuckler, or uh, whatever you want to call it. He got control like he uses radar. Oh, it's the best pitcher I ever caught in my life. Thanks, Monk. That's enough for today. I swear, I've never seen anything like it. You don't even pitch like a human being. Precisely. Well, he's still rough, Gramps. He's plenty rough, but uh, I might give him a try. If it can do the same thing when there's a game on. Oh, he can do it. Consistency's not a problem. <clears throat> He's a robot, you know. Yeah, don't say that. Don't ever say the word R-O-B-O-T-T -T around here. We'll just keep that one between us, okay? Did you like my pitching, Mr. McGarry? You might have a little potential, Casey, like I told Mr. Stillman here. Professor. The Professor Stillman. You're awful rough around the edges, but I think maybe we could give you a shot. I like to help young ball players. Now you go on into the locker room and find a uniform that fits. He can wear a uniform, can he? Anything you like. Then go and change and come back, and uh, we'll discuss a little contract. Just the three of us. That seems fair. Very kind of you, Mr. McGarry. Don't mention it. Go on now. Say thank you, Casey. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Come along. You're going to be a real baseball player now, just like I promised you. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Wonderful. General Manager's office? Uh, this is McGarry. Now listen. Draw up a contract. New pitcher, name of Casey. No, I don't know his last name. Leave that part blank. Just do it. The only thing that's between us and a pennant now is if this guy's battery goes dead or he rusts in the rain. Never mind what I mean. Drop the contract before he gets away. Good afternoon, sports fans. We're coming to you live for the last in a series of home games for the whole bulk and Zephyrs. The Bullets are already on the field, warming up, but <laughs> there's been a delay. The Zephyrs are still in the locker room. Now, we understand they're getting a last-minute pep talk from their manager, the colorful Mouth McGarry, and knowing him, it's an earful. Peanuts, red hots. Well, the Zephyrs are at the bottom of the league this season, which means this is a make-or-break situation. And rumor has it there's a new pitcher on the team, but that's unconfirmed. Ah, yes. A beautiful, sunny day. Local fans all here, ready to root, root, root for the home team. Still uh, no sign of the boys from Hoboken. <clears throat> well, this might be a good time for a break uh, before the action starts. But we'll try to get word from the locker room. But uh, till then, let's, let's go to a commercial. And you're up. 50 seconds. How much longer do I have to fill? Beats me. What's with these losers? Well, if I was on that team, I guess I wouldn't want to show my face either. 45 seconds. Beer here. Get your ice cold beer. Somebody get me a beer. I'm dying out here. What am I supposed to do? Play tiddlywinks? It's going to be another slaughter anyway. Hey, ask him if he's got anything stronger than beer. You can always read him the stats. There are no stats. If this team was any lower, they'd get stuck in the grass. What am I doing here? Get me another gig. Little League. The weather. I don't care. Just get me out. 20 seconds. The Zephyrs are charging onto the field. Oh, no. The Zephyrs look hungry this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, sure. Who am I kidding? 
They're not going to show. The game's canceled. You'll see. Ten seconds to air. Oh, those bums. It's the same old story. Fletcher winds up. He throws. And he drops the ball on his foot. They should send out a bunch of chimpanzees. Five. Four. Three. Two. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to more thrilling baseball action. All right, you got the signals down now, kid? Okay, when you're ready to throw, you watch my fingers. See, I'll, I'll give you the hand signals, just like we practice. Remember the one for the fastball? This one. Yes. And a curve? Show him the one for a curveball. Yes, yeah, right here. Well, what are we waiting for, Ma? This ain't a training session. This is for real. You're telling me? All right, kid. You got the signals down. Look, the main thing is walk out there like you own the place. But be cool. Nice and steady. Cool? He means don't be nervous. Nervous. Yeah, that's right. Whatever you're feeling, don't let it show. Pull your cap down over your eyes like this. You got nerves of steel. You know what I mean? Not steel, exactly. You know what nerves are, Casey. Oh, yes. Neurons, axons, and dendrites. In this case, nerves means ill at ease. As if one of your electrodes were uh, corroded and, um... Nervous, Casey. Like as if it's two out in the ninth and you're one up and you're pitching against Joe DiMaggio. He comes up to the plate, looking intent, eyes straight ahead. That wouldn't make me nervous. No? Why not? I don't know anyone named DiMaggio. <laughs> what? He never heard of... I know what he said. <laughs> He's a great kidder, ain't he? I love this guy. All right, fellas, this is it. Let's get going. It's time, Casey. Yes, sir. Mr. McGarry? Yeah? Are you coming? Yeah. Yeah, I'm coming. Something the matter? I was just, uh, thinking about the Giants. We're not playing the Giants today, are we? No, but I can't wait to knock them off. For that matter, I'd love to knock off the Phillies and the Cards, too. Or the Braves in Cincinnati. Or even the Hanksville Bullets. Them especially. Those bums beat us 11 to nothing in spring training. <laughs> I think that will happen. Casey will come through for you, Mr. McGarry. Most definitely. You never told me. What have you got riding on this? What's your angle? With Casey? My interest is purely scientific. I know he's a superman of sorts, but I need to have that proven under test conditions. You mean you can't guarantee he'll work? Oh, I have no doubts. Once I built a home economist to run my house. Marvelous cook. I gained 46 pounds before I had to, uh, dismantle her. Now, with a model such as Casey, with his strength and accuracy, I knew he was destined to play baseball. And in order to prove my point, I had to have him pitch in competition. As an acid test, I settled on the absolute worst team I could find. E nothing personal. Nah, of course not. Very nice of you to think of us, Mr. Stillman. Eh, Professor Stillman. Professor, I really appreciate it. No kidding. You can feel excitement in the air as the Zephyrs take to the field. Hey, you bombs, do something. The pressure's on the home team. Tensions are high. And there's a ground swell of support as this new pitcher approaches the mound. Well, it's do or die today. Fletcher's on the bench and the new man. Uh, the only name I have is Casey. And frankly, he doesn't look like much. But his medal's about to be tested. Uh, to coin a phrase. Go home, kid. Your mother's calling you. The umpire signals for the start of the game. Play ball. The ball is whipped around the infield, and now the second baseman is hand carrying it over to Casey. He rubs it off on his jersey and hands it to him. The pitcher is. Uh, yes, he finally takes it. He turns to face the batter, waiting for a signal. Here's the windup. He throws. The batter swings. Steve Reichman. Hey, not bad. I must have missed that one, folks. 
It looks like the batter missed it too. He went over the plate so fast he swung a full 360. Good gravy was that a fastball. Lucky pitch. Let me see you do that again. Take your best shot. Second pitch. Here's the windup. Whoa, Nelly! Halloran tries to take a bite out of it and misses. He's off his feet. Looks like he threw his back out, twisted around like a pretzel. Good golly, Miss Molly. We got ourselves a pitching machine. In baseball news, here's a cutie for you. Seems there's a rookie in Hoboken who's pitched three straight shutouts. They said it couldn't be done, but with a blistering performance to sew up nine in a row... In a stunning comeback, the Zephyrs zoom to fourth place in the National League as Casey gets ready for number 14. And that makes three more no-hitters for the mighty Casey. The Zephyrs are locked into first place. Questions in the news this morning about the mysterious Casey. Where does he get his superhuman ability? Playoffs temporarily suspended as the baseball commission orders an investigation. Today's headline, the mighty Casey. Is he on steroids? Good day. All right, Casey, if you just relax. What do you mean? He's relaxed. Let's get this over with, Doc. I'm going to sit down in front of you and strike your knee with this little rubber hammer. Why? It's a test, Casey. Nothing to get shook about. You mean shaken. Here we go. <laughs> Casey, watch where you're kicking. Well, I'd say his reflexes are 100%. That it, Doctor? Uh, not quite, Mr. Beasley. Just let me check his pulse and do a blood test. Oh, no. What's the matter? If Casey doesn't pass this physical, there goes the pennant. There goes the series. <laughs> there goes my career. But why are you worried? He doesn't take anything illegal, does he? Absolutely not. You may rely on it. Then... Eh, uh, there's something I haven't told you, Beasley. What? Now to take your pulse. Hey, Doc. You really need to do that? Oh, a mere formality. He seems to be in A1 shape. Absolute perfection, if I do say so. Quiet for a moment, gentlemen, while I listen through the stethoscope. Oh, boy. Here it comes. Breathe, please. Once more. What's wrong? Nothing. Uh, not a thing. Everything sounds fine. It's just that... Uh, Out with it. What? This... This man doesn't have a pulse. No heartbeat, either. Try again. Uh, I already have. This man... This man isn't alive. He can't be. That's pretty funny, Doc. Okay, go ahead and draw your blood sample. We gotta get Casey cleared for the rest of the season. <sighs> I'm afraid that won't be possible. Why don't you wait out in the hall, Stillman? You're starting to get on my nerves. Nerves make up the neurological system in the human body. When a small electrical charge passes from one to another... Enough already! Mr. McGarry, it'll have to come out now. There's no way to avoid it, Doctor. What's this all about, Mouth? Beasley, you ain't gonna like this, but, uh, see, I didn't have a choice. It was Casey or nothing. Are you trying to put something over on me? Ah, what a pitcher he was. The only ball player I ever had on the team who didn't eat nothing. Not even a hot dog. Doctor. Is there a problem? I think you should know something before you go any further. Go ahead. Give it to him. <sighs> Casey doesn't have any pulse or heartbeat because he doesn't have any heart. Uh, how's that? He's a robot. A what? You heard the man. A robot, or if you prefer, an android made from lifelike materials to resemble a human being. Are you sure? Oh, I should be. I built him. And he's been pitching for the Hoboken Zephyrs? Doctor, this is the first I've heard of it. Well, oh, under the circumstances, I have no choice but to notify the baseball commissioner. Move over, Casey. I don't feel so good. Doc, uh, you got anything for a splitting headache? McGarry, you gave me your word. Yeah, that the team would win. I didn't say nothing about... Yes, you did. You brought me Casey and... and... I said I'd never seen anything like him. Did I lie? 
Not as such, but you can't run roughshod over the rules. I'm holding you in breach of contract. Me? What did I do? I got you a winner. Know how many tickets we sold? You never had such a season. All right, all right. Knock it off, you two. I'm the commissioner, and I say he's suspended. That's final. On what grounds? He didn't take no illegal substances. He doesn't have to. Everything about him is illegal, from the top of his head to the cleats on his shoes. He's a machine. So? <clears throat> Article 6, Section 2 of the Baseball Code, I quote, A team should consist of nine men. End quote. Men. Understand? Not robots or vacuum cleaners or mix men. Commissioner, perhaps there's another way of looking at this. For all intents and purposes, he is human. Casey... Would you mind saying a few words? Tell us about yourself. Where should I begin? At the beginning, of course. Yeah, where was he born? All men are born, not to assemble in a machine shop. Go ahead, Casey. What state? I was born in a state of ignorance. There you go. My point exactly. Well, he can talk, can he? He talks as good as me. That means he's got to be alive. I wouldn't count on it. But he is not human. Easy for you to say. How human do you want him? He's got arms, legs, a face. And ears. But no heart. He doesn't even own one. How can he be human without a heart? Beasley don't have a heart either. He owns 40% of the ball club. Ah, that's it, gentlemen. He doesn't have a heart. Ergo, he isn't human. And that's a violation of the baseball code. Therefore, he doesn't play. Mr. Commissioner, suppose this. Just for the sake of argument. Supposing I... Gave him a heart. You gave him? Where will you get one? At the local parts store? Hear me out. If that essential is the only thing that renders him different from the norm, I could try an operation. I think I could do it. In fact, I'm sure I could. Supply him with a self-contained mechanical heart, that is. Now you're talking, Prof. How about that, huh? What do you say? Mm, well, it would be very uh, irregular. If he were to be given a heart, would medical science classify him as... Uh, what I mean is, could he then be called a... He had the doc fooled, even without one. <sighs> All right. With a heart, I'll give him a temporary okay until the league meeting in October. Then we'll have to take it up in session. The other teams will scream bloody murder. Uh, I can see DeRocher now. Ah, then it's all settled. Casey gets a heart and accreditation as human, and the Zephyrs... Take it, Maldi. With pleasure. Hoboken wins the pennant for the first time in 23 years. So, where's Casey? Search me. He's supposed to be here. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much, operator. Well, how's Casey? Is he coming? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? The operator can't get an answer at Stillman's house. Well, maybe he's in the middle of the operation. So he's in the middle of the operation. What's the matter? He can't use one hand to pick up the phone? We can't wait no longer. I gotta turn in the starting lineup. Corrigan? Yeah, Mouth. You'll pitch tonight. All the rest of you, same as before. Now listen, you guys. That's the enemy out there. That's the New York Giants. And while we're out there playing, a fellow named Casey is lying on a table struggling to make it. And I know, I know that the last words out of his mouth before the knife went into his chest were, go on out there and win one for me. And I'm going to tell you something else, fellas. From now on, from now on, there's going to be a ghost in that dugout. Every time you pick up a bat, Look over to where Casey used to sit, because he'll be there in spirit, rooting for us, cheering for us, yelling, Go Zephyrs, go! Hello. Oh, hi there, Professor. And I'm going to tell you something else about him. He has heart. Not a real heart, maybe, but that guy is lying there with a great big hole in his chest. He... He... Hello, Mr. McGarry. Hello. Now, as I was saying... Casey? Hey, 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 welcome back. Hey. <laughs> all right, all right, knock it off. Quiet in here. Sorry we're late. Well, 
you got something to tell me? Go ahead, Casey. Listen, Mr. McGarry. I'm listening. He means his chest. Put your ear against it. Go ahead. Okay. Hear it, sir? I hear it. Casey, you got heart. And look at that smile on his face. That's the one thing I could never get him to do. Smile. How do you feel, boy? I feel... Well, frankly, I feel wonderful. Just wonderful. I feel togetherness with everybody. Then let's go team. Yeah. Casey starts tonight. The new Casey. Now let's get out there and show them what we're made of. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is what we've all been waiting for, the big one. Oh, there's joy in Hoboken tonight, let me tell you. I wouldn't miss this one for the world. One of the greatest comeback streaks in history. Casey takes the pitcher's mound. The umpire signals the start of the game. Casey winds up. He throws. And it's a high fly over the wall and out of the park. That's a home run for the Giants. What a way to start the game. Well, that'll be a big one on the scoreboard. What's he doing? Cool it, guys. Casey's just playing with him. Making it more exciting. Know what I mean? If you say so, Mouth. Another run for the Giants. Now it's three to nothing. What's wrong with the mighty Casey? That's what fans want to know. It's all over. A shutout for the Giants. Looks like Casey's streak is history. Well, well, one minute he's three Bob Fellers rolled into one, and the next minute he's a tanker with nothing. You want to tell me what's going on? It's rather complicated. Then you tell me, Casey. Start by explaining how one pitcher can throw nine balls and give up four singles, two doubles, a triple, and two home runs. I don't know what to say, Mr. McGarry. Shall I tell him? Tell me what? It's because Casey has a heart now. So? He has heart. Big deal. The thing is, Mr. McGarry, I just couldn't strike out those poor fellows. I didn't have it in me to do that, to hurt their feelings. I felt... I felt... He felt compassion. What? That's what he's got now. Compassion. See that smile on his face? Give an individual a heart, Mr. McGarry. Particularly someone like Casey, who hasn't been around long enough to understand things like competitiveness or drive or ego. And it's bound to happen. Oh, my aching back. I'm sorry, Mr. McGarry. I just couldn't hurt their careers. Professor Stillman thinks I should go into social work. I'd like to help people. That's what happens to you. Should I tell you what happens to me? I get shipped off to a baseball farm system that consists of one silo and a McCormick Reaper. The only thing we get come spring is a wheat crop. Right now, I'm going to go have me a drink. Oh, Mr. McGarry. What do you want? I was wondering if I might come with you. What for? Do you mind, Casey? Oh, don't worry about me, sir. You go ahead. Good. Good. Now, Mr. McGarry, I've been doing some thinking. About what? The characteristics necessary to make a great baseball player. I figured out the mechanism for hooks and curves and sliders... And I think Casey is the perfect height. But when it comes to temperament, motivation, attitude, that sort of thing, there may be a better way. Such as? I might be persuaded to build another model, new and improved, who would work out even better. I could have him ready, say, for next year's spring training? Who's going to pay for it? Oh, I've got the funding, don't worry. But I thought, if we could go over the plans together... What do you got in mind? Let me draw you a picture.
Jeez, that's a heck of a story. Yep. Of course, it didn't work out. The professor didn't have the money. And he wanted certain, well, perks that old man Beasley wouldn't agree to. So it fell apart after that. But for a few weeks there, a bright, shining time it was. We didn't just have heart. We had hope. How do you know so much, Mr. Corrigan? Because I used to play with him when there still was a team called the Zephyrs. No kidding. Come on. We better get back to work. You finish your lunch? Yeah. Then let's go. They're going to flatten this place to the ground tomorrow. We got to get it marked off. I guess so. Once upon a time, there was a Major League Baseball team called the Hoboken Zephyrs, who, during the last year of their existence, wound up in last place and shortly thereafter were consigned to oblivion. There is a rumor, unsubstantiated of course, that a manager named McGarry took some of them to the West Coast and wound up with a pennant and a world's championship not long after. This newly revised team had a pretty fair lineup of pitchers with names like Drysdale, Koufax, and Sherry, or so the story goes. So if you're interested in where any of those now famous gentlemen really came from, here's a tip. Just check under B for baseball in the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Ring-A-Ding Girl, starring Sarah Wayne Callies with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Earl Hamner Jr. Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, David Darlow, Christian Stolte, Doug James, Fernette Lebo, Kurt Nabig, and Carl Amari. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone.
Stacy? Yes? Get that, will you? Right away. Just a minute. Yes, Patrick? Well? She'll be down in five minutes. She's not going to make it. Yes, she will. She always does. Here. What's that? A package. The mail truck just brought it. I'll take it up to her. You get the bags at the foot of the stairs. It's 30 minutes to the airport. Then you'll just have to drive faster. I can't work miracles. Yes, you can. That's why you're her favorite driver. Just tell her... She knows. Ring it in, girl. Hello, Ivor. Yes, I know the limousine is waiting. And I know what time the plane takes off. I promise you I'll make it. No, I am not procrastinating, even though I don't want to make this picture. Because I don't want to go to Rome. I don't like to fly. Yes, Ivor, I know, and you are making me even later. Mm-hmm. Love you, too. Bye. How's it coming? My agent's nervous. So am I. You've got 25 minutes to get to the airport. Won't they hold the plane? Not forever. You'd better go into fast forward. Um, everything's packed. I'll wear the mink. Carry my ring case down to Patrick, will you please? You're taking all of them? It was your idea, wasn't it? It was my idea that it might be good publicity if the ring-a-ding girl collected rings. Not that she take them everywhere she goes. But I haven't decided which one to wear. What's in the package? It just came. Special delivery. You can open it on the way. I adore presents. The plane can wait. Bonnie, please. Please accept the enclosed as a token of our affection from your fan club in Howardville. Isn't that sweet? Do you know where Howardville is? Doesn't everyone? You'll catch a glimpse of it if you look down. We fly over it. Hooray for us. Howardville is my hometown. They're my most loyal fans. You know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. They actually took up a collection to pay my way to the screen test. I wonder what they've sent me now. You find out. I'll get your precious jewelry down to the car. Oh, look, such a big ring. I hope it didn't cost them a fortune. What's in the stone? A picture? How did they do that? Bunny, this is your sister. Come home, Bunny. Please, I need you. Come home right now. Introduction to Bunny Blake. Occupation, film actress. Residence, Hollywood, California. Or anywhere in the world the cameras happen to be rolling. Miss Blake is a beautiful and extremely public figure. What she wears, eats, says, even thinks is news. But underneath the glamour, the makeup, the publicity, is a flesh and blood person, one who has just been handed the role of a lifetime. Because on the way to her next shoot, she will take an unscheduled side trip to a location in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Ring-A-Ding Girl, starring Sarah Wayne Callies, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. And I'll have the sports scores, plus the top stories from Howardville and the surrounding area. But first, the weather. Ah, uh, hurry up. Looks like we might be in for some showers. There's a low Bad. pressure trough moving in from the northeast. Yeah. Let's take a look at the Doppler. There we go. That high pressure Bad. moving in, bringing yes, I said. I need the picnic the basket from the yet, cellar. Stay tuned throughout the day for updates every twenty. Soon minutes. as he gives the scores. For all you folks in the southern part of the county, the annual picnic and fundraiser is happening this afternoon. But better carry an umbrella just now, to be Buster. I'm packing the sandwiches just as soon as I finish vacuuming. The news guy said it's going to rain. I know he did. So does the radio. But just in the northern part of the county. Now, get me that picnic basket. Did you clean your room? Not yet. Then get a move on. I'm going. Did you mow the lawn yet? 
Oh, Mom. We had an agreement. You want your allowance, don't you? Yes, ma'am. Then let me hear that lawnmower. Okay. Thank you. Would you plug in the vacuum cleaner cord for me, please? Isn't there a law against child labor in this state? Now, young man. Bud, what happened to the electricity? Bud? Who pulled the cord out of the... Boo. Oh! Bunny! <laughs> she remembers! Oh, come here! Let me get a look at you! It's been so long. I can't believe I've it! I've been looking forward to this. I think about you all the time. So good to be home. Why didn't you let us know? Uh, how did you get in without my hearing you? Same old way. I think I know this house. Oh, I could just shake you. That's no way to greet a celebrity. Five years, and here you are without one speck of warning. Look at that coat. Mm, you know me. Glamorous, unpredictable, and full of surprises. Same old nut. What brought you home just out of the blue like this? Well, I thought you might like to see me. Uh, I'm tickled pink, but why now, just like that? Maybe the ring had something to do with it. <gasps> oh, it came! This morning, you see? Mm -hmm. You don't think it's too big? Not at all. No, it reminds me of that mood ring I had when I was little, remember? I, this is much nicer, of course. Much, much nicer. Oh, what a project it was. Everybody in town chipped in and they let me pick it out. <laughs> Do you like it? I love it. Sis, is everything all right? Mm, what do you mean? Are you all right? Never better. Why? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just tired. Oh, come and sit down. Can I get you anything? No, no. Take your coat off. Oh, is that real mink? Mm-hmm. They call it Ember Autumn. Mm. I suppose it's a bit much. One of the perks of being a star. Oh, you. Oh, don't let it touch the floor. I haven't finished vacuuming yet. This is the way we do it in Hollywood, darling. They teach you to do it in acting class. Off one shoulder, then the other, then drop it like so. Oh. It's supposed to show that you really don't care because you've got ten more at home in the closet. And you move your hips like this... Ooh, that walk didn't come from acting class. <laughs> <laughs> My one natural talent. Oh, Bunny, we are so proud of you. The whole town is. Are we going to get to keep you for a while? Just for the day, I'm afraid. Oh, but that's not nearly long enough. I know. I'm stealing time as it is. They want me in Rome. Rome? But I got to the airport, and right at the last minute, I said, no, I'm going home instead. I got the basket. Now can I... Whoa. And who is this divine man? You remember Bud? Ain't Bunny? Surely this isn't Bud. So handsome. I thought he was my next leading man. Aw, oh, I get it. Mom says you're always cracking jokes. Mm, and she was right, but I don't joke about everything. You want a, a soda pop or something? I can get you one Weren't if... you going to clean your room? He can do that later. I haven't seen him in ages. It's so good to be home. I'm anxious to see everybody, all my old friends. Well, you came at the right time. Remember the Founder's Day picnic? Oh, how could I forget? Do they still have the beauty pageant? They sure do. The year I won was what got me started. My picture in the paper, someone on the coast saw it. Uh, the picnic's this afternoon. Everyone in town will be there. Why don't you come with us? The picnic? Bud and I have to go. I'm on the food committee and Bud's a lifeguard. Picnic. We promised we'd be there. Bunny, what's the matter? Are you all right? Come over to the couch. I'm fine. Just let me sit down. I don't know what's wrong with me. I didn't get much sleep. Oh, take my arm. Bud, get on the other side. I'm fine, I'm telling you. Bunny? Bunny? What is that? Do you hear it? Hear what? Is the television on? No. Bunny? Bunny? And a special hello to you, Bunny Blake, wherever you are. Bunny, for the love of God, come home. We need you. We need you. You're pale. You look like you're going to faint. I, uh... If I could just lie down, 
Put your feet up. Bud, call Dr. Floyd. Sure, if you think. Just do it, now. Bunny. Hello, um, I, I want to talk to... Bunny. Yeah, tell him it's an emergency. And open. There. Well, what's the verdict? Will I live or will I die? Well, temperature's normal. Pulse is strong enough. You do seem a little tired. I played a nurse once in a movie. Doctor reminded me of you. The gruff but kindly old family physician. I saw it. The medical profession should have sued. Stay off your feet a while longer. Oh, please, don't you get it? I was faking. About being sick, I mean. I just wanted to see you. I'm flattered. Do you have to smoke? It calms my nerves. Quite the contrary, actually. Still the same old Dr. Floyd. You haven't changed. That I don't believe. I delivered you, after all. Sorry, I don't remember. What's your diagnosis? In a nutshell, one exhausted young lady. What do you do out in Hollywood, anyway? I glow. Wind me up and I give off incandescent sparkles. Isn't that what stars do? I'd say you've been sparkling a little too much lately. What you need is sleep, rest, fresh air, and some of Hildy's good cooking. I want you to take it easy for a while. I'd love to oblige you, kind sir, but that's impossible. There's a producer waiting in Rome this very minute, pulling out what little hair he has left, just wondering where I am. Tell me his name. I'll send a cable and tell him you're sick. But I'm not. Just the same. I didn't like what Hildy told me. She said you had some kind of seizure. Oh, that's silly. She thought you were in shock. You seemed not to hear or see her. It was a performance. Evidently a very convincing one. I told you it was all an excuse to get you over here. Well, it worked. There's something I want to ask you. Yes? About Founders Day. What about it? You used to be a big man on the committee. Still am. I'm the chairman now. Then could you do something for me? Hmm? As one kindly, gruff old family friend to another, would you do me one very large favor? I'll be happy to try. I want the picnic put off. Postponed until another day. Really? Is that all? It's important. You can't be serious, Bunny. Why? I've got one little day to spend at home. I want it to be a plain, ordinary apple pie day, just the way I remember. I want to drop in on my old friends, surprise them at home. You could see them at the picnic. No, it wouldn't be the same. There'll be crowds, people I don't know, crowds tugging at me for my autograph. I'd be miserable. Bunny, listen to me. You can't seriously expect the entire town to rearrange its plans just to suit your whims. Doc, I love this town and I love the people. Would I ask them to do this for me if it weren't more than a whim? I don't know what your life is like away from here. Perhaps in Hollywood you can make an unreasonable request and have it granted, but this isn't Hollywood. I'm going to give you a little something to help you rest. Oh, doctor, if I could only make you understand. Any pharmacy in town should be able to fill this. No, not the ring again. Ring-a-ding, girl. Oh, there's a laugh I ever heard one. You don't fool Cyrus, Jenkins. Coming back here like you was somebody special. Go back to where you belong, Bunny Blake. Go back. Go back. Go back. Oh. Don't you want your prescription, Bunny? Excuse me, Doctor. I don't belong here. Bunny? Bunny? Hildy, can you come here? Yes, doctor. How is the patient? Mm, where is the patient? She went upstairs. She did? Very agitated all of a sudden. The look on her face. Hildy, what's upsetting your sister? I wish I knew. She seems to be under a severe strain and acting quite irrationally. I know. I'm delighted to see her, of course, but to fly here like this without so much as a call? There's something downright odd about it. I want you to get this filled. Some pills to relax her, keep her as quiet as possible, and by no means let her go to Rome, at least not right away. I'll try, but she's always had her own mind. It may be just fatigue, but then again... Should I be worried? It's too soon to say. For now, let's keep an eye on her. Thank you, Doctor. I'll do my best. Call me if you need me. I will. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hmm. 
Bud? Yeah. Is your car running? Sure is. Why? This is a prescription for Aunt Bunny's medicine. Get it filled as quickly as you can. Okay. What's the matter with her, Mom? I'm not sure. Not one single solitary thing is the matter, Hildy. I could have told you that. I'm really shocked at how old Dr. Floyd's getting. I think that sweet old man ought to put himself out to pasture, don't you? He thinks you ought to get some rest. Does he? Well, I'm not the least bit tired. He's the one that needs rest, poor dear. Did you see the way his hands tremble? Nevertheless, he left a prescription for you. Something to help you relax. Bud's going to go get it. Meanwhile, why don't you just lie down and take it easy? I can make us something while we wait. You mean stay here? I can just hear what people will say. Bunny didn't bother to see any of her old friends. She's so stuck up now that she's a movie star. No one will say that. I'll explain that you didn't feel well. Bobby Woodson used to be my best friend. I've just got to see her. There'll be time. And Ben Braden? You remember that excruciating crush he had on me? What happened to Ben? Still here. He runs the television station. Oh. Does the news and all the local shows. And the sports, too. I could have married that old boy. Did you know that? I've got a good mind to walk in and surprise him. I really don't think you should leave the house today, honey. Oh, you don't? Well, I can't stand being cooped up. Sometimes I get that closed-in feeling at my house in California. I get that, too. You know what I do? I take off every stitch of clothes and I jump into the pool and swim like a fish. You do? Bud, why don't you go get that prescription now? Remember when we used to skinny dip at the old swimming hole? Uh, it must be very interesting for your neighbors. Nobody's complained yet. I'll bet. But I have an idea. You want to go for a walk and say hello to some people? The doctor said you need to rest. He also said I need fresh air. Oh, at least wait till Bud gets back from the drugstore with your medicine. Got a better idea. I'll ride to the drugstore with him. What do you say, Bud? Well, sure, I, I guess. I don't think... What could be more restful than a little ride? Unless you're one of those drag racers, are you? Not me. I am. You want to see me on the Hollywood freeway. Once, I got up to 105, and this divine cop flagged me down and said, Where's the fire, lady? I mean, he actually said that. Well, I said, Sugar, I'm late for work, and the studio's going to suspend me if I'm late one more time. Bunny. It ended up with Dollface giving me a police escort right to the studio gate. I even had dinner with him a couple of times. Till I found out he was married. You did? Well, you going with me, or are we going to stand here talking all day? Heck no. I mean... Yes, I, I mean... But the picnic! If you worry too much, Hildy, we'll be back in plenty of time, I promise. Want your coat? Why, thank you, kind sir. L let me get the door. Well, what do you know? That's a real ring-a-ding sky. Drive carefully, bud. Don't be long, you two. Well, what do you think, Aunt Bunny? Pretty cool wheels, huh? Very cool, but please don't call me Aunt Bunny. I sound like a house mother at the Playboy Club. Okay, Bunny. There, that's better. Isn't that better? Must be pretty boring for you. I wouldn't say that. Compared to Hollywood and everything, you know a lot of movie stars. <laughs> a few. What are they like? Which ones? Oh, I don't know. You go to parties and all that stuff? Not very often. Mostly I stay home, study my lines, and go to bed. You do? I have to get up early when I'm on a picture. Do you have one of those... Aw, oh, never mind. Go ahead, say it. Well, I hear everybody has a water bed out there. I used to, but I got rid of it. How come? Too noisy. Sloshing around every time you turn over. Sometimes I'd wake up in the night and I think I was on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Gosh. They're cold, too. Especially because I don't wear anything when I sleep. You don't? Better not mention that part to your mother. But you understand. We're just talking, aren't we? A couple of old friends tooling around on the best set of wheels in town. Isn't that right? Sure, Bunny. So, where do you want to go? Is Mr. Gentry still the caretaker at the high school? Old Methuselah? Oh, yeah. They'll have to blow up the place to get rid of him. Be an angel. Stop by just long enough for me to run in and say hi. School's closed today. I know, but Mr. Gentry's always around, isn't he? I used to think he lived there. 
Well, the gate's open. I could show you how to get in the building. Would you? I'd appreciate that. Maybe we should get your medicine first. Bud, this is important, or I wouldn't ask you. Okay, if do you think it's all right? Oh, it'll be fine. Trust me. I just have to deliver a message. Gentry, remember me? Barbara Blake. That you? It's me. How are you? <laughs> I'm kicking pretty high for an old man. So you finally came back. Get your fill of Hollywood, did you? No, I like it there. It's not what you think. Isn't it? Well, we read all about the hijinks you get into. Can't say I'd be proud of it. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, Mr. Gentry. It's just a town like any other. <laughs> What brings you back here, Barbara? I'm not sure. It was an impulse. Well, you picked a time. The Founders Day celebration. Not that you'd be interested. But I am interested. That's why I need your help. My help? I want you to do something for me. Unlock the doors to the school auditorium. What for? Some people might show up. And if they do, I want you to let them in. Oh, <laughs> not me. No, nope, I'm going to the picnic. Please, Mr. Gentry, I know you don't like me, but this is important. It's it's terribly important. <laughs> Barbara Blake. Always asking for favors. Wanting to be treated like somebody special. Maybe you forgot those doors are open all day long. You want to come here? You can walk in just like anybody else. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. It was wonderful to see you. Anything else I can do you for? Just one. Mr. Gentry, I, I can't explain it yet, and if I did, you wouldn't believe me. But please don't go to the picnic. Take my word for it, you mustn't. Not this year. Well? How does the old town look? So good, I wonder why I ever left. Why did you leave, I mean? <sighs> oh, I guess I could have stayed and done Blythe Spirit in the little theater and played an angel in the church pageant at Christmas time, but I was too ambitious. Too talented, you mean? Oh, I don't know if it was that. I just... I knew I had some talent and I had to find a place for it to grow. Otherwise, it would have died and I'd have ended up... Frustrated, pushing a broom around a house I couldn't stand and screaming at a brood of children. I... Can you understand that, bud? I sure can. Well, you've got your prescription. Want to go home now? Wait. What's the matter? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain. We're running into a little rough weather. Fasten your seatbelts, please. It might get a little bumpy up here. Bunny, something wrong with your ring? What? Oh. Uh, oh, no, nothing at all. It's just the way it catches the light. Sometimes I think I see a, a, a picture in it. Uh, yeah. Do you want to go home? Is the television station still on the street? Uh-huh. Right over there. Wait for me, will you, bud? I'll be right back. Thank you, Jeffrey. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and the weather for the Tri-County area. No, no. For the Tri-County area, boy, have we got some weather for you. Now, the weather in the Tri-County. What's this, Harold? Corn, Mr. Braden, for the farm report. Nice, huh? Very nice. Would you move it aside so I can see my script? Sure thing. 90 seconds. Thank you. How's my hair look? Great, Mr. Braden. Hey! Hey, you can't come in here. Thanks. It's all right. I'm a friend of Mr. Braden's. Barbara? I mean, Bunny? Forgive me for bursting in this way. Not at all. Well, I'll be darned. They said you were going on the air, but I did so want to say hello. Honey, you could have busted in here even if I was on camera. Don't I get a kiss? One minute. 
Well, you haven't changed. You have. You used to be skinny as a rail. I was not. I was svelte. Nope. Now you're svelte. A mink? Hollywood coveralls. Still a smart aleck, too. Want to be on my show? I thought you'd never ask. 45 seconds. Will you? You can be my co-host. Say something cute. Say anything you like. The viewers will love it. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what I had in mind. I wanted to make an announcement. Oh, yeah? Got a new movie to plug? No, not at all. More along the lines of a public service announcement. Sounds worthwhile. I hope so. Because I have a feeling this one might be a, a matter of life and death. Hello? No, I haven't got it turned on. She is? Oh, of course I knew she was in town. No, no warning, but she's supposed to be at the drugstore with Bud. Yes, Clara, I'll call you back. Yes, Ben, you can't imagine how happy I am to be back in Howardville. It hasn't changed a bit, and I mean that in a good way. What in the world? Will you be with us for a nice long visit this time, buddy? Unfortunately, I have to leave tonight. Work calls. Oh, a new picture? I'm starting one in Rome. That sounds exciting. Yes, it's a wonderful script. I'm looking forward to it. Everyone in town has been following your career. I'm sure a lot of your old friends would like to see you. Well, but they can if they really want to. Are you kidding? You know that one-woman show I did in Las Vegas last winter? We read all about it. Well, I'm giving a special performance this afternoon in the high school auditorium. And I hope everyone in town will come. As my guest, of course. Wow, did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? It's my way of giving back to the community. You know, everyone here has always been so supportive of me. This is just a, a little token of my appreciation. Oops, I think we've got a conflict here. The Founders Day picnic starts at 3 o'clock. You remember what a big event that always is. I know, but I'm afraid it just has to be today. All I can say is that you'll have a choice of coming to see me at 3 o'clock... Or going over to Riverside Park and getting hit by... By... A bunch of ants. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Well, Bunny, thank you so much for stopping by. Clara? I just heard. I swear I don't know a thing about it. I thought she was on her way back from the drugstore, and now here she is on TV. Why, I don't know which one I'll go to. They'll expect me at the picnic. The way I feel now, I'd be too embarrassed to show my face anywhere. Oh, here they are now. I'll call you back. Hi, Mom. Sorry we took so long. Go to your room. Bunny, I'm trying not to be angry with you because you must have lost your mind. I told you there was going to be an explosion, buddy boy. I can explain. I said you're excused. Yes, ma'am. It wasn't his fault. This is nothing to joke about. People are calling here. And what do they say? They're confused. They don't know whether to go to the picnic or this whatever it is you're putting on at the school. I can understand that, but... What are you trying to do? I owe this town, Hildy. It's just my way of paying back a debt. It doesn't look that way. It looks like you're a show-off, a big celebrity who's trying to impress a lot of small-town hicks. That's not it at all. Then what is it? Sis, let's not fight. I can't condone what you're doing, Bunny, and I won't be a part of it. Bud and I will be at the picnic. Oh, Hilda, you don't understand. No. Not the ring. Is that Howardville down there? That's it. That fly speck next to the river. That's what you wanted to go home to? Forget it, Bunny. We don't have time. Have time. Oh no, there has to be time. What else can I do? Barb? What's the matter? Nobody understands what I'm trying to do. It's not for me, not this time. Please don't cry. 
Oh, honey, there are some things about you I'll never understand. But if this performance means so much to you... It does. Then don't you worry. We'll be there, I promise. Time to go. We're late. Don't worry. One thing's for sure. They can't start the show till I get there. Ooh, better take an umbrella. Thanks. Bud, we're waiting. I can't find my blue tie. Then wear another one. We're late as it is. You'd better fire your weatherman. Now, bud. Coming. The streets will be a fright. Remember how we used to lie in our beds on rainy nights and talk to each other when we were kids? Oh, it was fun, wasn't it? Being kids. It was special. I'll never forget it. It's raining really heavy. Well, we'll just have to brave it. I have an audience waiting. Oh, we need raincoats. They're in the hall closet. You wear one. I'm going in style. That fur will get all ruined. Don't worry about me. Help me on with it, will you? Your ring looks really pretty. Thank you, bud. We've hit some unexpected turbulence, so please remain seated. We'll get through it all right, folks. Getting kind of rough. Don't worry, Cece. It was meant to be. You aren't scared at all, are you? Why should I be? Can't live forever, you know. It's like... When I'm in my dressing room and there's a call to come to the set, I know what's waiting for me. I know there's nothing I can do to put it off any longer. Sometimes I'm not even sure if I know my lines, but the show must go on. Hildy. Yes? I'm going now. I'm coming. Not this time. What do you mean? And Hildy, thank you. For what? For being my sister. I always loved you, you know. Bunny? That one's a fire engine. Sounds like an awful lot of them. Turn on the news. Goodbye, Hildy. And Buddy, take good care. Bunny? Major disaster. We'll bring you updates as they come in. For now, the highway patrol has issued a bulletin for everyone Turn that to remain down. inside. Hello? Mrs. Blake? Yes. This is Jim Haddock with the state troopers. Oh, what is it, Jim? I'm out at the park. I thought you ought to know. Know what? The Bud, where's Bunny? I don't know. It's terrible. I've never seen anything like it. Like what? Jim, will you please tell me what it is you're talking about? The crash. It happened minutes ago. What crash? Passenger jet. L.A. to New York torn up in that storm. Crashed right in the middle of the picnic grounds. Hildy, your sister is dead. Bunny is dead. Dead? <laughs> That's crazy. She was a passenger on that plane. She and another woman sitting right next to each other. Jim, my sister is here. Now. I saw the body myself. Hildy, there's no mistake. It was Bunny Blake. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you. Bunny? Bunny, where are you? She's not here, Mom. Want to hear the news? Fortunately, only a Bunny? handful of people attended this year's Founders Day picnic, so a disaster of even greater proportions was averted. Bunny! Most of the population is safe at the high school auditorium, where they gathered for a special performance by our own local celebrity, Miss Bunny Blake. Conflicting reports claim that she was a passenger on the ill-fated plane, but... Witnesses swear, I would swear, that she was here in Howardville this afternoon. Until the mystery is solved, only one thing is certain. There's been a terrible crash, the worst in the state's history. Bunny! Mom! That ring you gave her. I got it. She dropped it on the porch. 
Mom? We are all travelers. The trip starts in a place called birth and ends at a distant location known as death. And that's the end of the journey. Unless, like Bunny Blake, you happen to make one last curtain call on a misty stage somewhere in the twilight zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. So here is the agreement. You got it all down. Shh, of course you did, Hans. How are you feeling, Maria? I think my baby is not coming tonight. If we are all ready to sign... Read it aloud. <clears throat> we, the undersigned, having accepted the following propositions. A, that prior to the inception of language, man communicated by telepathic means. And B, that this ability still exists and can be developed to its former effectiveness, do hereby agree to the following. One, to dedicate our lives to the study of mental telepathy and other extrasensory functions. Uh -huh. Two, that the findings of this study will be applied not only to ourselves, but to our children, born and unborn. Good, good. Three, that each family unit shall strive to avoid the interference of society. Four, that monthly correspondence shall be exchanged until such time as it is possible for all four units to establish a colony in which communication shall be exclusively mental. Comments? More than sufficient, I think. Carl? It is what we agreed upon. That sounds very close to disapproval. No, I will sign. You're certain? This must be entered into with absolute assurance. He is assured, Holger. You are still uncertain? Not of the general concept. Yet I wonder, have we the right to impose this study on our children? Even those unborn? Impose, Maria? You speak as though we harm our children. Is it not rather that we bestow upon them a great gift? Of course, that is our hope. But we offer them no choice in the matter. Is that just? I am also a mother, Maria, devoted to the welfare of my child. Yet I am convinced it is just. It is more than just. It is inevitable. Destiny demands it. That's why I will be the first to sign. And I, beneath my husband's signature. I have no hesitation. Nor have I, Professor Werner. Have you and Holzer decided definitely not to remain in Heidelberg? There's a house in Pennsylvania which was left to him by an uncle. And what is the town? It is called German Corners. Ah. It's for the better, Maria. You'll see. Yes. Yes, all right. Thank you. Want my signature? Thank you all. It is... it is a nice town, is it? Oh, yes. Small, secluded. Oh, Ilsa needs to be fed again. Excuse me, I must see to her. 
What you have just witnessed is the curtain raiser to a most extraordinary play, to wit, the signing of a pact. The play itself will be performed almost entirely off stage. The main character of these final scenes lies sleeping in her crib, unaware of the singular drama in which she is to be involved. Her name is Ilsa, the daughter of Professor and Mrs. Nielsen. Her age, barely one. But ten years from this moment, Ilsa Nielsen will know the terror of living simultaneously in this world and in the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone after these brief messages. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. You can purchase and download classic Twilight Zone episodes with new casts and new audio production exclusively here at twilightzoneradio.com. Log on to our new and improved official Twilight Zone Radio Dramas website at twilightzoneradio.com where you can download three free Twilight Zone Radio Dramas. Long Distance Call starring Hal Sparks, Ring-A-Ding Girl starring Sarah Wayne Callies, and Five Characters in Search of an Exit starring Jason Alexander. Who said the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax? It was Albert Einstein. Now, if he had a hard time figuring it out, what about the rest of us mere mortals? Many of us can and do find ourselves in a jam with the IRS. Luckily for you, there's Taxmasters. The former IRS agents and tax professionals at Taxmasters will solve your IRS problems. Do you owe back taxes? Being audited? Have several years of unfiled returns? Has an IRS agent visited your home or your place of business? Write this number down. 1-800-581-0452. Again, one 800 5810452 The former IRS agents and tax professionals at Taxmasters are waiting for your call to help solve your IRS problems right now. So call or go to txmstr.com for more info. You do not want to represent yourself with the IRS. Taxmasters has helped many good people just like you. The IRS has stepped up its collection efforts, so now more than ever you need to call Taxmasters. Call Taxmasters right now at 1-800-581-0452. Taxmasters will solve your IRS problems. Log on to KQV.com and talk to your news station. We want your comments and suggestions. KQV.com for the daily opinion poll. KQV.com for the news you need. KQV.com. Log on. Listen and learn. Remember, KQV.com. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Mute, starring Wade Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Yeah. This is Tom Poulter. The Nielsen house is burning. What? There's a fire at the Nielsen house. A big one. Hurry! Right away. Harry, what? Max, Harry, I, I know it's 2 o'clock in the morning. There, there's a fire at the Nielsen house. Call the volunteers and get the truck out. I'll be there as soon as I can. Oh, it's so far. I told them when they first came here it wasn't a good idea to live that far from town, but no, they wouldn't listen. We want privacy, they said. Well, that privacy may very well be the end of them. The girl. That lovely girl. Keep the woods from catching. You heard him, Tom. Get the hose. Start pumping. Right. Here goes. Let's check the back. There's no way in. They're done for. That poor kid. Harry, over here. Where'd you find her? In the clearing. The sparks were about to catch. You think she's... Let me see. She burned? No. Oh, she's alive. You all right? She's in shock, Harry. I'll put her in the car. Lay her down on the 
on the seat. There's a blanket in the back. Here you go, little lady. Put this around you. It's going to be all right now. Head off. Can't talk or cry or nothing. She isn't burned, though. Tell me something, Tom. How could she get out of that house without being burned? Is she hurt? Not physically. I think she's in shock. We better put her to bed. Where are you going? We'll have to use Sally's... the other bedroom. Cora? All right, Harry. Pull back the bed clothes. Uh, of course. Cover her up. I'll be downstairs. Poor darling. She looks a little like Sally, doesn't she? Harry? You want something to eat? No, I gotta get right back. Thought I'd take a thermos of coffee for the boys. Are her parents? No, we have known. We haven't been able to get into the house yet. It's burning too hard. But she... Tom Poulter found her outside. Outside? We don't know how she got there. I expect your folks didn't get out, though. It's an awful fire. Oh, the poor child. Something's wrong with her. I know she isn't deaf or dumb or retarded or anything, but before she fell asleep in the car, I tried to get her to talk. She never said a word. Not a word. Even in shock, the power of speech isn't completely gone. It's as if she doesn't know how to talk. Oh, Harry. You know something, Cora? I don't think her parents ever taught her. Mother? 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 Where are you, Mother? Ilsa. Ilsa. Are you near me, Father? Ilsa. Ilsa, you must be brave now. Mother! Mother! Where are you? Over here, Harry. The other room. Oh, my God. Both of them. What is it, Ilsa? Oh, darling, what is it? I'm not going to hurt you. Ilsa, what's the matter? They're dead. They're dead. They're dead. They're dead. You still awake, Cora? Is the fire out? Yes, it's out. And her parents? Too late. How did it start? We're not positive, but apparently the professor was smoking his pipe in bed and fell asleep. And there was nothing left to... Everything was burned, Cora, I told you. There's no way of getting in touch with Ilsa's relatives, then. Tom Poulter says the post office gets three letters for the Nielsens from Europe at the end of every month. I'll wait till the next batch arrives and write to the three addresses. What are we going to do with the girl until then? We'll have to keep her here. It'll only be a week or so, Cora, unless the girl can tell us something. I doubt that she can. You don't think she can talk either? I tried everything I could to get her to, but... That explains it. What? Those times Miss Frank and I tried to talk the Nielsens into putting the girl in school, the answer was always no. I don't know why. Maybe there is something physically wrong with her. The Nielsens would have told us if there was, Cora. Not if they wanted to keep it a secret. We can have Doc Steiger check her over, but I don't think he'll find anything. But they were educated people, Harry. They were strange people, too, Cora. Hardly spoke a word themselves. As if they were too good to bother talking to us. It might not be a bad idea to put her into school while we're waiting for those letters. Teach her how to talk, at least. Not right away. No. No, please. Why not? She's got to learn sooner or later, doesn't she? 
She just lost her parents, Harry. I didn't mean tomorrow or the next day. I don't understand their words. It's a crime, though. A girl her age, not being educated, not even knowing how to talk. Make them stop. Her father, a professor, too, keeping his own child in ignorance. Well, something has to be done about it. She needs time, Harry. She's been through such an awful ordeal. She's only a child. Mother. Father. People. Here. I can't understand what they're saying. They speak in loud noises. Not the way we do. Please. Make them stop. We'll return to the Twilight Zone after these brief messages. You are about to enter another dimension. A digital dimension not only of sound but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of listening and imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone radio dramas on twilightzoneradio.com. The Twilight Zone radio dramas capture the original scripts of the groundbreaking TV show, and they've been updated with new cast and a new sound. You can hear them on your computer or transfer the programs to select MP3 players, the Apple iPod, or burn the programs to CDs, twilightzoneradio.com. Log on to our new and improved official Twilight Zone Radio Dramas website at twilightzoneradio.com where you can download three free Twilight Zone Radio Dramas. Long Distance Call starring Hal Sparks, Ring-A-Ding Girl starring Sarah Wayne Callies, and Five Characters in Search of an Exit starring Jason Alexander. Tired of trying to beat the stock market? A USA Today article stated some of the sharpest minds on Wall Street are betting you'll make more money in metals than Microsoft. Gold and other precious metals have given investors a 4 to 1 return over stocks in the last few years. And some experts predict gold could more than double or triple in price from today's value. Blanchard & Company, America's largest retail dealer in gold and precious metals, wants to help you start protecting your savings and growing your wealth with American Buffalo 24 karat gold gold bullion coins at an incredible price. They want you to experience how easy and profitable precious metals investing can be. In fact, Blanchard and Company will buy back your gold at any time you want to sell. Call 800-640-7083 to purchase American Buffalo 24-karat gold bullion coins. 800-640-7083. Don't miss out on this investment opportunity for American Buffalo 24-karat gold bullion coins. Call 800-640-7083. Who said the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax? It was Albert Einstein. Now, if he had a hard time figuring it out, what about the rest of us mere mortals? Many of us can and do find ourselves in a jam with the IRS. Luckily for you, there's Taxmasters. The former IRS agents and tax professionals at Taxmasters will solve your IRS problems. Do you owe back taxes? Being audited? Have several years of unfiled returns? Has an IRS agent visited your home or your place of business? Write this number down. one 800 5810452 again 1-800-581-0452 the former IRS agents and tax professionals at Taxmasters are waiting for your call to help solve your IRS problems right now so call or go to txmstr.com for more info you do not want to represent yourself with the IRS Taxmasters has helped many good people just like you the IRS has stepped up its collection efforts so now more than ever you need to call Taxmasters call Taxmasters right now at 1-800-581-0452 Masters will solve your IRS problems. Has credit card debt ravaged your financial stability or your home life? Fresh Start America can help. In fact, they can eliminate up to 60% of your credit card debt. They negotiate with your creditors, reduce your debt, cut years off your payments, and stop the debt cycle. It's a proven solution. They're friendly, caring professionals who won't judge you or talk down to you. You'll get your questions answered and your debt forgiven. Avoid bankruptcy. Cut your debt by thousands and enjoy life again. Imagine taking your credit card bills and cutting them in half. If you have over $10,000 in credit card debt, call for a free consultation. There's absolutely no cost or obligation. Call now. 800-695-0261. That's 800-695-0261. Not available in all states, including South Carolina. Call us today at 800-695-0261. 800-695-0261. Now, back to the Twilight Zone and our story, Mute. Well, at least she likes my cooking, especially at breakfast. 
course she does. She's a growing child. Do you think she likes us? She's calm when you're around. In fact, she hardly ever leaves your side. The doctor says she's healthy. I don't understand it. If there was something organic wrong with it, it was supposed to be. Don't talk! Please! Don't make those sounds anymore! There's nothing wrong with her. He checked everything. There isn't a reason in the world why she shouldn't be able to talk. I, I'm sure she will, when she's ready. Then I'm afraid we got a problem on our hands. She can't just learn on her own. I, I told you when she first moved here. Speak gently, Harry. You're frightening her. That's ridiculous. She has nothing to be frightened of here. Think of how it must seem from her point of view. If she's going to live among normal people, she'll have to live. But she is normal, except for the... She's not. She's not. God, God. Stop! Hey, hey. Stop! Oh, Harry, what did they do to her? Ilsa! Cora, leave her be. I can't just... She's been with us over a week now. What's the use? There's no way of getting through to her. I have to keep trying, Harry. Ilsa? May I come in? <laughs> can't you tell me what... Oh, there. There, go ahead and hold on to me. Oh. Oh, sweetheart, didn't they ever talk to you? Try to speak, Ilsa, try. Say your name at least. Can you do that? Ilsa. Ilsa. <sighs> if only I could make you understand. Take away your fear. Look into my eyes. That's it. I I'm trying to tell you something. Did you know I had a little girl once? This was her room. Her name was Sally. And then one day, one terrible day, I was downstairs. I looked out the kitchen window and I saw them coming, carrying something in their arms. What? What? Is that you, Tom? And Max? What do you have there? I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Wheeler. What is that in the blanket? Go on inside, Cora. Why are you bringing it in here? Where's Sally? She was swimming on the lake and... No, she wasn't. She's home, I tell you. Maybe you better sit down, ma'am. Sally? 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 Oh! <laughs> Sorry. I can't help but think of it sometimes. But now, you look so much like her. It's almost like you understand. Do you, Ilsa? Do you? post office. The three letters came in. Oh. Be back in a while. Yes. Yes, you do that. Oh, hello, Ilsa. Sit down here with me, just the two of us. I'll have another cup of coffee. Did you hear that? The letters came from your people. I suppose that means you'll be leaving us, but that won't be for a few weeks at least. For now, you can still be a part of our family. Yes. Now they'll come and take me to where there are other children like me. Perfect, Ilsa. You're just about the best helper a person could have. Harry? Everything all right? Oh, why wouldn't it be? Ilsa was just helping me dry the dishes. Do you have them? Why? The letters. Y you said you were... Oh, we can't have the letters, Cora. It's against the law. Tom's got to send them back. All they could let me do is copy the return addresses. Oh. I'm going to... Oh, hello, Ilsa. You like to stare, don't you? Go in the living room, Ilsa. I I'll be with you in a minute. Get me some paper and envelopes, will you please? I suppose you 
have to write them. What do you mean? Nothing. Uh, would you like a cup of coffee? Thanks. What are you telling them? Oh, just about to fire the Nielsen's time. Asking them if they're related to the girl or know where any of her relatives are. What if... Hmm? What if her relatives don't do any better with her than her parents did? It's none of our business, Cora. The welfare of a child is everybody's business. We're not in a position to decide for her. No, of course not. Our position is to send her away, get rid of her. And maybe she'll never talk, Harry. Maybe she'll be terrified of shadows all her life. Cora, I know how you feel. Sally's gone. Another child in the house. But she's not our child, Cora. We have no rights where she's concerned. And there is something wrong with her. Is that why you want to get rid of her? I think you know better than that. I'll finish these letters and put them in the mailbox before I leave. Hi there, Cora. Oh, uh, hello, Eunice. How's the little girl these days? Fine, just fine. I, I was just checking for the mail. Has it come yet? I don't think so. Looks like you got something. Just some junk mail from yesterday. It was still in the box. Well, you take care, Cora. Don't be such a stranger. You too. Falkenberg. Calder. Werner. All from Germany. Strange. If I tear up the letters, he'll find the pieces. I must burn them. The furnace. And that's it. In the basement. I must. Where is she going? What's downstairs? No. No. She's going to bring them. She can't. Fire. Fire. <laughs> Ilsa, is that you? Ilsa, come back! Ilsa! Ilsa! They'll never find me now. Never. Never. I'm here. My name is Ilsa Nielsen. Help me. Please. Someone. I'm here. Hear her! Now, who would that be? Probably Miss Frank. Miss Frank? What does she want? I asked her to stop by. Harry? Are you going to let her in? Oh, Harry, what have you done? Mrs. Wheeler? Hello, Miss Frank. Is Ilsa here? Won't you come in? Thank you. Good afternoon, Miss Frank. Sheriff? Glad you could come. I felt it was my duty. Please, sit down. You haven't heard from her family, I take it. Like I explained to you the other day, I wrote to these people in Europe four or five weeks ago, but we haven't gotten an answer. We don't know exactly what we're going to do with the girl, but until we decide, I, I feel she ought to start getting some education. She most certainly should. It was positively criminal of her parents not to have started her education years ago. The smugness of them. In many ways, that fire may have been the blessing of her life. Miss Frank... I'm not just referring to her lack of education, Mrs. Wheeler. But to call the hideous death of Ilsa's parents a blessing. I'm sure I didn't mean it that way, Mrs. Wheeler. What do you mean? I'd rather not discuss it at this time, Sheriff, except to say that I believe I know why Ilsa doesn't speak. You know? And how very much she needs to be educated. Why doesn't she speak? I can't go into details right now. I shall at a later time, after I've had the opportunity to question her. Question? The first thing she must do, of course, is to learn to talk. If I may see her now. She's upstairs, resting. I'll get her. Elsa? Elsa? Don't let them put me in school. Please. Elsa? Oh, please. They don't understand. They don't understand.
We'll be back to the Twilight Zone in a moment. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. You can purchase and download classic Twilight Zone episodes with new casts and new audio production exclusively here at twilightzoneradio.com. Log on to our new and improved official Twilight Zone Radio Dramas website at twilightzoneradio.com where you can download three free Twilight Zone Radio Dramas. Long Distance Call starring Hal Sparks, Ring-A-Ding Girl starring Sarah Wayne Callies, and Five Characters in Search of an Exit starring Jason Alexander. Tired of trying to beat the stock market? A USA Today article stated some of the sharpest minds on Wall Street are betting you'll make more money in metals than Microsoft. Gold and other precious metals have given investors a 4 to 1 return over stocks in the last few years. And some experts predict gold could more than double or triple in price from today's value. Blanchard & Company, America's largest retail dealer in gold and precious metals, wants to help you start protecting your savings and growing your wealth with American Buffalo 24 Karat Gold gold bullion coins at an incredible price. They want you to experience how easy and profitable precious metals investing can be. In fact, Blanchard and Company will buy back your gold at any time you want to sell. Call 800-640-7083 to purchase American Buffalo 24 karat gold bullion coins. 800-640-7083. Don't miss out on this investment opportunity for American Buffalo 24 karat gold bullion coins. Call 800-640-7083. Who said the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax? It was Albert Einstein. Now, if he had a hard time figuring it out, what about the rest of us mere mortals? Many of us can and do find ourselves in a jam with the IRS. Luckily for you, there's Taxmasters. The former IRS agents and tax professionals at Taxmasters will solve your IRS problems. Do you owe back taxes? Being audited? Have several years of unfiled returns? Has an IRS agent visited your home or your place of business? Write this number down. one 800 5810452 again 1-800-581-0452 the former IRS agents and tax professionals at Taxmasters are waiting for your call to help solve your IRS problems right now so call or go to txmstr.com for more info you do not want to represent yourself with the IRS Taxmasters has helped many good people just like you the IRS has stepped up its collection efforts so now more than ever you need to call Taxmasters call Taxmasters right now at 1-800-581-0452 Taxmasters will solve your IRS problems. If you have a news tip, call the KQV Newsroom at 412-562-5960, 412-562-5960, or email us through our website at kqv.com. Now, Act 3 of Mute on the Twilight Zone. What is it? I'd like to talk to you before. Cora, if it's about the girl going to school... Harry, please. We waited long enough. Those people aren't going to answer. No, Harry. What do you mean, no? Why shouldn't she? I, I don't know. It, it, it's just that... She starts tomorrow. She'll be so frightened. All right, she'll be frightened. A day, maybe two days, but she'll get over it. She'll start to learn. She isn't ignorant. I, sp I swear she understands me sometimes without talking. Elsa? Come here. Come, dear. Hold my hand. Ah, there she is. She's very shy, Miss Frank. She'll need understanding. And she shall receive it. Come here, Elsa. Go on. Shake her hand. Her name is Miss Frank. I won't. I know what she's thinking. I can hear her mind. I said, come here, child. Don't touch me. Go on. There. See? I don't bite. I think we're going to get along just fine, you and I. Not her. Not her. <sighs> don't be worried, sweetheart. They're only children, like yourself. Wait for me and I'll come get you after school.
Here we are. It's the first classroom. Ready? It won't be so bad. You'll see. Miss Frank? Good morning, Mrs. Wheeler. We were just about to start. I do hope everything will be all right. Ilsa's very shy. She'll feel right at home in no time. Shouldn't I stay with her a little while? As long as you're here, she can't begin to adjust. Believe me, it's the only way. Yes, well, goodbye, dear. Don't leave me. We'll take good care of her. Remember, I'll meet you after school. Now, let's introduce you to everyone. Class, this is Ilsa Nielsen. We're going to have to be very patient with her because her parents never taught her how to speak. Not one word of English. We'll help her to learn, though. We'll work with her until she's just like everyone else. Now, Ilsa, can you say your name? Ilsa Nielsen. Try to say it, child. Your name, Ilsa. Ilsa. Try to say it, child. Ilsa. Take your hand off my arm. You're hurting me. Try to say it. A little later, then. We have plenty of time. You'll learn. I promise you. You'll learn. Open your books, class. Richard, will you read from the top of page 17, please? This is a boat. A boat sails on the ocean. Ocean? He's trying to tell about the boat in the picture. But the boat isn't words. It isn't. Why don't they learn the way Father taught me? Ilsa, look at this picture. See how it moves. Hear it on the water. Ilsa, you must pay attention. Get up. I said get up. Now, we'll try again. Say your name, Ilsa. Your name. Do you understand? Your name is Ilsa. Ilsa. Stop poking me. Tell her what her name is, class. On the count of three. One, two, three. Ilsa. 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 That's all for today, children. Don't forget your homework. Wait. Ilsa, I want to talk to you. I want you to know that you're not fooling me. I know exactly what you are. I know because my father tried to make me into the same thing when I was your age. But I was able to overcome the sickness he forced on me. As I'm going to help you overcome it, Ilsa. They were trying to make you into a medium. To distort your innocent mind so that you could communicate with the dead. What is she saying? You've been trained to be a medium. No! Haven't you? It isn't true. Not what they were training me for. Oh, you understand me. You, you know, know what I'm thinking. That proves it. Don't you see? You've just proven it to me. You are a medium. No, you're wrong. Ilsa? There you are. Mrs. Wheeler. Was it very bad, Ilsa? Not at all. She's coming along nicely. Oh, I'm so glad. We'll see her in the morning then. Yes. Uh, goodbye, Miss Frank. Goodbye. For now. See you tomorrow, Ilsa. And the next day. 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 Ask someone, Werner. Uh, please, where might we find uh, authority? 
Authority? Constable? The sheriff? Yeah, yeah, the sheriff. Down one block on the other side. Can't miss it. Thank you. I feel so guilty, Carl. What could we do? We simply could not get away sooner. We have our own responsibility to the project. I know, but almost six months since we last heard from Holger and Fanny. You still think something has happened? Why else would they fail to write? I hope you are wrong, that lovely child. Oh, such a talent. The progress of her has been phenomenal. It is as if she was born telepathic. I think that of all the children, she has the most potential. Hello? It's me, Cora. Yes, dear, what is it? The ones from Germany are here. Did you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm gonna bring them to the house. Uh, we'll be over in a little while. <sighs> All right. No. No. If only we heard from you, but there was never a word. Under the circumstances, you can understand why we felt at liberty to start adoption proceedings. We understand completely, Sheriff. As I said, we received no letters. I just don't understand it. Well, here we are. This is uh, Professor and Mrs. Werner, my wife. How do you do? Mrs. Mrs. Vila. Vila. Cora, they say they never received those letters. Oh, that's odd. Why don't you sit down? Thank you. She burns those letters, Maria. Yes, I know. How terribly she suffers. You came a long way, Mrs. Werner. Yes. We did. Are we going to tell them? Not unless we have to. Maybe see Ilsa. I'll be going to get her out of school in a little while. School? God in heaven, school. Ilsa Nielsen, stand. Come forward. Face the class. What is your name? Class, we will do again what we've been doing for the past few weeks. Think of Ilsa's name. Don't say it aloud. Just think it. Ready now? One, two, three. Ilsa! 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 Here they are. Ilsa, this is Professor and Mrs. Werner. Ilsa, you remember us? Our children are the ones who are just like you, in Germany. You remember the Elkenbergs, the Calders, us, your father and your mother? Heidelberg, ten years ago. The telepathy project. The Warners, the Warners are from Germany, Elsa. They were friends of your parents. Think, there is your mind, Elsa. Your mind. Hear me, Elsa. My name is Ilsa. 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 Ilsa, don't. My name is Ilsa. My name is Ilsa. Shh, shh, Ilsa. Don't cry. What with you? What with you? You can't take her from me. You can't. Cora. No. I won't let them. I love her, and she loves me. She needs me. You have no right. No right. Look, 
I apologize for both my wife and myself. Well, we thought... We understand. Naturally, you would think that we had come to take Ilse back with us, but as I've said, we have no legal power to demand her, being no relation. Auf Wiedersehen, Sheriff. Goodbye. Your bus should be here in about five, ten minutes. Good luck. And thanks again. I hope we did not make a mistake letting them keep her here. Even though we do have the legal right to take her... I don't think so, Carl. To take her to the other children now. The talent is gone. <sighs> I suppose. All those years Holga and Fanny spent on her, wasted. Wasted, Carl? If they had not made her mind so receptive, how could they have directed her out of the burning house, even though they themselves were trapped? Ah, oh, but the loss, it isn't right. There is no right or wrong in it, Carl. They all meant well. No one wanted to do anything but help her. But to lose everything? She has not lost everything. Why do you think I ask for you to let her stay here? Because she has gained something. We always knew that Holger and Fanny did not really care for her. Maria! Oh, they were not unkind. But the project always came first. You know that, Carl. To them, Elsa was less a daughter than an experiment in flesh. She is going to be all right. Now she is loved. And that is so much more important than telepathy. Isn't it, my professor? Ja, Liebchen. Much more important. This has been the story of a girl named Ilsa Nielsen, soon to be Ilsa Wheeler, who lives in the town of German Corners, Pennsylvania. She discovered that in the world of nightmares, those which threaten physically are of little consequence when compared to those of the mind. And Ilse's mind is now possessed by the most valuable talent of all, the capacity to love. From now on, the consuming flames that haunted her dreams will be confined exclusively to the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension, a digital dimension not only of sound but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land of listening and imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone radio dramas on twilightzoneradio.com. The Twilight Zone radio dramas capture the original scripts of the groundbreaking TV show, and they've been updated with new cast and a new sound. You can hear them on your computer or transfer the programs to select MP3 players, the Apple iPod, or burn the programs to CDs, twilightzoneradio.com. Log on to our new and improved official Twilight Zone Radio Dramas website at twilightzoneradio.com where you can download three free Twilight Zone Radio Dramas. Long Distance Call starring Hal Sparks, Ring-A-Ding Girl starring Sarah Wayne Callies, and Five Characters in Search of an Exit starring Jason Alexander. Log on to KQV.com and talk to your news station. We want your comments and suggestions. KQV.com for the daily opinion poll. KQV.com for the news you need. KQV.com. Log on. Listen and learn. Remember, KQV.com. Mute, starring Wade Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Amanda Amari, Deb Dotzer, Linda Ryder, Craig Brawley, Valerie Glowinski, Jamie Barron, Richard Shavzen, and C.J. Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group.
You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. here. Looks like a good place. For what? Information. They won't know anything. Maybe they will. Hey, Steve's right. Look at all the trucks parked out front. I say we wait till we come to a town. The last sign said 35 miles. Let's go in. This is nowheresville. That's what we want, Freddy. Isn't it? We need to fit in, disappear. If we draw attention... I checked the map. It's mostly small towns. You think they won't notice us? They'll know we're not from... I said, let's go. Hiya, boys. Sit anywhere you like. Got some seats at the counter. Thanks. Three cold ones? Sure. Fine by me. How's your water? That all you want, blue eyes? I just wondered how your water supply is. Uh, pure as can be, down the mountain and over the dam. One double shot of H2O coming up, and, uh, yeah, two long necks. I'll uh, make it three. That's more like it, honey. Any, uh, towns around here? You bet. Stay on the highway and you'll hit Fairview. Lots of bikers stop at the motel just inside the city limits. Fairview. Nice place, is it? Oh, it's okay. Kind of quiet. Shops, schools, you know, not much to do. Sounds just right. Yeah? You boys looking to settle down? We might. No kidding. Well, what do you know? Saw your choppers out there. Figured you were just passing through. Hey, they have, uh, they have houses to rent in Fairview? He means pads, cribs. Some place to crash. Well, I couldn't say, but you could ask. Where? There's an office on Main, R.C. Jones Real Estate. Uh, park your choppers down the street, though. Don't want to give them a heart attack. We'll remember that. Here's from a bill for Annie. Sure thing. Coffee, burger, and a Coke. How you keep the change? Your tip. Why, thank you kindly, George. You come back and see me on your next run now. You know it, doll. You boys need menus. I got a burger basket special with fries. No, thanks. Sure? Strong young fellas like you. We don't eat. He means we already ate. What? That's it. We scarfed. This morning, we really chowed down. You, uh, you dig? Oh, I dig you loud and clear, Daddy-O. Say, where are you from, anyway? Not around here. Come on, let's go. Right. You got it, Steve. I mean, Big Daddy. Hey, you didn't touch your beers. That's okay. We're not thirsty. Here you are. Hold on. Something wrong? This ain't all for me. Isn't it enough? It's too much. Here, let me give you some change. Keep it. Yeah, for your tip. Is that cool? Well, now that's mighty generous. <laughs> you boys come back and see me now, anytime. Two specials, friend. Table four. Sure. Oh, those boys stiff you? No, Harry, that's just it. They gave me $23.17 and, and for three beers. Mm, maybe they're from another country. Well, maybe so, Harry. But wherever it is, it must be a long, long way from here. Three strangers on motorcycles dressed in black. We call them Steve and Scott and Fred, though their names aren't important. 
They look a bit dangerous, but in truth, they're just passing through, at least for now. They're on their way to a small town with tree-lined streets and white picket fences. A quiet town in the Midwest. You take a look in the eyes of these young men, and you'll see something deeply mysterious. Because they are most definitely not from around here. The truth is, they have arrived to lead us all into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Black Leather Jackets, starring Marshall Allman with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, this must be the place. A man to drive. That's what Jones said. The old Anderson's house. Knock on the door and tell him we're here. I'll open the truck. Don't look like anyone lives here. The for rent sign's still up. That's because they're just moving in. Probably going to meet us. What if they don't show? Well, we wait an hour, put it in storage, cost them extra. Go on, knock. Okay. Nobody here. Give it another try. Locked up tight as a drum. Well, well, looky here. A couple of creeps messing around our property. You the guys that live here? We ain't the fuzz, that's for sure. Got your stuff in the back. Open the door and we'll move it in. Hey, careful with the big cases. They're fragile. Whatever you say, pal. Somebody got the key to the house. Watch your feet, bozo. You're walking all over my grass. I might want to smoke it later. <laughs> Get it? Grass? Smoke? I still need the key. Well, we don't. Yeah, we don't need no stinking keys. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty? Yeah, I'll take care of it. Done. Hey, how'd you do that? He didn't even touch the doorknob. He just stared at it. Quit, John, and start humping boxes. But it was locked. I tried it myself. Ain't you got any furniture? Chairs, rugs, stuff like that? I said move. Now. Yeah, move it. Okay, Mac. Yeah, creep. Make like a leaf and shake it. <laughs> Come on, boys. We got work to do. Martha? Yes, dear? Here's that movie you wanted to see. Be right there. What in the... Something wrong with the TV? I don't know. Do you have it on the right channel? It's not the set. All the lights went dim for a second. Did they? I thought it was just the kitchen. It was the whole house. Anything still running in there? The dishwasher? No, the dishes are all put away. There it goes again. Maybe it's the antenna wire. I doubt it. It slipped loose once before. Well, that's easy enough to check. What do you see? It looks all right to me. Then what do you suppose? Martha, come over here. See something? The roof next door. There, against the moon. What is that? Looks like some kind of electrical device. Well, that wasn't there this morning, was it? No, the Andersons didn't leave anything. Must be something those men put up. Right, the three who moved in. Wouldn't that be just our luck? What? Not only are they motorcycle riding hoods, they're ham radio operators. Is that bad? You don't know what it does to TV reception. I have a good mind to go over there. Honey, please. Daddy? What is it, Ellen? I'm not sure. I had my radio on while I was studying, and all of a sudden, it began picking up these weird voices. What did I tell you? Ham operators. What's that? We can go without television for one night. Tomorrow, we'll find out what's to be done about it. First thing I'm going to do is see if they have a license. For what? Do you think you ought to? Those young men look so... unfriendly. You mean the ones who moved in next door? Does anybody know their names? No, but I'll find out. 
I think two of them are brothers. Odd types to have in this neighborhood. They don't really fit in somehow. The other one has blue eyes. How do you know? Uh, they were unloading the truck when I came home from school. Lots of boxes. Electrical equipment, probably. And these long silver metal things like... like giant tanks or capsules or something. You stay away from them, young lady. You make it sound like an order. It is. But you don't even know them. Your father's just concerned for your safety, dear. Go upstairs and finish your homework. <sighs> I'm not going to wait till morning. I'm going over there right now. Stu. Hello? Anybody here? Yeah, what's it to you? Hello there. I'm Stu Tillman from next door. No kidding. Been having a little trouble with my electricity flickering off and on. You boys wouldn't be ham radio operators by any chance, would you? <laughs> what's so funny? Big Daddy here wants to know what's so funny. Yeah, ain't that a crack up? Who are you boys anyway? We're monsters, Daddy-o. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Yeah, we got a lease on the place. That okay with you? Where did you come from? From outer space. Woo! <laughs> Take us to your leader. <laughs> all, right, all right, now listen. I don't have to stand here and listen. Hey, watch your step, Daddy-o. It's pretty dark in here. Hey. Yeah, you might trip and fall. Hey, yeah, you might trip and fall What and are you your doing? Head. What are you doing? Hey, you better keep it cool, mister. Or he'll disintegrate you with this ray gun. Take your hands off of me. <laughs> ah, look at him go. Stop it. <laughs> hey, 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 this cat can really dance. A real cool <laughs> hey. cat. Yeah, move it. I said let go of me. Go, daddy, go. Ah, uh, not to worry. Spaceman won't hurt Earth creature. Ooh, Earth creature. Crazy man. You crazy. All right. I'm calling the police. Then I'm calling my lawyer. No, you're not. That would be uncool. Definitely. Just you watch. You're some kind of hoodlums. Cool it. The police probably have warrants for your arrest. They'll be very interested to know where you are. I told you to cool it. Stay away from me. Look in my eyes. You're going to be plenty sorry for this. Just, just wait till I... Forget it. What? Forget everything. There. Feel better now? Yes. Better. Stu? Stu, I was worried. Did something happen? Martha? What happened over there? Nothing. Nothing at all. Those men next door, did they do something to you? No. But you were going to talk to them about the television interference. Oh, that. Well, did you find out anything? It's not them. They're nice boys. Three very nice boys. Definitely. Morning, Mom. Gotta go. Oh, no. Not till you have your breakfast. But I'll miss the bus. Then you'll just have to walk. The exercise will do you good. I can't walk in these shoes. Here, I'm eating my toast. See? And your juice. Where's Dad? He decided to sleep in. I think he's coming down with something. Well, kiss him for me. Bye. Not so fast, young lady. I've got some scrambled eggs here. <sighs> that girl... Darn you, anyway. Hey, Trouble? You see that bus? Yes. I mean, yeah. I checked it out. What gives? 
Drove off right in front of me. It's a game with them. They just love to make people suffer. Why would they do that? Beats me. Definitely. Uh, uncool. Just thank your lucky stars you don't have to depend on buses to get around. Stars are lucky? It's just an expression. <laughs> I, I understand a great deal about constellations. That is, the nature of galactic structure. But as to... Huh? I mean, I dig stars the most. They're really cool. So, they're lucky? That's a gas. So are you. <laughs> what do you mean? W one minute you talk like a professor, and the next minute you sound like a... What did they call them? Beatnik or something. Uh, thanks. You're a real cool chick. <laughs> There you go again. <laughs> well, why do you try to talk that way? Sounds like you've been watching too many old movies. I have? I mean, I have. Before I came here, I made a study of popular culture. Music, motion pictures, satellite television. <laughs> You're a trip, you know that? Trip? Meaning to travel to another destination. Yeah, I believe I understand. You need a ride? Well, you aren't going past the school by any chance, are you? Uh, I could. With me on the back of your motorcycle? Uh, why not? It can carry two passengers. That would definitely be cool. Well, there's a first time for everything. <laughs> Come on, little lady. Hold tight. Uh, tightly, I mean. Uh, up tight. Out of sight. Here we go. Just look at that. What is it? She's on the back of his motorcycle, our daughter. Come away from the window. I told her to keep away from them. She missed her bus and he offered her a ride, Stu. I'm sure that's all there is to it. I could have given her a ride. But you're not a handsome young man in a leather jacket, dear. Here! What? You can stop here. I don't see any school. It's on the other side of the park. Then why are we you stopping? You got me here so early I thought I'd walk. The park's so pretty in the morning. How much time do you have? Mm, my watch says 8.30. Class isn't until 9. Oh. <laughs> Would you like to take a walk? Uh... Sure. That bench over there is my special place. We could sit for a while if you want. <clears throat> okay. It's nice here, isn't it? I guess. I sit here sometimes and think. Try to figure things out. Like what? Oh, I don't know. For one thing, did you know you've lived next door to me for over a month and you've never even said hello? <laughs> hello. <laughs> My name's Ellen, by the way. I'm Scott. Hi, Scott. So, where are you from? Why do you ask? I just mean, where did you live before? Yeah. It's hard to describe. A long way from here. What city? I doubt that you've ever heard of it. Could be. Geography is one of my worst subjects. <laughs> Did you graduate already? Graduate? Have you finished school? Yes. Ten years ago. Ten years? You're not that old. I'm, I'm older than you think. My people don't show their age. My family's the same way. My grandmother lived to be 90, and you'd have taken her for 60 right up to the day she died. That's beautiful. It is, isn't it? She was such a sweet, happy person. Uh, not that. I mean... 
your hair. My hair? The way the, the sun's shining through it. I've never seen anything so beautiful. Now you're putting me on. Uh, uh <laughs> putting on? Teasing me? Don't you know that? What old movies have you been watching? I don't know. I like The Wild One. It's our favorite. Never heard of that one. May I touch it? Your hair. It's like gold. Thank you. I'd better be getting to school. Uh, already? It's getting late. No, it's not. How do you know? Look at your watch. You're right. It says it's still 8.30. How can that be? Has it stopped? No. See? Time is relative. It can slow down or even stand still. It can? Hey, uh, take the long way. So we can talk some more. All right. Tell me more about yourself. <laughs> okay. But only if you walk on this side of me. Why? Uh, so I could see the sun shining through your hair. It's time. I know that. Where is he? He got delayed. He'll be here. I'm not interested in excuses. Neither is the controller. We could try to pick up his image with the eye. Don't try. Do it. There he is, on the screen. Looks like he's walking in a park with a human female. Has he no sense of time? What do we do? Proceed without him. We can't. The controller told us. It's my responsibility. I'll make the decision. Sir. Reporting in, sir. Be at ease. Where's your brother? We can no longer trust him. What has he done? He's formed an attachment for one of the beings here. What sort of attachment? I'm not sure yet. A kind of alliance. He's with a young human in spite of our orders. Continue without him. I'm sure he's on his way now. I said continue. We have been in touch with all units. Good. The second wave has landed successfully and are now concealed as planned. With the arrival of the third wave, we will be in key positions throughout the continent. Excellent. The locals, are they suspicious? Not a bit, sir. They're a stupid race, exactly as our research told us. An inferior breed given to hatred, cruelty, making war, and killing one another because of greed. The universe can well do without them. You will receive your instructions for the final move in a few Earth days. Very well, sir. I'll tell brother as soon as he gets here. No time for that. We have to bring him in now. Ellen? Hmm? Are you warm enough? Yes. It's a beautiful night. You can pull the blanket over your legs if you like. I'm fine, really. Just lying here, looking at the stars. The constellations are very strange here. Not as I was taught them. Scott, can I ask you a question? Sure. You won't get mad? <laughs> I couldn't get mad at you. Well, where did you come from, really? Does it matter? I suppose it doesn't, but you're so... Different from anybody I've ever known. Is that bad? No, not really. Tell me the truth. You're an exchange student, aren't you? At the college, from some place you'd rather not talk about. Only in a manner of speaking. Ellen, you... like me, don't you? You know that. Very much. Very much. 
Except when you do your Marlon Brando impersonation. <laughs> Will you want the roses or something? <laughs> God, come on. I thought I did a pretty good job. We studied your motion pictures. That's just it. You must have looked at nothing but old movies. People don't talk like that anymore. Well, what about the clothing? Oh, don't go changing that. Your leather jacket is way cool. At least we got something right, huh? You got a lot right. Trust me. Alan, do you know the word love? Of course, silly. Everybody does. What an odd question. What's odd about it? I mean, bringing it up at a time like this. Why would you? No reason. Oh. It's, it's just the word that's all over your newspapers, and your magazines, your music, your television. We encountered it all the time. We? Who is we? That's not important. Uh, this is a planet filled with hate, Ellen. Hate, violence, mistrust, bigotry. I don't, I don't know how someone like you survived this long. Me? I'm no different from most people. I haven't seen a report on anyone like you. A report? Scott, you talk in riddles. Sometimes you make me feel like an insect under a microscope. I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to. Please, I'd, I'd like to go home. Why? You've been lying to me. You're wrong. Don't make it any worse. I don't know why or what it is you're trying to hide, but I know you're not what you seem. And what if I'm not? Do you think you're in any position to judge me? Any of you? I said I want to go home. I'm truly sorry, Ellen. You can believe that or not. I... I... I guess I expected too much. Where have you been? I told you, I was riding around. Every day for the last five or six days? Yesterday when I sent you to the ship for food? Or last night when you were supposed to be on guard? You think I don't know? I've had the eye on you every minute. Well, if you know, then why are you asking me? I told them before we came you were too young. You'd lose your head, run into situations you couldn't handle. There's too much at stake. I, I've done no harm. Haven't told her a thing yet, huh? No. Well, now you won't have the chance. We're too close to finishing this mission. Yeah, well, you better go to the control room. Your master's calling. You're a master, too, and don't forget it. From here on out, you're just along for the ride. You're not a good enough risk. The controller. I heard. <laughs> Bacteria Unit 59 reporting in. The test has been an unqualified success. Good. Unit 70 through 100 have reported the same result. What is your time estimate? 30 minutes to the reservoir. Approximately 24 hours for the bacteria to multiply to saturation. How soon before you see results? Within 30 hours, we should witness 50% fatalities. I estimate a total of 48 hours before total extermination. Have you coordinated with other units in your area? We have. And the result? There are 29 bacteria units near the water supplies in this state. We should reach complete contamination of the population within two days. Very well. Begin Operation Invasion Phase 2 at once. Yes, sir. At once. Oh. The time has come. Ah, brother. You've decided to do your duty. It's not what I was told would happen. Of course it is. Not this way. A portion of the population was to be saved. For study, if nothing else. The controller's word is final. Yeah, well not if I can help it. Where are you going? 
We've got to stop him. Doesn't matter now. He's too late to stop it. Who's down there? Come down. Now? I've got to talk to you. It's late. This is important. All right. Brother! You're there in the bushes! I can see you! Go back to the house and wait, Scott. You're making a mistake. These people aren't worth it. Scott, what's going on? Ellen, you've got to get away from here. What is it? You're in danger. I don't understand. Something terrible is going to happen here. Many people are going to die. I want you to go away as far as possible. I can take you where you'll be safe. You're frightening me, Scott. Please. What do you mean? What's going to happen? I can't... I can't tell you that. And... And it, it wouldn't matter if I did. Look, we've got to leave right now. Are you trying to scare me into running away with you? Uh, Ellen, listen to me. In 24 hours, every man, woman, child, cat, dog, anything else alive is going to be dead. Don't. Don't, please. No, not just in this town. All over your country. All over your world. My world? It's your world, too? No, it's not. What do you mean? Scott, who are you? Look up. Look up. We came from out there, Ellen. From beyond those stars. There, there, there are thousands of us here on Earth right now. Our people, we, we need room. We're, we're, and we're going to set up colonies here? I don't believe We've you. We've had bacteria units in every country on this planet for months. They have enough to poison the drinking water of the entire world's population. Scott, I'm going to walk with you over to your house. No, it's too late. Even if it is, I think we'd better wake your friends and let them get you to a doctor. No, you don't understand. You haven't seen, okay? The leader, the... The controller speaks to us from a giant television screen. All we ever see is his head. A, a metallic mask with slits for eyes, a nose, a mouth, but no lips. And his voice, that's... that's uh, Scott, I love you, but you're not well. You're... Oh, Scott. Ellen! 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 All right, Ellen, what's this all about? Oh, Daddy, I don't know what to do. You can start by telling me what went on out there. He woke me, throwing stones at my window. He said he had to see me. Daddy, I think he's lost his mind. He's never been this way before tonight. He was almost raving. Exactly what did he say? Crazy things. Th that he's some kind of spaceman, and they're taking over the Earth, and we're all going to die. <sighs> Poor boy. We'd better get him help. Ellen? Why aren't you in bed? Stu? Hold it. I'll explain everything. Sheriff Station? Deputy Harper? Let me speak to the sheriff, please. Uh, um, Sheriff Farley's on vacation. Sir, can I help you? My name is Stuart Tillman. I live at 11575 Amanda Drive. Yes, Mr. Tillman. There's a mentally disturbed boy living next door. Is that right? And before he does any harm to himself or anyone else, I think he ought to be picked up. Honey, what's happened? Oh, Mother. There, there, now. What makes you think he's uh, mentally disturbed? He's been scaring my daughter with some kind of Man from Mars story. Claims he's part of an invasion force that's going to take over the world or some such nonsense. All right, Mr. Tillman, uh, let you stay right where you are. I will take it from here. In fact, I know exactly what to do. Definitely. Hey, Red? Yeah? Yeah, we got uh, control on Amanda Drive? Sure do. We'll be right there, Mr. Tillman. Thank you. Are the police coming? Yes, in a few minutes. That's good. Now, will somebody please tell me what's wrong? Sure, in a minute. Only... Only what? I wonder what he meant by control. Yes, 
Please, sir. This I, is I, an unauthorized I, transmission. No, sir, sir, I beg you to listen to me. You may speak. What we're doing is wrong. You question my judgment? No, we should save these creatures, not exterminate them. It's it's true. They 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 murder and hurt one another and are subject to unreasonable hate and prejudice. But the murderers, the cruel ones, uh, are are the brutes found in any race. Th these people have capacity for love. I know it. Our research disproves that. They are a world of angry, frightened people. No, no, I tell you. I have lived among them. They learn love from their God, and they teach it to their children. There is more of love than hate here. There's no need to kill them. It's too late. Not if you order the plan to stop. For you, a defector, a traitor to your own kind. No, no, I'm not, I'm not. You are a traitor. This transmission is ended. Here they are now. Are you sure this is necessary? Yes. Please, Daddy, tell them not to hurt him. Ah, Mr. Tillman? How are you? I'm uh, Deputy Sheriff Harper. This is Deputy Miller. Evening, sir. Come in, please. Now, uh, what about this neighbor boy? Tell him, Ellen. I... I, I don't know where to start. All right, you know, your, uh, your father said he was mentally ill. What made you think that? Ellen! Ellen, please listen to me. There's no more time. Scott, I'm sorry. I didn't know what else to do. No, 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 no. Come on in, son. Uh, just tell me all about it. Don't listen to him. He's one of us. He's part of the advanced unit. No, come on. Calm down. What kind of unit was that? No. Get out, Ellen. Run as fast as you can. It's too late for me. It's coming. It's almost here. Oh, Scott, you're only making it worse. Who are they? What have you done? And they told me you were ill, son, so I, I took the necessary precautions. These men are from the hospital. Now, now just stand right there. Stay away from me! Uh, we're gonna put this around you so you don't hurt yourself. Don't touch me! No, not a straight jacket. It's for his own good. Uh, got him! Got him! Uh, get us one of the jacket off first. Get, get, get Easy get now, get boy. Get no! Oh, don't fight it, son. <laughs> That'll only make it more difficult. No, 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 no! You don't understand. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Listen to me, please, please. No, no, please, no. No, no. You'll see that he gets help. Don't worry, folks. We'll take good care of him. And someday, I'm sure he'll thank you. You have a good evening now. Oh, they left his leather jacket. Can I keep it for him until he gets out? I don't see why not, honey. It might be a while, though. Oh, Mom. What am I going to do? There's nothing you can do, sweetheart. Except pray. It's for the best. You'll see. Now, come and sit down. I'll get you a glass of water. Portrait of an American family on the eve of an invasion from outer space. Of course, we know it's only fiction. And yet, you might think twice when you drink your next glass of water. Be sure it's 100% pure and, and not imported directly from the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. 
Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Black Leather Jackets, starring Marshall Allman with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Earl Hamner, Jr., Heard in the cast were Elizabeth Lido, Jason Bradley, Christian Stolte, Doug James, Fernette Lebo, Jeff Lupatin, Roger Mueller, Meg Falcon, Vince Amari, Alex Sopener, Carl Amari, Kurt Nabig, and Jason Mallow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. They get it? Way off. What are they doing? Lobbing them in by hand? One more time. Baker Company. Baker Company. You missed the target. That's what I'm telling you. Well, try it again. Short. 500 yards. Sergeant Casarano says it was 500 yards short. That's right. Still. Tell him to raise it up. Sergeant says to elevate it. They say they can't elevate it anymore. What are they using? A slingshot? Listen. If you can't aim higher... Give me that. How do you expect it? This is Baker Company F.O. Good going, boys. Yeah, I've seen what you did. A big, fat nothing. You wrecked five acres of rice paddies and you torn up a beautiful grove of palm trees, but that's it. What's it to me? Let me tell you. We're sitting out here on our duffs on a hill in the middle of nowhere, and you know what we're doing? We're having a little discussion. Yeah, that's right. Maybe you can help us out. We're trying to decide whether you got something in your religion against sending a shell into a cave. Or is it too hard for you? Because if it is... <laughs> you tell him, Sarge. Oh, those jokers. What? Say again. Bypass? Oh, now that's more like it. Because all you accomplished today is to tear up five acres of real estate and keep a handful of Japanese soldiers from falling asleep. Yeah. Well, I got a question for you. Anybody know how long it takes an enemy to die from insomnia? Same to you. Oh, we'll keep in contact, all right. You sure they're on our side? Makes me wonder sometimes. Give me a light. Here you go, sir. So what's the word? Did I hear you say bypass? They're gonna keep firing till late this afternoon. At least that's what they say. 
Then if they can't smoke them out, we'll just have to bypass it and move on. That's what I like to hear. Amen. I'm feeling better already. Me too. I'm getting cross-eyed looking through these binoculars. When they say flanks, I say thanks. I don't know about the rest of you, but I got no big urge to run headfirst into anything anymore. Not at this stage of the game. That's for sure. Oh, still there. Nothing but a hole in the side of a mountain looking right back at us. They, they can see us, but we can't see what's in the cave. And we're supposed to take that thing? Buddy boy, when two air strikes and a whole afternoon of lobbing shells don't accomplish anything, well, that means you better say your prayers and start counting your cartridges. But, Sarge, I, I thought you said... Th Put it this way. I got what you call a nodding acquaintance with the bottom of this barrel. And when they can't budge an enemy with the big stuff, that's when they call out the queen of battle, the ever-loving infantry. Ain't we the lucky ones. What do you figure we got left, Sarge? Before it's over, I mean. Month? Doesn't matter what I think. Maybe less, huh? Don't ask me. We got them ringed in all over the place. The poop is, they're as good as finished, even in Okinawa. Then why are we still fighting? That's the trouble with these little crumbs. They just don't know when they're licked. Maybe they ain't human. Or maybe they just don't get it. Think about it. There they are, holed up in a miserable cave, half starved, half beat to death. And nobody bothered to tell them it's the bottom of the night. They already lost most of their ball club, but they keep on fighting. Why? Yeah. Why? It's August 1945. The last grimy pages of a dirty, torn book of war. The place is the Philippine Islands. The men you've just met are what's left of a platoon of American infantry. Their dulled and tired eyes, set deep in dulled and tired faces, can now look forward to a miracle, the moment when the nightmare comes to an end. Or so it appears. For they've got one more battle to fight, a crazy, illogical standoff in the final days of a particular hell known as World War II. And in a moment, we'll observe that battle firsthand. August 1945, the Philippines. But in reality, it's high noon in a place called the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A Quality of Mercy, starring Robert Nepper with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There we go again. Hit anything this time, Sarge? I tell you what, I'm not even going to bother to look. You check it out for me, all right, Anacek? Feet sitting here. Where's the field glasses? Be my guest. Well, well. What do you know? You see something down there? Sure. I see a white flag. Yep. Now they're coming out of the cave. And guess what, boys? They got something for us. Uh, looks like... Uh... Oh, wait a minute. There's a pretty little geisha girl leading the pack. And she's carrying a tray full of rice. And a hot towel. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> gotcha. Hey, hey, hold on. There is something coming. Who is it? Don't know. Uh-oh. I think I see a gold bar on his helmet. Give me those glasses. Oh, man. Just what we need. A brand new Louis. All spit and polish. Ain't he handsome, though? All right, men. Try at least to look like Army. What for? He won't last long. Oh. 
Well, looky what we got here. That uniform's so new, it ain't never been washed. Brand new holster, too. Well, that's what I call a pistol. No kidding. Pearl handle and all. Sent us a real tiger this time. Five bucks says it's never been fired. Which of you is Sergeant Casarano? <clears throat> that would be me. I'm Lieutenant Cattell. Sir. I'm taking over your platoon. Matter of fact. What's your situation here? We're observing for a mortar company, Lieutenant. So I've been told. That cave down there? A bunch of the enemies holed up. Been trying to get them out for two days. No luck? Nothing doing. Your binoculars, please, Sergeant. Here you go. Hmm. Tough situation. I guess you know what that means. Sir? We have some mopping up to do. We? Yeah, you heard me. I'd say we do best to go at it frontally. Frontally? Yeah, just move right in and wipe them out. Hey, Lieutenant. You sure you got the right platoon? What about it, Sergeant? Well, now, uh... Call the rest of the company together. The rest of the company? On the double. Where are they? Back of the CP. This is it? All six of us. In that case, we'll have to go it alone. Say again? Something wrong with your ears? Go it alone? With a half dozen men? No, I'm begging the lieutenant's pardon. You've just inherited a good group, but, but not that good. This is infantry, sir, not kamikaze. He doesn't have the wrong platoon. He's got the wrong army. Your name is what? Uh, Watkins, Lieutenant. Andrew J. Are you accustomed to talking to an officer on your back? Matter of fact, sir, I'm not accustomed to talking to an officer in any way. And why is that, soldier? We've lost our last three platoon, Louis, and I guess you could say there's been a space of time in between. Well, you've got another one assigned now, and you're going to have to learn to live with that. Starting with this reminder. When you address an officer, I want to see you stand up on your feet like a man. We've been on the line 33 days, Lieutenant. Your point is? Not much sleep. You know what that's like? You have my sympathy, Sergeant. But my job is to lead this platoon, and I plan to do exactly that. My way. Then maybe you'd better tell us. Just what is your way? When I tell you boys to jump, you'll jump. When I tell you to stand up on your feet, you'll do so. And if I tell you to head toward that cave, guns port and bayonets fixed, that's exactly what you're going to do. Double time. Any more questions? Begging the lieutenant's pardon. Any more questions? No, sir. Good. What are your orders, lieutenant? Since we don't have a clear line of sight into the cave, and since there's no cover between here and there, we don't have a choice. We'll have to move down into the open, and just go ahead and take it. Full frontal. What about it, Sergeant? You want my opinion? I'm willing to discuss it. In terms of military strategy. In military terms, Lieutenant, it goes like this. First off, you better muddy up that gold bar on your helmet so it doesn't shine too bright. Otherwise, you got yourself a target they can shoot at right in the middle of your head. Then you better take off the one on your collar and stick it in your pocket. I'm asking you for a chronology... And I'm giving it to you. The enemy happens to be half-starved and half on its knees, but they're not dumb. They're tough, shrewd, and they got eyes. We lost three platoon officers already because they made a motion of command with one of their hands. That's what the Japs look for, a person in command. I'd intended to remove the insignia. But what about the cave? What do you know about it? Not much. We saw some of them run in, holding each other up. They're in bad shape. No telling how many were already in there. But they got a machine gun, and somebody's pretty good with it. But not good enough to stop a full-on attack. Well, maybe we'll have to do that, eventually. But as far as I'm concerned, the war don't have to end by dinner time. I'm aware of that, Sergeant. I say we sit on it for the rest of the day, and see what some 105s can do, before we make a final plan. You might be right, for someone who's used to taking his time. But it strikes me that we could move in there right now and wipe them out inside of an hour. 
get close enough to lob grenades and pulverize them. If you want to get the job done instead of loafing, that seems to be the one thing this platoon is extremely good at. <laughs> Lieutenant, how long have you been out here? What's that got to do with it? Oh, not a whole lot, I guess. But you make it sound like a football game. It ain't a football game, Lieutenant. It's one long gut ache. We're some torn up, mangled boys fresh off the farm, and it's gonna take a long time to forget. You ain't been shot at yet, Lieutenant. Remember that. How would you know? And you ain't shot nobody either, have you? You beat me over here, Sergeant, I'll give you that. But when it comes to killing Japanese, I think you'll find I'm a highly trained and very efficient officer. Yes, sir. I'm sure you are. I was well-schooled in tactics and equipment. I'd say you could all use a refresher course around here. Maybe so. You, soldier. Yes, sir. Let me see your rifle. Uh, right here, sir. That's a filthy piece, soldier. Well, there's a lot of mud around here. That's no excuse. I want clean weapons in this platoon. That's number one priority. The worst thing that can happen is for your weapon to jam. Now break them down and clean them, because we're here to kill Japs. Or did you forget? That's our job, and by God, we're gonna do it. This outfit better shape up fast, or I'm putting you all on report. It sounds pretty gung-ho. Yeah, real bloodthirsty. Think he wants us to scalp him, too? You have something to say? Me? No, sir. What is it with you men? No sleep? Or no guts? You tired of killing Japs? Is that it? Or don't you have the stomach for it? Listen, sir. Let it go. No, when I got something to say, I'm gonna say it. Go ahead. Let's hear it. We're 24 months up on you, Lieutenant. We've seen a lot of blood and heard a lot of screaming from both sides. You've got a big deal about doing some killing. We'll fall in on that order, don't you worry. But you can't order us to like it. We've seen enough dead men to last us for the rest of our lives. The rest of our lives and then some. We'll do some more killing for you, Lieutenant. All you want. Just don't ask us to cheer about it. We'll see about that. Radio operator. Here. Get me base camp. Sir? Tell them to hold mortar fire. On my order. For now, prepare to attack. We're going to take that cave head on. Whether you farm boys like it or not. Give me your binoculars, Sergeant. You can't see anything down there. It's too dark. It won't be dark when the shells hit. I want to see how close they come. You think they're going to make it this time? I'm betting on it. I told them to elevate exactly three degrees. Oh, why didn't I think of that? With the side of that mountain blown out, they won't have any place to hide. The cleanup will be easy, Sergeant. Even for you. Piece of cake, Lieutenant. Piece of cake. Still short. Yep, that's what it looks like. Casarano, those flamethrowers arrive? Yes, sir. Good. I figure we can move in behind the next barrage and get within 50 yards of the opening. Just like that. Flamethrowers can do a lot of damage, can't they? They can. What about phosphorus grenades? Oh, them too. If you put them in the right place. But... But what? I wouldn't want to get hit by one. We're not talking about you, we're talking about the enemy. Right. Well, wait till dawn, then move in. Check with company for the mortar barrage so we'll be ready to go. Okay, sir. I'll tell the men we're going in. You'll have to double time this one, Sergeant. That is, if you want to keep up with me. Oh, we'll keep up, but... Something you want to say to me, Sergeant? No. Are you sure? Yeah. I'm sure. I'm not your cup of tea, am I, Sergeant? I guess you got a little too much vinegar for me, Lieutenant. That's what it takes in wartime. You know, sir... What? We could bypass it. Bypass? 
Where did you get an idea like that? There aren't 20 men in that cave. Most of them are sick or injured or half-starved. They're probably out of their minds by now. But they're Japs, aren't they? They're men. They're dirty little cowards. Are they? You've got a funny group here, Sergeant. And you're the oddball of the bunch. If I may make an observation, the way I size you up is this. You've either got battle fatigue, the whole lot of you, or you're chicken. Maybe a little of both. Maybe neither. I don't rightly know. But the way I size you up, Lieutenant, is... Go ahead, say it. I'd like to hear this. Pea green shave tail right out of the panhandle. Scared to death he won't bag his limit. Or worse, all shook up because he's afraid somebody will peg him as a Johnny-come-lately instead of a rough, tough killer. I think that should do. You ask, you get told. You can't have it both ways. I said that should... You want to prove your manhood, Lieutenant? Okay. But it's too late to get your choice about how to do it. It's down to one lousy cave full of sick, pitiful, half-dead losers. And a handful of dirty, bone-tired men who've had their craw full of this war. You're a lousy soldier, Casarano, and that goes for the rest of these poor, sensitive, sad, sick boys you want to bottle feed. Did someone forget to tell you that when you fight a war, you fight a war? And that you kill until you're ordered to stop killing? I got the message, Lieutenant. Roger Wilco. I hope so. The message that there's always somebody like you who squeaks in just before they close the door. Somebody who has to grind his axe before you can give that final order, no matter what. You listen up, Sergeant. What's your pleasure, Lieutenant? How many more have to die before you get satisfaction? Offhand, I'd say all of them. I don't care where they are or who they are. If they're the enemy, that's it. First day of the war or last day of the war, they get it. Keep the binoculars. You're gonna need them. You've broken your foot glasses, sir. I... no. I... what? I said, it appears that your binoculars are broken, Lieutenant. Give me those. Wait. Who are... Sir? I said, who are... What are you? Sergeant Yamazaki. What? These men, they're all... All... Soldiers, sir. Your soldiers. What? We await your command, Lieutenant Yamori. Sir! Well, where are you going? Not that way, sir! Not that way! Toward the mountain! Look! He runs down the hill! To the cave! No! It's too dangerous! He must not! Watch out! <laughs> Lieutenant! Stay down! Did you get him, sir? I don't know. Dirty little... Kazarano! Hold your fire! It's me! There he is! Get him! Lousy chap! Take a bite off this! <laughs> Lieutenant! Stay where you are! We will return fire! They got us trapped in here. We'll never get out of this cave. Oh, yeah? Watch this. Eat lead, creeps! Lieutenant Yamori! Run back now! Keep your head down! Which way? Can't tell. Which way do I... The hill. Is he hurt? Lieutenant Yamori? What? That was. That was exceedingly brave, sir. To attack the Americans single handedly. Americans? What are you talking about? The Americans in the cave. Twenty or thirty of them. Most of them wounded, but nonetheless armed. 
Very dangerous. Like animals. There aren't that many. Are you... Are you all right, sir? Where are we? In the clearing, sir. At the top of the hill. I've seen you before, but I can't... Who are you? Who am I, sir? Sergeant Yamazaki. Are you all right, sir? Are you feeling well? I asked you a question. Kester? What are we doing here? What is this place? Why... Why Corregidor, sir? Corregidor? When? When, sir? You mean... What is the day's date? May 4th, sir. May 4th. Can't be May 4th. No? It's August. Don't you understand? August. August the 6th. Uh, I humbly ask the lieutenant to forgive me. But I must correct him. The date is May 4th. <sighs> May 4th when? What year? The year 1942, sir. Is the... Is the lieutenant all right? A bump to the head? Uniform and way. It looks just like... Like all your uniforms. Perhaps a touch of malaria. Did you call me? Lieutenant, sir. Your rank. You called me something else. You called me by a name... Yamuri. Your name, sir. Lieutenant Yamuri. <laughs> no. No! No! What happened to me? What's going on here? What's happened? What is wrong with this man? I don't know, Captain Nakagawa. Yamuri, are you sick? <laughs> no. No. I require an answer, Lieutenant. I ask if you were sick. Is that it? I'm, I, I'm sick. We will be moving out soon. If you are too ill to move, you leave me no choice. We shall leave you here. Leave me? We have no transport for the wounded, as you well know. So, we will very shortly move forward, and you shall remain here. My name... My name... My name isn't... On your feet when an officer speaks to you. But my... My name isn't Yamuri. I swear to you. Something's... Something's happened. My name isn't Yamuri. My name is... Silence. Place this man under arrest. Yes, sir. Lieutenant, please, get up. I gave you an order, Sergeant Yamasaki. Men... Forgive me, sir. I... You what? I was... I was feverish for a moment. I, I, I forgot where I was. Ah. I'm... All right now. You're sure of that? Yes, sir. I'm sure. I'm, I'm very sure. Very well. Sergeant! We move out in 15 minutes. 15 minutes, sir. Unfortunately, the artillery was unable to do its job. We shall attack the cave in force. Ready to move out. Sergeant. Yes? The cave he mentioned. Are you feeling better now? Yes, but the cave... He means the one where I was just... The cave with the enemy. Put a new clip in your rifle. Let me help you. Which enemy? 
The American enemy, sir. The stupid fools who don't know when to give up. Here, fix your bayonet. My. The captain does not like to take prisoners. Captain? Yes, Sergeant. Prisoners, sir. What? What about the prisoners? You know my policy. Yes, sir. But what if uh, they surrender? What about the wounded? I doubt that there will be any left to surrender when we are finished. Yamori! Sir? You will take the first section. Move forward as quickly as you can, then drop down 50 yards in front of the opening. But, sir... Watch for my signal. We will cover you with automatic fire for two or three minutes before you make the frontal attack. Sections two and three will follow. Understood? Yes, sir. I didn't hear you. I understand, sir. Be very sure that you do. Now... Go and prepare your men. Your section, sir. Which? Over there. The captain expects you to lead them into victory. Come with me for a moment. Where, sir? Away from the others. Look down there. The cave. Yes? You said... You said something about their being wounded inside? I think so, Lieutenant. When they ran inside, they were carrying each other. I don't think there are more than 20 or 30 men. Not even that. It shouldn't be too difficult. They are only Americans, not good fighters. And they are very weak. Poor, starving soldiers. Please, you mustn't speak that way. The captain... Don't they know when to quit? If they have wounded, what's the point? They can't go on this way. If they surrender now, there might be a chance. What did you say? Nothing, Captain. I didn't hear. What did you just say? Repeat it. Just if... If they're wounded, sir, perhaps... Perhaps what? If we gave them a chance to surrender first, or... Or what? If we left them there left them bypassed the cave completely and moved on bypassed them is that a tactical judgment i think it is or is it some nugget of compassion for the enemy unearthed by your fever they are wounded they're running out of supplies they can't do much harm neither can they sink a battleship from this position but their forces can. That is why we must destroy them. But if they have no more strength to fight... A reminder, Lieutenant. The identity of the men in the cave. They are Americans. They are enemy. Wounded, healthy, walking or lying down. They are enemy. The Japanese army does not bypass. The Japanese army attacks... The Japanese army wipes out its opponents to bring an end to this war. They're wounded. They're beaten and they're wounded. Their forces have suffered heavy losses. The rules of war... Rules. Lieutenant Yamuri, it is odd that you should require this reminder. But the comparative health and well-being of the enemy, his comfort or his discomfort... The degree of his anguish or his incapacities have no bearing on military action. These things have no more to do with a tactical move or a decision of command than the fortunes of an anthill that you step on when we move forward to attack. But they're not ants. Correct. They are enemy. If when we enter the cave they are lying on the ground, crying in agony, pleading for mercy, 
I can assure you, I will have no more compunction about making them a head shorter than I would about stepping on that anthill. Captain, they are men. You are not listening. They are enemy. This is war, and in war you kill. You kill, Lieutenant. Do you understand? You kill until you are ordered to stop killing. No! Now, pick up your broken field glasses and prepare to attack, or I will have you shot. Sir. Sections, assemble! Sergeant Yamazaki! Sir! You will handle the first section. Sergeant Hino! Hi! Take the second section. Lieutenant Ishimoto! Hi! Yours is the third section. Now, we move out! Lieutenant Yamori, let me help you to your feet. I will take care of him, Sergeant, when we return. Yes, sir. Captain, what you do to those men in the cave? Will it shorten the war? By a week? By a day? An hour? Enough. May I ask the captain, what is his pleasure? How many have to die before he receives satisfaction? Offhand, Lieutenant Yamuri, I would say all of them. I don't care who they are or where they are. If they are the enemy, they are to be destroyed. First day of the war, or last day of the war, we destroy them! Rest now, Lieutenant. I will be back. Your field glasses are broken. I will take new ones from the Americans. My... glasses... my... binoculars... Yes, I, I broke them when I, when I, when I. Anytime you say, Lieutenant. What? What? What did you? Looks like you can't use those binoculars now, though. Binoculars? to help you with a duck shoot. Well, we'll just have to follow your orders blind. <laughs> blind as a bat. Sergeant. Sergeant. Cazarano? Of course, when we start firing, there'll be flashes. Wait a minute. Maybe that'll be enough for you to lead the charge, just like San Juan Hill, huh? Of course, we'll be going down, not up. Wait. Hold on. Maybe he wants to put it off. You want to hold the attack till later? No. Uh, yes. I, I mean... What do you mean, sir? Kazrano, uh, something... Something happened. Yeah. You broke your glasses. Now you can't see down there. Tell you what, I'll get you a new pair of one of them Japanese, if we make it inside. No, you don't understand. Those men in the cave... Men, now. Hey, boys, he called them men. And all this time I thought they were the enemy, to be destroyed, just like that. Yeah, like animals. And what do you do with animals when they get in your way? You kill them, right, Sergeant? Right. You slaughter them. You kill, kill, kill till they're all dead. Then you dig them up and kill them again. Ain't that right, Lieutenant? No. There's not going to be an attack. Those men are wounded, starved. There's no point in... In. Hold it. You hear that? Jeep on the road. Hold fire. Lieutenant Cattell here? I. He's right here. I have your orders, Lieutenant. Orders? You're to pull off the hill, sir. Who says? Colonel Hagen, that's who. Well, why would he say that? Considering he just sent a new lieutenant to lead the charge. I, don't you guys know? Know what? Guess you haven't heard. <laughs> Air Force dropped a bomb on Japan this morning. So? A big one. 
I mean, the granddaddy of every bomb ever made. A, uh, I think they call it an atomic bomb. What about it? Well, they figure this is going to end the war inside of a few hours. The Emperor is ready to give up. Well, ain't that something. All units are to pull back to base camp and wait it out. See what happens. Some kind of announcement coming any time now. I'm gone. Is this it? All right, boys, you heard the man. Get your gear and move out. Oh, man. I'm going to get me the biggest steak you ever saw. First thing I'll head for is a hot bath. How about it, Lieutenant? You with us? Or do you want to stay here and fight it out all by your lonesome? Uh, with you. Something on your mind, Lieutenant? Yeah. Yeah, something. I'll bet. But I wouldn't fret it if I was you. There'll be other wars sooner or later. Other caves. Other human beings you can knock off. I, I hope not. God help us. I hope not. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven on the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Shakespeare, the merchant of Venice. But applicable to any moment in time, to any group of soldiery, to any nation on the face of the earth, or, as in this case, to the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. A Quality of Mercy, starring Robert Nepper with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a story by Sam Rolfe. Heard in the cast were Roderick Peoples, Kip Karstedt, Jeff Lupatin, Joby Cerny, Roddy Chong, Joseph Orunda, and Doug James. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Where is Everybody, starring John Schneider with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Roger Mueller, Tom McElroy, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, Richard Hensel, Carl Amari, and Amber Lake. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group.
You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Uh, get away from me. What? What, what? what? Where in the... When I woke up, I was sure somebody was watching me. I didn't know who it was, but I, I could feel someone very close by. I... I thought I could feel breath on my face, too, but it was only a, a breeze and a fly buzzing around my nose. I brushed it off and got up. I was outdoors, in a field, morning. The sun wasn't very high yet. I felt okay, not too hot, not too chilly. The only problem was, where am I? How the heck did I get here? I must have been dreaming. About what? Don't ask me, because I couldn't tell you. When's a dream not a dream? Whatever this one was, it must have been a doozy, because the last thing I remember is... Well, that's... that's just it. You see, I, I don't remember much. Much. Make that anything. So... where to begin? As far as I can tell, this is the beginning. I, I mean, not the beginning, whenever that was, the Big Bang billions of years ago out in the middle of space or something, but it'll, it'll come back to me. It will, and all I have to do is give it some time. So bear with me out there, whoever you are. The one who is watching me, probably. I can promise you one thing, though. This isn't going to turn out to be one of those times when you only think you woke up, but you didn't because you're still asleep. I hate dreams like that. Now, I know what's real and what isn't, so do you. And this is definitely real. The mosquito that, that bit me, for instance, right on the nose, the, the bite is starting to itch like crazy with the sun beating down, but guess what? I'm clean out of calamine lotion. Wait a minute. I know this road, don't, don't I? Looks like a lot of other roads, asphalt, telephone poles. I, I must have been driving, and my car quit on me, and I started walking to town, and I ended up spending the night out here. But if that's what happened, where's my car? Somebody could have dumped me out, I guess, after they hit me on the head and robbed me. And that's why I don't have a wallet and why I don't remember anything. Temporary amnesia. I hope I don't have a concussion. That could be why I've got this headache. Must be a sign along here somewhere. Pretty soon I'll see a house, a town, something. Or someone will come along. They have to. And when they do, I'll just stick out my thumb and hitch a ride. Don't have much of a choice. One thing, though, will... Somebody please tell me... Where is everybody? A French philosopher once said, hell is other people. And for some, that may be true. Most of us need time alone, away from the pressure of everyday life. If you live in a city with noise and crowds and traffic, that's easy to understand. But what about the other side of the coin? We also need companionship, someone to talk to, a friendly voice and a familiar face. It's a dilemma that goes back to Adam, who found the Garden of Eden unbearable on his own. Enter one male human being. Age 31, height approximately 5 foot 11 inches. His name isn't Adam, though exactly what it is, where he is, and what he's doing here, even he doesn't know. At the moment, these questions constitute the central mystery of his life. But it's a beautiful day, and he's on a road that's bound to lead somewhere, back to the beginning or to a destination not yet in sight. The journey will take him through shadows as well as sunlight. And you are hereby invited to go along. Be forewarned, however. This is an excursion to an unknown land. A 
walking trip without benefit of compass or road map through a realm called the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Where Is Everybody? Starring John Schneider with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There we go. Roadside diner, just what I need. Well, what do you know? Still got a couple of dollar bills in my pocket. Some change, that ought to do it. Looks like I got the place to myself. Service here. Hey, is, is this jukebox loud enough for you? I mean, can you hear it all right? Hey! Somebody want to turn this thing down a little over here? All right, all right, I'll do it. Pretty early for this kind of noise. Gotta be a volume control somewhere. Maybe it's on the back. If I can slide it out from the wall... Easy now. Oh, look, I like music the same as the next guy, and all I'm looking for is the knob. There. Now, the question is, who played the song in the first place? Somebody had to put a coin in the slot. Who's here? Somebody go outside for a minute? Is that it? Say, can, can you hear me? I see there's a town up the road. What's the name of it? Anybody know? Anybody? Like in the kitchen? Hey, you in there, I asked you a question. What, what is the name of the town? Hello? Cook must be outside catching a smoke. Guess what? You got a customer out front. You hear me? Cash customer! Meanwhile, don't waste so much water. I think, uh, ham and eggs. Yeah, traveler special. Eggs up and soft, hash browns, coffee black. Customer waiting! Take your time. Me, I'm in no hurry. One cigarette left. Anybody got a light? I didn't think so. Where do you keep the matches? Hold, hold on, I see them. By the register, right next to the clock. Whoops. Didn't mean to knock it on the floor, just trying to get a match. Here, I'm picking it up, see? time is it anyway? 6.15. That can't be, right? Cracked. Oh, well, I'm sorry if I broke it. I'll pay for it, honest. Of course, I'll have to send you the money. I'm a little low on funds right now. All I got on me is $2.85. Good old American money, isn't it? Yep, U.S. coins and currency. Well, well, we got that much settled. I'm, I'm an American. There's a little question about my identity, though. L let me let me put it to you this way: I'm I, I'm not sure who I am. <laughs> Isn't that a laugh? But uh, but I've got two dollars and eighty-five cents, and I'm hungry. with it. If nobody's going to help me, I guess I'll just have to take care of myself. I'll see you later, everybody. I'll even do you a favor. The sign on the door says, open. Let me turn it around for you. Closed. Yeah, that's more like it. Truth in advertising. I'm going to wake up any minute now. I know I'm going to wake up. I, I, I wish, uh, I wish there'd be a noise or something a great a great big noise to make sure i do but it's so quiet around here it's weird okay 
Okay. If I gotta make it myself, here goes nothing. Uh, <clears throat> yes, sir, that's my baby. No, sir, don't mean maybe. Yes, sir, that's my baby now. Oakwood, huh? That's a nice name for a town, real homey. The only question is, where, where is it and where's everybody who lives here? Gotta be quite a few. Every kind of store you could think of. Drugstore, grocery, soda shop, post office, courthouse. Looks like a regular town to me. There must be a school around here, too. Where's all the kids? What? Where's that coming from? Church. Over there! What, what'd I do? I, I imagine I heard it? No, no, it was it was real, all right, and that means somebody rang it. Knew I wasn't alone. I'll, I'll go to the church and... Wait a minute, what's that? You there. Miss, yeah, you in the truck. I'm over here. Thank God, look. Miss, I, I wonder if you could do me a favor, just a, li a little one. You gotta help me. Now, I don't want you to think I'm nuts or anything. I mean, it, it's nothing like that. I just... I don't seem to remember who I am. I, I, I know, I know, but it's it's true. It's, it's crazy, huh? I, I looked all over, but I haven't seen anybody around. Not anybody. I guess it's too early or something. There hasn't been a single solitary soul except you, not one. It's a real oddball thing, but I, I woke up this morning, and, well, I, I didn't exactly wake up, not in bed or, or anything. I, I just sort of found myself out there off the road. Real nice, you, you know what I mean? And now I got a sore back from sleeping on a rock. <laughs> so listen, it's, it's, it's amnesia, right? Isn't that what they call it? Yeah, yeah, that that's it. Amnesia. See, I, I don't remember a thing, and I couldn't find anybody to ask till now. You're the first person I've seen. The only one. Look, I, I don't want you to get spooked or anything, but could you tell me, is, is there a doctor around here? You know, just a, just a regular doctor, so I can get a checkup and find out what's wrong, because I think I'm sick. Miss, Miss, what's the matter? Can't, can't you hear me? You gotta be able to. The windows rolled down. What's the matter? Hey, you're wrong. It came off. It. You're not even a real woman. You're a, you're a dummy. What's it say on the truck? Resnick's department store mannequins. Is that all? A, a bunch of mannequins? Here, get off the horn. Sit up straight. That's the way. Uh, here's, here's your arm back. I'm very sorry, madam. My profound apologies. I can assure you that at no time did I mean to disturb you. As a matter of fact, I've always had a thing for quiet women. <laughs> Get what I mean, babe? <laughs> Here's a kiss for that cute little turned-up nose. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can't stick around and talk. I got a very important appointment. I'll see you in the funny papers, and don't you take any wooden boyfriends. Anybody here? A store with lots of clothes store, but nobody to buy them. Only more dummies. Oh, I'm sorry, lady. I didn't mean to bump you like that. Say, was that your sister outside in the truck? I thought so. You know how I could tell? Because you look exactly alike. <laughs> no, no, I... I can't use a new handbag today. No, no underwear either. This... Does this store even have a men's department? Sportswear? How about fishing poles? No? Too bad. See, I got nothing to do today, so I thought I'd go fishing. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, 
I'll catch you later. Let's see. What other kind of stores they have on this street? Whatever they are, I bet they're all empty as a tomb. Like some kind of ghost town. Where'd they all go? To the moon? And they didn't even leave a note. Some manners. Well, I guess I'll just... Hold on. Is that what I think it is? It is. A phone booth. Just what the doctor ordered. It even works. We're in business. Operator, are you there? Come on. Operator. Hi, operator. Oh, you're beautiful. Let me tell you. Listen, I don't know who I am or where I am. Oak, Oakwood, yeah, that, that's it. I, I must be sick or something, and, and, and I need help fast. I, I want to call, uh, what, what number? What is, what is it now? Uh, I need a number. And I can't remember any. Get, get, you, get, get me anything. Anyone, anywhere. I, I don't care who it is. Get, get, get me your supervisor, all right? Please dial the number now. This is a recording. A recording? Oh, that's just great. Never mind, operator. I'll look in the phone book. Here, A, Abel, Adams, Ackerman, Albright, Allen, B. Arnold. Where do you all live? Inside this book? Why aren't you on the street? A Baker, Belden, Biltmore, a Botsford, Bradbury. Tell me something, gang. Don't you ever go out for a stroll, shopping, work? You do have jobs, don't you? If you don't, then who's watching the store? For that matter, who's watching anything? How's that? Any number of them. Any, any number at all. I'll, I'll, I'll take my chances. Just connect me with a real, live, human being. It can be in Timbuktu for all I care. Well, you want more coins, is that it? The number you have reached is out of order. Please make sure you are dialing correctly. Give me my coins back and I will. Hey, give me my money back. Give it to me! What kind of lousy phone company is this? Okay, all right, who's the wise guy? Who locked the door? Very funny. This is beautiful, trapped in a phone booth like a goldfish. Okay, you got me. Here I am. Everybody come see, that's it. Joke's over. Somebody want to give me a hand? How about it? No? And you ask for it. Oh. oh, now I'm bleeding. Thanks a lot. For nothing. Some joke. I know you're out there watching me. I can feel your eyes. Well, whoever you are, I'm gonna find you. And when I do, you're gonna pay. You're all gonna pay, but good. Oakwood City Bank. That's an idea. I feel like making a withdrawal. Hi. You got a customer out here? I'd, I'd like a loan. Yeah, that's it. About, oh, a hundred thou. Maybe more. <laughs> I don't know how long I'll be stuck in this jerkwater town. Better make it five or six. Oh, how about eight hundred thousand dollars? That ought to hold me for a while. What's the matter? Everybody on a lunch break? No sweat. I'll slip in behind the counter myself. Simple little transaction. Look at all that cream. Might be a little short, though. I'll... Don't worry about it. I'll take whatever you got. Generous of you. Mighty generous. I just won't put it all in one pocket in case somebody robs me. I better get some coins while I'm at it. A few rolls and I'm out of here. I got that, that feeling again. This feeling somebody's watching, trying to trap me. What? 
Open the gate. Where are you? Who's watching? There! Now I thought so! A TV camera on the wall. Pretty clever. Would you mind turning the alarm off, please? It's too piercing. Hey, you! Whoever's watching through that thing, turn it off! Or I'll do it for you! Now let's try that again. One more roll of quarters coming up. The pitcher winds up. He throws. <laughs> there. Who said you could take my picture anyway? Nice. Two balls on the break. Now all I got to do is run the table. Piece of cake. Eight ball, anybody? I'll cover all bets. <laughs> all right, all right, that's enough. Time out. How about a cigar? They gotta have cigars around here. Two for a dollar, huh? Pretty good. I always like an expensive cigar. Hey, how about the rest of you guys? Anybody want to smoke? Oh, I forgot. You're invisible. Well, I'll light up for you. You get the idea? Always wanted to do this. Light a cigar with a hundred dollar bill. Hmm. Now that's what I call great taste. No big deal. <sighs> Hold on. Who can I get a drink around here? Hey, wait up, fellas. I'll be back in a minute. And nobody touch the cue ball. A chocolate ice cream soda with three scoops and a straw. <laughs> That's what I like. Anybody mind if I smoke in the drugstore? <laughs> I didn't think so. Well, I'll just set it down on the counter. Oh, delicious. Okay, what else do I need? Sunglasses, magazines, books. Yeah, a book. Books are good. Pick up a paperback to read in case I get bored. The last man in the world, huh? I wonder what this one's about. An atomic war, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think I read it before. Or did I? Eh, better take it anyway. Here's for the soda in the book. Yo! Post office! Got any mail for me today? Might help if I could tell you the name. Uh, how about John Q. Smith, Anytown, USA? No? Check again. Please, Mr. Postman. Deliver the letter, the sooner the better. Oh, relax, I'm not gonna go postal on you. Just give me some stamps. In case I think of somebody to write. Where is that coming from? Across the street? WGBN, the voice of the Midwest. Well, what do you know? This is where they broadcast from, right here in good old Oakwood. I know this station. I used to listen to it all the time. Never knew where they were. Do not enter when the red light is on. I don't think anybody will mind while the record's playing. It really is a record. Look at that! Look at old-fashioned vinyl on a turntable. I th think I used to have this album. Oh, oh, excuse me. Let's start it over again. Somebody left a cigarette in the ashtray, still burning. Who? Who's here? The D-J? I remember the DJ on WGBN, Vern Stevenson. Yeah, that, that was his name, playing nothing but the best. Where are you, Vern? Can you see me? The booth's empty, but somebody can hear me. I know it. I feel it. Attention, listeners, all you... People out in Radio Land, we interrupt this broadcast for a special announcement. 
We're all alone here, and we need to hear from you, so call in your requests. The number is... Well, you 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 know the number. L- look it up. Just ask the operator for WGBN 1060 on the dial. The first caller wins a, a, a free lunch on the house, courtesy of me. You know me, don't you? If you do, call in and tell me, will you? Because I'm, I'm having a hard time remembering at the moment. Is anybody out there? Anybody at all? Congratulations. Hi. Th- thanks Thanks for calling. Thanks a lot. You've been selected to receive a free all-expense-paid vacation to deep space. What, what are you talking about? This is an automated call from Amatex, Inc. to a selected few homeowners like yourself. All you have to do is complete a brief survey. If you'd like to continue in English, please press 1. Or Spanish, press 2. Forget about it. Wait, wait a minute. The phone works. It works. All I need is a number. Any number. How do I get an outside line? Extension one. Extension two. None of the buttons work. Come on, I'm trying to make a call. Three o'clock and still nothing. It feels like a Sunday, the longest one in history. I wonder if the movie theater's open. Why not? Maybe they got a matinee, a double feature, Pride of the Air Force and The Loner. <laughs> now that I gotta see. One, please. Oh, I get it. Self-service. Huh? That's okay. I'll just reach in and take a ticket. Keep the change. That's it, everybody. Good timing. Cartoon's over. Okay, Mr. Projectionist, you can roll the feature now. Ladies, please remove your hats. Shh. No talking. Anybody care if I put my feet up? <laughs> That's what I thought. Look at those planes, will ya? U.S. Air Force, go! Air Force, Air Force! Hey. I'm Air Force. That's it. You hear me? I remember that much. I'm in the Air Force! Can anybody hear me? You! You! Up in the projection booth, you got an Air Force man in the house! Hey! Nobody here. Then who is running the picture? At least I got the first part of it. I was in the Air Force. If I could just remember what happened after that. What was it? A, a war? A, a bomb? Or or something? That must have been it. A bomb. But if there was, it would have destroyed everything. And everything still here, except for the people. What kind of sense does that make? Put it on. Nobody, that's who. It doesn't add up. No way. Phony butter. The smell's making me sick. Where's the men's room? Uh, I can't take this anymore. It's wearing me down. Just look at me. Look at the face in the mirror there. Buddy, I wouldn't know you. You'll forgive me. The face is familiar, but... The name escapes me. See, I got a little problem here. You know what it is? I'm in the middle of a nightmare that I can't wake up from, and you're part of it. 
You and the ice cream and the cigar, the phone booth, the mannequin, this whole town, wherever it is, whatever it is. I... I, I just... I just remembered something else. Scrooge said it. You you remember Scrooge, pal? Oh, not Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> Ebenezer Scrooge, what he said to the ghost of old Marley. I must have learned it in school. I think it goes like this. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an undone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you. Get it? That's what you all are. You're what I had for dinner last night. You must be, but now it's the next day and I'd like to wake up. I've had it. And if I can't wake up, at least I'd, I'd like... I'd like to find somebody to talk to. That's all. <laughs> is... Is that too much to ask? I guess it is. Me? I'm gonna have some popcorn. Plain. But I tell you true. If I don't find somebody today, you hear me? If I don't, I'm checking out of this world one way or the other. I'll get a gun. Or, or whatever it takes, count on it. That's it, then. I sat through both movies, but it didn't help. No more than the drugstore, the pool room, the radio station, none of it. All one big, fat joke. Give me my money back. Here it goes. Give it to me. Oh, shit. What a lousy phone company is this? I'm greedy. Thanks a lot. Where are you? Who's watching? I'm in the middle of a nightmare that I can't wake up from. No! It's too much! Make it stop! Please! I need a gun. And one bullet. If nobody will help me, I'll have to do it. Where can I get a gun? The police station, that's it. Hello? No, what's the use? Calling all cars, calling all cars. This is an all-points bulletin. Unknown man in town. Now infiltrating the police station. Suspicious-looking character. Probably wanted by the FBI. Presently unarmed, but not for long. <laughs> all units, return at once and bring your guns. He needs one! Anything. 45, 38, police special, Smith and Wesson. Even a 22, it doesn't matter. Just something that'll do the job. Hot coffee. That's very considerate of you, I gotta say. It smells mighty fine, but no dice. It'll take more than that to get straight. There. I knew it. Shotguns all locked up tight. Safety first, boys. You don't know who might come wandering in here. <laughs> well, when all else fails, use a little elbow grease. Remington 3030 over and under shelves, right here. Now, where am I gonna do it? I don't wanna splatter my brains all over the front desk. <laughs> hey, what's back there? Jail cells, perfect! <laughs> Sit right here on the cot. <sighs> Ow, I, I can't reach the trigger if I put the muzzle under my chin. Wait. Shoes off. I can reach it with my toe. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy cried, wee, 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 all the way home. Oh, no. You, but wait a minute. You can't lock me in here. I can't stand to be locked up. I've got a thing about it. Wait. No. You, you, you can't do this to me. I'm trying to finish it for you. What more do you want? 
Give me a chance to do it my way, please. 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 It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. That's it. Are you sure? Help him. He's had it. All right, clock him and mark the time. Now get him out of there. Come on, release the subject. On the devil. Yes, sir. Careful with the electrodes. Remove the tape from his forehead and chest. It's all right, Major. You're right. Get a stretcher. Medics, over here. Now watch his hand. He, he cut it on one of the dials inside. What? What? How is he otherwise? He's all right considering. Delusions of some sort. I guess that's it. He's coming out of it now. Oh, fine, fine. Did you get all your data recorded? Yes, sir. Every bit of it. And did you get him clocked? Yes, sir. All right. How long? 484 hours, 36 minutes. That long? I'll compile all the data for you. Yeah, good. And I'd, I'd like to have a look at his reaction chart, too, hour by hour. Uh, what about the press, sir? The press? You said you'd see them. They've been waiting in shifts. Well, I'll, I'll have to cut it short. I want to talk to Ferris. Yes, sir. The general will now give you a statement. Sir, do you consider the test run a success? Very much so. You mean there were no problems? I didn't say that, but nothing we can't handle. Uh, Major Ferris has been in that box, six feet by five feet by five feet high, for something in the neighborhood of 484 hours, which is roughly equivalent to our deep space mission before rendezvous. But we've had flights longer than that before. No, no, not solo, and not in a capsule that small. It's a one-man mission in a nose cone too small for him to stand up or move around. They call it sensory deprivation. Isn't that right, Doctor? Yes. You see, gentlemen, the human body, and more importantly, the human mind, isn't ready for conditions of extreme confinement. It's a new experience. Even with isometric exercises, music, optical diversion through his visigoggles, the body and brain react as if he's in severe isolation, which he is. But man isn't a hibernating animal. We're not built that way. You might say that evolution hasn't kept pace with technology, so we have to adapt ourselves in new ways. Within limits, of course. That's what the flight simulations are about. To map those limits and see if we're ready. Then this was a simulated trip to the new 10th planet. Is that right? For all intents and purposes. Why not just send up an unmanned probe? Because our exploration platform is already in orbit there. And what we need now is to man it within a reasonable flight time, even with new, faster propulsion systems. As you know, there are still problems with suspended animation, problems we hadn't anticipated. Such as? The revival methods, ice crystals in the blood and so forth. I'll make a background report available if you need it, gentlemen. Thank you. What were those wires attached to him? Electrodes. All of his reactions have been charted and graphed. Respiration, heart, blood pressure. What happened to him toward the end? Just before he pushed the button or whatever it was, we heard him shouting inside. Sounded like he was screaming. What happened to him was that he cracked. Doctor? We assume hallucinations of some sort based on the voice recorder... It's a common trick of the brain when there's not enough sensory input. So you see, there's a very real reason why humans can't bear to be alone. Solitary confinement is a tough sentence, whether it's the Garden of Eden or deep space. There may be a practical reason for human contact, even for love. A kind of survival mechanism to remain sane. How bad did he crack? I'll tell you something, gentlemen. You spend two and a half weeks all by your lonesome on your back in a five-foot square box without ever hearing a human voice other than your own, and I'll give you especially good odds that your imagination would run away with you, too. Just as his obviously did. General, I'd like to know, if I could ask you, our readers are wondering... Yeah, that's enough for now. Thank you. Captain Grant will have a press release drawn up. Should be ready in about uh, an hour. Thank you all for waiting so patiently. Last question, General. How did you know when he was ready to come out? He asked. There are several buttons and switches inside. Each one controls a simulated function for flight. Oxygen, fuel, temperature, and so forth. And the last button. Which was? Abort. When he had all he could take, when he had to get out, that's what he pushed. Or 
pounded with his fist. And now, gentlemen, good day. How do you feel, son? I feel much better, sir. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. Nothing to be sorry for. He did splendidly. Listen, tell me something, Ferris. What was it like? Where did you think you were? Someplace I don't want to visit again. A, a town. A town without people. And you finally had to get out of that town, didn't you? I sure did. What was the matter with me? I went off my rocker, huh? It's a kind of nightmare, Ferris. That your mind manufactured for you to explain what you were going through. And we don't have it licked yet, the trip, I mean? Not today, we don't. And maybe not tomorrow, but we will. I'm sure of it. You see, Ferris, we can feed the stomach with concentrates. We can supply recreation for the eyes and ears. We can pump oxygen in, waste materials out. But there's one thing we can't simulate. A basic need. Man's hunger for companionship. That's the one barrier we haven't licked yet. The barrier of loneliness. I don't need this thing. Better get a thorough physical first. Okay, okay but I, I can walk the rest of the way. Next time it won't just be a box and a hanger, will it? No, Mike. Next time you'll really be alone. And tell the men up there. Tell them next time. It won't be a dream. Next time it'll be real, and I'll be joining them, and so will a lot of others, one by one. Tell them to hang on for a while longer. Help is coming. It's on the way. <laughs> what a remarkable young man. Mm. Yes, he is. Really quite remarkable. The barrier of loneliness. The desperate palpable need of the human animal to be with his own. For up there, beyond the vastness of the sky, in the void that is space, is an enemy known as isolation. It sits among the silent stars, waiting with the patience of eons in the twilight zone. We'll return to the twilight zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Yes. Hiya. Sorry, we're closed. Is this the Southside Loan Company? I said we're closed. Well, it don't look like it. Well, I was about to turn the sign around. This will just take a minute. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> well, see, that's just it. I, I can't come back tomorrow. Nine to six, Monday through Saturday. Say, you got a nice shop here. 
A little bit of everything, huh? Bring in the merchandise. No radios, typewriters, or fishing poles. I pay top dollar. You do, huh? I have to lock up now. Bet you got a lot of rings, jewelry, watches, stuff like that. All in the safe. Bye now. The safe, huh? What about this vase? It's worth plenty, I bet. I told you. I'm closed for the night. What do you want, anyway? Just this. Oh! oh. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll close up for you. Now just point me at the safe and I'm out of here. Probably in the back room. Didn't even lock it yet. What a loser. Now you're talking. Diamonds, gold, this is worth a fortune. doing? Calling the cops? That ain't very nice now, is it? Should have finished you off when I had the chance. Ugh! Now I gotta use the back door. Hold it right there. Put your gun down and throw your hands over your head. Not this time, screw. I ain't going back in the joint. Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Miss me! Eat lead, copper! The alley's a dead end. You ain't going anywhere. We'll see about that. Oh! Portrait of a man at work. The only work he's ever done. The only work he knows. His name is Henry Francis Valentine. But he calls himself Rocky. Because that's the way his life has been. Rocky and perilous and uphill. At a dead run all the way. A thin, pale, stubby fox of a man who has eluded the hunter until tonight. He's tired of running, of wanting, of waiting for the breaks that came to others but never to him. Now he thinks it's all over, but he's wrong. For Rocky Valentine, a new career is just beginning. In the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Nice Place to Visit. Starring Hal Sparks with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Mr. Valentine? What? Mr. Valentine. Uh, who are you? I'm known as Mr. Pip. Can I help you? Get your hands off me. And do it. How do you know my name? It's my job to know everything about you, Mr. Valentine. I hope you don't consider me presumptuous, but I see that you're in need of your cop. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I guess not. White shoes, white suit, white hair, some outfit. Never saw a cop dressed like that. I'm your guide, as it were. <laughs> guide? What? Whatever you may desire. I'm at your service. <laughs> that, I need like a hole in my head. I'm dizzy. What happened? You had... An accident. Lost your step, so to speak. Some accident? Must have fell flat on my face. Don't worry. Soon you'll be as fit as a fiddle. Come along now. I'm sure you'll want to get out of those rumpled clothes. Clean up a bit. I told you, keep your hands off the merchandise. If I've said anything to offend you... Answer the question. Question? I want to know how come you know my name. I believe I already told you. You told me nothing. We clue you, fatso. I don't like games. Oh, but that isn't true. You call me a liar? Not at all, sir. But according to my notes, 
You like games very much. Roulette, blackjack, poker, craps. We see that. Between the ages of seven and ten, you were quite fond of Mumbledypeg. Say, what do you want, anyway? One thing and one thing only, Mr. Valentine. Your comfort. My job is to see to it that you get what you want, whatever it may be. Ha! Your heart's desire, as it were. It's a pretty big assignment, pal. I know, and I must say I'm rather looking forward to it. I'm sure it will entail a good deal of activity. <laughs> now, shall we go? What if I don't want to? What if I got other plans? Then of course you don't have to. It's entirely your decision. From now on, what you ask, you shall receive. Yeah? In exchange for what? How do you mean? What do you get out of it? Oh, nothing at all, Mr. Valentine. I assure you, the service is free. Don't put me on, fat boy. Nothing's free. Nothing. Anything I ever got in this lousy world I had to take. You know why? Because there wasn't nobody going around passing out favors. I'm sure there wasn't. So what's the pitch? You want me to pull a job for you? Is that it? I'm afraid you don't understand. No? We'll see about that. Guess what I got in my pocket? I'm sure I wouldn't know. A 38, that's what. Take my word for it. If you like. Oh, a wise guy, huh? Well, here's a good look. Okay, Santa Claus, hand over your wallet. But I don't have a wallet. Sure, sure. Tell me another one. Honestly. Wait, wait, Mr. Valentine. It isn't really a wallet you want, is it? I do carry petty cash. Take it out. Real slow. Certainly. Here you are. Give me that. Four, five, seven hundred bucks! Will that be enough for now? You got more where that came from? Oh dear, yes. <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> I don't believe this. Now, shall we go? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Fats. Yes? We'll try nothing funny. I wouldn't think of it. Here we are, the penthouse. Hey, now. You like it? Sure I do. Oh, I'm relieved. Some pad, all right. Lots of mirrors, a bar. Look at that stereo. This is class, man. Real class. Chinese modern, I believe they call it. I was afraid you might find the red velvet walls a bit much. Not on your life. Who's it belong to, some crooked politician? Why, it belongs to you, Mr. Valentine. That is, if you approve. You kidding? This is to die for. Of course, we can make any changes you wish. I wasn't sure about the pool table, but I thought we'd give it a try. Mr. Valentine, are you all right? You mean all this gets thrown into the deal? There's no need to negotiate. It's already in the deal. Look here. What? Didn't you notice what it says outside the door? Read the nameplate. Henry Francis Valentine. You see? This is now your residence. No kidding. Now, if you'll please follow me. And this is the master bedroom. Wow! That's a real king-size bed, huh? Emperor size. I dig the mirrors in the ceiling. Bathroom in there. Now then, I'm sure you'd like a change of clothes, freshen up a bit? Yeah, sure, but but first first you gotta give me the pitch. I thought I explained. Come on! The gimmick, the angle, the catch. What do I gotta do for all this? Nothing. <laughs> I can't tell you any more than I already have, honestly. All right, all right, I get it. You're just a goon. I am? A messenger boy, servant. You work for somebody, right? Well, yes, in a way. When do I get to see him? See? Mr. Big, your boss. Oh, I really couldn't say. Okay, goon, that's fine by me. I can wait. So what's next? As I was saying, this is your wardrobe. 
I hope you'll find something that suits you. That's pretty funny. Suits. <laughs> Regular comedian. How many you got in here? Oh, dozens. Hundreds, perhaps. I haven't counted them. <laughs> something for every occasion. Any particular color or style? Nah. I don't care. You pick it. Oh, I could hardly presume to do that, sir. However, keeping in mind your taste, let me see. Perhaps a nice pinstripe. If the lapels that you're liking... It'll do. And to go with the dark material, a nice tie. I believe your favorite color is yellow. Mm -hmm. Splendid. It should go well with, let me see, a new pair of um, brown shoes. Like the ones you have on. Well, sir? Make up your mind. What's the matter? You got no taste? My taste doesn't matter. Perhaps these. A smart black and white pair with tassels and pointed toes. Fine. I'll just lay your selections on the bed. Shirts, socks and underclothes in the drawer. Quite a large stock. And in this ebony case, a selection of jewellery and accessories. Jewellery, huh? Let me see. Cufflinks, tie tacks, rings, watches, a little bit of everything. I'll draw your bath. Yeah, you do that. You do that. All ready, Mr. Valentine. I've adjusted the water to medium hot. Hey, between you and me, Fats, who do they want me to bump off, huh? Must be somebody important, you know? A real VIP. No, oh, no, sir. As I've already explained. I know, I know. It's free, because I'm such a good guy. I'll leave the room while you bathe. Sit right there and wait. Yes, sir. I'll be out in a couple of minutes. Take your time. Please. Hey, Fats? Yes, yeah, sir? Don't try anything while I'm in here. I got my gun with me. One wrong move in your Swiss cheese, you understand? Perfectly. When I tell you, pass in my new clothes one at a time. Absolutely. And no funny business. Hey, check out the new duds. Very impressive, sir. Everything fits. Of course. I'll say this, your guy sure knows his threads. Now, Mr. Valentine, if you'll follow me to the living room... What's all this? I took the liberty of calling room service. I thought you must be getting hungry, so... Would you order the whole menu? A little bit of everything. All your favorites. Steak, potatoes, spaghetti with meatballs, a hero sandwich, French fries, ketchup, chicken noodle soup, peanut butter and jelly, fried chicken strips, donuts, and a banana split. Won't you have a seat? Uh-uh. You first. No, thank you. I'm not asking. I'm telling. I want to see you taste everything. Oh, but I don't eat. So I was right. You're in on it. I haven't eaten in... Why? It must be two or three centuries. That's a good one. Eat! Or is there something wrong with it? No. Then chow down. I can't. I've forgotten how. Pretty slick. You give me a bath, some clothes, then poison me. I'll tell you something. You gotta get up pretty early to put one over on Rocky Valentine. You think you're smart, don't you, Fats? Yeah, you're smart, all right, but you're not smart enough. What are you doing? Just this. If you won't eat the food, you're gonna eat lead, big boy, because this here is the final course. <laughs> You have me at a disadvantage, sir. I didn't expect the bullets to have such impact. I'll clean up the broken dishes. You got a bulletproof vest under that white suit, huh? Pretty slick. Okay, let's see how your head holds up right between the eyes. Mr. Valentine, please. Huh? I, I couldn't have missed, not at this range. That's just it. You didn't miss. Maybe there's something wrong with the bullets. Try that mirror over there. Mr. Valentine, perhaps you'd like a drink? Yeah. Yeah, good idea. 
Where's the scotch? Here. Hold on. Where'd this whiskey come from? It wasn't here a minute ago. I know. I provided it in case. What do you mean you provided it? What are you, a magician? What's going on? This ain't no regular apartment. Where am I? You might want to sit down. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Valentine, do you remember when we met earlier this evening? I told you I was, in a sense, your guide. And you said you needed a guide like a hole in the head? Yeah. Well, as a matter of strict fact, you had a hole in your head only a short time ago. What are you talking about? A bullet hole. The policeman, remember? In the alley. They yelled for me to stop. And I didn't, but they... You mean I'm dead? Why, yes! By Jove, you've got it! Then if I'm dead, all this stuff, the penthouse, the booze, the free clothes... I must be in heaven. You're my, you're my guardian angel, right? Something like that? Yes, Mr. Valentine, something like that. But uh, And I can have anything I want. Anything. Big talk, fatso. Let's see some proof. Proof? Real proof. Right now. I want money, moolah, simoleons, cold hard cash. I gave you what I had in my pocket. Chump change. I'm talking about real money. Make it a million. A million dollars? And 5G bills. As you wish. Okay, where is it? Look in that drawer, under the desk. You're putting me on a million bucks. But what am I supposed to do with it? I don't, I don't want to spend it all by my lonesome. No. That's no fun. I need a chick. I take it you're using a slang term. A broad, a dame, you know, make sure she's stacked. Curves all over the place, you dig? I'm not sure. I... Let me spell it out for you. Beautiful. Oh, now I understand. So, when does she get here? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Who are you? I, I mean... My name's Lita. What's yours? Uh, <laughs> you did good, Fats. Real good. Thank you, sir. Do you mind if I dance? Go right ahead. Mm. When I hear music like this, I just, uh, I don't know. I get this feeling and I have to move my body. Me too. May I have this dance? Mm, I thought you'd never ask. Hi, you doll. Hi, yourself. Call me Rocky. Now I know I'm in heaven. <clears throat> Will there be anything else? Not right now, Jeeves. Very good, sir. But hang around. I might need you later in case I want more. Of course, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> no more bets, please. No more bets. Hurry up, Rocky. Yeah, what are you going to do? Are you all finished? Not on your life, sweetheart. How about... 33 red. 33 red! Yeah! Hey, the gentleman in the pinstripe suit. Rocky, you're the man. The best. <laughs> How about that? I win again. Hey, Fats! Something I can do for you? No, something I can do for you. Put your money on the table right there. 14 black. Rocky's hot tonight. Am I right, dolls? You sure are. He is. He's a winner. I'm afraid I don't have any money. You don't? Well, what do they pay you? Halos or something? Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Combinations odd and even. Okay, let's go. No more bets. Come on, come on. 14 black! 14 black! Yeah. That makes what? 80, 80 grand! Closer to 100. In an hour! How about that, Bats? Is Rocky hot or is he hot? He is most definitely hot. Hey, Lita. What, Rocky? Open your purse. Go cash these in for me, okay, babe? Sure. Hold on. Yeah? 
A hundred G's, sweetheart. I count real good, get me? Don't worry, Rocky. Be right back. What now, sir? Come on, let's see what's shaking with the cubes. I got this table spooked. Very well. The dice table is this way. No more bets. Oh, there's a slot machine. You want to play, doll? Can I? Sure. Here's a silver dollar. Wait a minute. I'll put it in for you. I got the magic. I told you. <laughs> Would you like me to carry them for you? Yeah, sure. And give the ladies a tip. Very good, sir. Seven out. Line away. Oh. Step aside. Let me show you how it's done. That, sir? Here's your money, Rocky. Put it on the line. All of it, sir? Why not? When you're hot, you're sizzling. Money talks. Get your bets down. Hard ways, horn bets, any craps. Breathe on them for me, doll. Sure, Rocky. New shooter coming out. Yo, 11. <laughs> Here you go, doll. Go get yourself a new dress or something. Something skimpy. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Rocky. How much loot we got? Approximately 200,000. Bet, sir. Let me see. Give me a proposition. How much for another 11? 16 to 1. Put everything on 11. Maybe you should hold some back, Rocky. Don't make me laugh. I'm going to buy and sell this joint. Same dice. Yes, sir. Guess them for me. If you say so. Mm. Same good shooter coming out. Looking for a point. Yo, Alev! Winner, winner! Frontline winner! I'll have to get you a briefcase for your winning, sir. You do that, Fats. Get two. Get a whole bunch of them. I ain't stopping now, not the way my luck is running. Never had a night like this. Place your bets. Okay, buddy, buddy, let's do it again. Same bit, same bet. Hey, I'm dry as a bone. Anybody get me a drink or what? I'll get it for you, Rocky. Me! 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 Pressing 11, all bets down. Come on now. Like the song says, luck be a lady. Move your car, please. This is a no parking zone. Uh, whew. Making money really takes it out of you. Uh, where's the loot? I have two briefcases, sir, and the ladies each have one. Good. My arm's sore. They're heavy. I don't mind. Where are we going now? Uh, get your car, sir? Yeah. Big convertible. Pink and white. And be careful with it, you hear me? Yes, sir. Loading and unloading only. No parking. Huh. Something bothering you, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, him. The policeman? He's only doing his job maintaining order. Lousy screws. Think they're the king of the hill just because I got a badge and a few lousy inches? How do you mean? Every cop I ever see is about six and a half feet tall. Look at him. Lording it over everybody. Oh, dear. That was indiscreet of me. I should have realized. Not your fault. Oh, but it is. I'll fix it for you. Officer? Yeah? Come over here for a moment. Yeah, what do you want, mister? Better? Sure is. Hey, screw! May I help you? Your hat's on, crooked trooper. Now get out of my sight. Your mother's calling you. Here's a kick in the pants to get you moving. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> Look at him running on those little legs. I sure showed him, didn't I? <laughs> Your car, sir. Ah. Uh. Oh, okay, kid. Here, you keep the change. Oh, that's a hundred dollar bill. Knock yourself out. Come on, let's blow this joint. I'll drive, if you like, sir. I like. <laughs> okay, Fats, put the pedal to the metal. Whatever you wish, Mr. Valentine. 
Your broad's in the back seat. Hang on. Should we fasten our seatbelts? Maybe we better. It wrinkles my dress. Hey, what do you say we open her up and see what this baby will really do? Very well. We're gonna crash. Not on your life. I got all the luck tonight. Punch it, Pip. <laughs> Man, this is really living, huh? In a manner of speaking, Mr. Valentine. In a manner of speaking. Where's my pad? Just at the end of the hall. Fats, do me a favor. Yes? I want to get rid of that heap we've been driving. Is anything wrong? It seems to go fast enough. Yeah, but the ashtrays are full. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a note. Change car. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is it, Mr. Valentine? We forgot the suitcase is full of dough. Oh, yeah. He's right. I set mine down and... No need to worry. After all, you can win it back tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. Hey, girls, go on inside. I want to talk to Fats. Okay. Sure, Rocky. We'll wait up for you. What's on your mind? How about tomorrow we look up some of my old buddies, like Mike Fink and Mac Gorman and Silky Armstrong? Hmm. What's the matter? Didn't they make it? Oh, it isn't that, Mr. Valentine. It's... Well, you see, all of this is your own private domain, as it were. It was made for you alone. What about the broads? I mean, they're extras, like in a movie? In a sense, yes. Everyone here is, except, of course, you and me. Oh. Well, we'll just party it up tonight anyway. You too, of course. I'm not permitted, sir. Why? Angels ain't supposed to have fun? Come on, who's to know? Sorry, sir. Man, you really pulled rough duty with this job, didn't you? It has its compensations. Hey, Fatso, let me ask you a question. Go ahead. Something's been kind of bugging me. Don't get me wrong, I ain't ashamed of my life. You know, anything I did, well, I, I did it because I had it, you understand? Perfectly. Of course, I ain't saying I was the greatest guy in the world. Maybe I made a few wrong moves, but, you know, like a shrink said one time, I'm... Sort of a victim of my environment, you know? Can't get away from that, right? Whatever you say. I never got a break, you know? Never. Old man a drunk, old lady a tramp, no lousy dough in the house. I mean, what do they expect? I should grow up to be president? The thing I want to know is, how come they let me in here? I thought this place was for school teachers and like that. Oh, we have some school teachers here, Mr. Valentine. Well, must have been something real good I did once, something that made up for everything else, huh? Yeah, maybe that's it, but what was it? What, what I ever do that was good? So, uh, how do I find out? We have a hall of records. It isn't far. Perhaps you would like me to take you there. Are they open now? They're always open. Let's go. Wh wait, what, what about the dolls? Don't worry, sir. Something tells me they'll fend for themselves till you get back. Right this way. I'll ring for the elevator. Will you look at this? The files are over here, sir. It's the biggest room I've ever been in. You can't even see the ceiling. Strictly speaking, there isn't one. Valentine. Hmm. The V's should be in one of these cabinets. How'd they get all the fog on the floor like some kind of movie? I'm afraid the movies are only a pale imitation. Here, this should be the one. V. 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 Ah, here it is. Henry Francis Valentine. That's me. Born Brooklyn, New York, cried a lot as a baby. I did? At age six, tortured small dog. Why not? It bit me. At age seven, began stealing toys from Dime Store. Age eight, organized street gang known as the Angels. <laughs> How about that? Great bunch of kids. That's what we called ourselves, the Angels. Can you believe it? Age nine, broke into bicycle store. Age ten, beat up smaller child, hospitalized with injuries. Hey, what is this anyway? Your permanent record, sir. But it goes on for pages and pages. Nothing but all the bad things I ever did. It's thick as a book. I don't get it. Get what? 
You don't think there was a mistake, do you? Not likely. Then don't figure. Where's the good stuff? I wouldn't worry, sir. I'm sure the record is quite complete. Well, hey, if it don't bother him, then I guess I ain't gonna let it bother me, you know what I mean? I believe I do. Seen enough? Yeah. Plenty. What now, Mr. Valentine? I don't know. Maybe fool around with the dolls, maybe go and shoot some craps first. I'll bring the car around. Nah, I, I can catch a cab. I got some thinking to do anyway. Very good. If you need me, just pick up any phone. Dial 1-800-PIP. Sure thing. We'll see you, Fats. Place your bets, hard ways, any craps. Put it all on double sixes. All of it? You heard me. Yes, sir. All bets down. Same good shooter, coming out. Twelve, midnight, winter twelve. Say, uh, you want to stay up all night? What? Double sixes, midnight. Let it ride, sir? No, forget it. Your chips. Yeah, sure. Lucky 13. 13 it is. No more bets. 13 red. Pay the gentleman with the yellow tie. Don't you want your chips, sir? Mail them to me. Okay, pick up your hand. That's it. How many cards you want? Um, I'm okay. How about you? I don't need any either. Lita, how many? I think I'll play these. Dealer stands, Pat. What do you got? Huh? Now's the time when you lay them down. Oh, oh. Let me see. I got a full house? Great. What do you got, doll? Um, I'm not sure. I'll tell you. Looks like a straight flush queen high. Oh, is that good? It's great. It's just great. Lita, show me your cards. But everybody will know what I have. It's okay. Yep, you got her beat straight flush king high. I win. Not so fast. Any other game you could bet the farm. But here, read them and weep. I got a royal flush. You win again, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, I know already. That's all I ever do in this nutty place. Win, win, win. Is there anything else you'd like us to do? There must be something. Now get out of here, all of you. Sick of looking at you. Can we come back later? Don't call us, we'll call you. Go on, scram. Now what am I supposed to do? Play tiddlywinks? <sighs> Maybe a game of eight ball. Nah, straight pool. What's the good of that? One shot and I run the whole table. <sighs> Where's the phone? 1-800-PIP. Yes, Mr. Valentine. What can I do for you? You can get yourself over here right away. I got a bone to pick with you. Really? Stop all that creeping around. Why don't you use the front door like regular people? Anything you say, Mr. Valentine. Anything I say, anything I say. Will you knock it off? Is something wrong, sir? No! Nothing's wrong! Everything's peachy! Look, I've been here for a month and I can't take it anymore. I don't understand. I'll spell it out. I'm bored, fatso. I'm bored. There's no excitement around here, you dig? No kicks. But the gambling, I thought you enjoyed it. I do, but when you win every time, that ain't gambling, that's charity. I could arrange for you to lose occasionally. Would that help? Yeah, maybe. No, no good, I'd know. Perhaps you miss your old vocation. Now you're getting warm. There's a nice bank you could rob. It's on the corner. Or would you prefer a jewelry store? Bank's okay, I guess. Fine. Now, as to the getaway car, we have quite a wide selection. Something inconspicuous, I imagine. Any chance I'll get caught? Certainly, if that's what you'd like. Let me make a note of it. Look, don't bother. Look, Fatso, I don't know how to say this, but it just ain't the same thing. What's the kick in knocking off a bank if everybody's in on it, huh? Even the dames. I never thought I'd get bored with beautiful dames, but... See, I wouldn't expect an angel to understand this. Scoring with the chick doesn't mean anything if she's set up in advance. I mean, 
Everything's great, really great. It's just the way I always imagined it. But see, I tell you, Fats, I don't think I fit in here. Oh, nonsense. Of course you do. No, I'm serious. Somebody must have goofed. Look, I'm going to go nuts if I have to stay here another day. I I just don't belong in heaven. I, wa I want to go to... I want to go to the other place. Heaven? <laughs> Whatever gave you the idea, you were in heaven. Mr. Valentine, this, this is, is the other place. <laughs> <laughs> Portrait of Henry Francis Valentine. Small-time crook, grifter, thief, and worse. A scared, angry little man who never got the breaks he thought he deserved. Now he has everything he ever wanted. And he's going to have to live with it for all eternity in a place called the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. A Nice Place to Visit, starring Hal Sparks with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Nick Sandys, Doug James, Laura Russell, Fernette Lebo, Amber Lake, Jeff Lupiton, Vince Amari, Kurt Nabig, Rosalind Alexander, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. In His Image, starring John Hurd. With Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Elissa Fraden, Anne Whitney, Darren Stevens, Jeff Lupiton, Meg Falcon, Elizabeth Lido, Carl Amari, Doug James, Jason Mallow, and Kip Karstad. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Morning. Morning, officer. Trying to beat the rush, huh? What's that? The morning rush. Oh, yeah. Going to work early? Not today. Today I'm going out of town. Pretty smart. Another hour, so many people getting on the subway, you'll think you're in Grand Central Station. Now, they're just getting up, fixing coffee. I know, it's weird. Hmm? 
With the streets so empty, I didn't even take time for coffee. Wish I could get some. Not around here. I thought there'd be a 24-hour coffee shop or something. All closed. Gotta shut down sometime. Or clean up. Yeah, well, have a good day. Take her easy. The trains run this early, don't they? 24-7. Right down the stairs. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't see you. Are you sick, young man? Me? You look sick. My husband looked like that just before he died. All white and pasty. I'm all right. Just what he said. The same words. I'm all right. Went to bed. Next morning there he was, sprawled out, dead. You don't drink, do you? No. That's what killed my Jack. I told him it was the devil's work. But he wouldn't listen. And look where he is now. Is that right? Oh, the devil's all around us, mister. And if we don't fight him, if we don't stand up to him, we'll suffer eternal torment. I'm sure you're right. I know I am. And I'll tell you how I know. It was a Sunday. I was ironing, if you please. And that's when it happened. The good Lord's own sweet voice, like an electricity shock. I was revelated. Oh, praise him, mister, and praise his good works. I will, I will, I will. Do you read the good book? Yeah, all the time. Oh, sure, you're telling the truth now. We may be underground, but he hears every word. Uh, I have to go. The train's coming. I don't hear any train. Leviticus. Chapter 5, verse 2. Perfect. You're perfect. What? Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of unclean cattle, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he shall also be unclean and guilty. If you're not perfect, then kill. Kill and end it now. Please. Don't you want to be saved? No, I just want to be left alone. We're never alone. Don't you know that? He's with us all the time and he'll help us if we only let him. But we've got to be saved first. Read this pamphlet. All right. The devil means to have you, but I won't let him. I'll fight with you, mister. My train. The train to glory. Get on board. Stop, please, stop. Listen to me. It's your salvation. Kill, kill. Get away from me. What are you doing? Stop. No. What in God's name? She fell on the tracks. I couldn't stop. Hey, that man pushed her. Hey, somebody stop him. Somebody! Get away from me. Incident in a subway station. It could be the end of a particularly terrifying nightmare. But it isn't. It's the beginning. The young man's name is Alan Talbot. And although he doesn't know it yet, he has a ticket to a strange new world that's too real to be a dream. A living nightmare that begins at a stop called the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, In His Image. Starring John Hurd, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Yes? Sorry to bother you, ma'am, but see, like, I belong to the Junior Woodchucks, and if you'll just buy a 10-year subscription to the Ladies' Home Companion, I'll get to go to summer camp. What do you think? I think you'd better come in. Okay. Hi. Hi. Ready? And willing. Surprised? A little. Come here. 
Okay, now, Tiger, I told you there are lines I don't cross. I know. I was gonna wait till we got married, but I lost my self-control for a second. Well, you look around for it while I pour the coffee. Thanks. How come so late? Who's late? You are. What, five minutes? Try 45. Oh, honey, I told you to get rid of that sundial. Okay, so you overslept. Just remember, leaving at 6 a.m. wasn't my idea. Look, I did not oversleep. I left the hotel at 4.30, got on a subway train, got off the subway and came here. Therefore... Therefore, you must have stopped off for a couple of short beers. It's now quarter to seven. Look at your watch. See? Yeah, I see. But I don't understand. I do. You were enjoying those last moments of freedom. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what? Well, you said you wanted to bring some food along, so I roasted us a chicken. Looks like it got a little crispy. Jess? Hmm? Are you sure? What do you mean? Do you know what you're doing? Of course I do. I, a 31-year-old spinster of sound mind and body, am going to run away to a town I've never heard of for the purpose of marrying a guy I've known exactly four days. Anything odd about that? I'm serious. So am I. I mean, shouldn't you get to know a little more about me? Like what? I know that your name is Alan Talbot. I know that you live in Coraville, New York, in a big white house surrounded by rose bushes and trees. I know that you do scientific research on some kind of weapons device for the government. Not weapons, computer electronics. See? Already you're romanticizing me. Don't interrupt. You are visiting New York City for the pure, morbid pleasure of it, currently rooming at the Chesterfield Inn. You make a modest but adequate salary. You're kind to small animals and chestnut vendors. And let's see, you're terribly lonely and in desperate need of a woman five feet, nine inches tall, answering to the name of Jessica Connolly, right? Right. And you are single. At the moment. Well, then, we'll just have to do something about that. Here, wrap the chicken in foil and put it in the picnic basket while I get the suitcase. Sounds good to me. Think I'll like Coraville? Only if you happen to like great little towns full of warm, friendly people. Only a week away from the place and already he's homesick. I better like it. You will, and you'll love Aunt Mildred. Well, are you going to stall all day, or are you going to make an honest woman out of me? Let's go. We must be nearly there, if you gave me the right directions. Alan? No, no. Go on then, sleep. You need it. Walter, no. Alan? No. It isn't right. Send me back. Alan, hey. What? What? Huh? What's the matter? You were having a nightmare. I was? Must have been the chicken. You didn't care for it? Uh, I didn't tell you, but chicken doesn't care much for me. From the way you were thrashing around, I'd say it hates you. Who's Walter? Who's who? You kept yelling, Walter. Well, this isn't the best time to tell you, but he happens to be my brother. Oh? Well, I didn't know you had a brother. Yeah, tragic case. We keep him locked up in the cellar. And I don't like to think about it. <laughs> Alan, you idiot. <laughs> Actually, I don't know any Walter. Maybe you don't, but asleep, you're scared to death of him. I said I don't know any Walter. Okay, Grouch. <sighs> Sorry. Want me to drive? If you like. Just be careful. I haven't got it paid for yet. Slide over. We'll switch. How far is this rustic paradise, anyhow? Another few miles. You see that Scatter Creek? Yes. I played there when I was a kid. Every time I ran from home, I'd just get about this far to that grove of trees. Love Alley, we called it. Great place to take girls. What they used to call sparking. How would you know? Oh, my dear. Among sparking circles, I was nicknamed the Human Electrode. Lovely. What am I getting into? <laughs> 
What do you say we find out? <laughs> Here we are. Coraville. Population 3,250. Sounds cozy. It is. That's the town square up ahead. Alan, it's beautiful. Didn't I tell you? A little village. It reminds me of West Hampton. Trees, shops. Oh, look at that old hotel. That's the New Brunswick. Got an ice cream parlor and a magazine rack. You can get cigarettes there, too. If you can prove you're 21. Mr. Van Brooks very strict about that. Think I could pass? Uh, maybe not. And over there, to the right, you can't see it from here, but the library is down Oak Street. Don't stop now. I want to see all of it. Alan? Uh, I'm sorry, it's just a... Uh... What? Well, either I've got the worst memory in the world or they put up a new office building. I see it. In a week? Prefab, I guess. I tell you, young lady, they don't make things of it easy. Oh, well, let's go. Alan, do me a favor. Sure. Let's get something first, before we meet the gang. Just a little glass of wine to take the edge off, all right? Relax. In the first place, it isn't a gang, it's just Don Mildred. In the second place, there aren't any bars in Corville. Well, I, I thought I saw one a couple of blocks back. Nope, nope. Nearest place is Temple, 15 miles away. How about a coffee? I guess that'll have to do. What a lovely lobby. Is this the way you remember it? Well, something I could do for you folks? Where's the restaurant? Uh, four doors down, Kelsey's Cafe. Well, I mean the one here. What happened? You close it up? Never had one here, just the hotel. This is New Brunswick, isn't it? Yes, sir. I see. I know how absent-minded you scientists are, so you won't mind me asking. Are you sure we're in the right town? Yes, I'm sure. Well, don't snap at me. Sorry. Look, Jess, let's let's just go on home, my home, and get something there. Anything you say. Is that your Mr. Brooks behind the counter? No. I don't know who he is. It's like 20 years have gone by or something. Everything's different. I think you're just looking at things in a new way, for the first time. I've lived near Times Square all my life, but I don't think I've really seen it for years. That's probably it. Now that's a classic house. Two stories, Cape Cod style. And there are the trees and rose bushes. Yeah, yeah, that's more like it. I'd recognize that anywhere. Like it? And what if I didn't? Of course I do after listening to you. It's charming. Almost home. First thing we'll do is paint it pink. Why not purple? That'll work. <sighs> the key must be bent. And Mildred! And Mildred! Hey, you're gonna shake up the whole neighborhood. Got to, she's hard of hearing. What do you want? I'm Alan Talbot. So? So, I happen to live here. Would you mind telling me who you are and what you're doing in my house? Are you crazy? Just a minute. Where's my aunt? Who? Mildred Talbot? Now, mister, you listen to me. You made some kind of mistake. I live here. I've lived here for nine years. Bought the place from Gerald Butler. I've got the deed to prove it. I don't know anybody named Mildred, and I don't know you. Now get off of my property, or I'll call the sheriff. Wait! Wait! What? What is going on? Alan? Alan? I'm 
back. Get everything straightened out at City Hall? Sure. I'm out of my mind. Alan. Well, I don't know what else to think. Somebody I never saw before in my life living in my house. The woman I had lunch with a week ago, dead for three years. New buildings in town. According to the official records, it's all true. Alan, I know this will sound crazy, but remember what you said when we tried to get coffee at that hotel? The one that didn't have a coffee shop? You said it was as though Coraville had aged 20 years. 20 years in a week? What if it's true? What if 20 years have gone by somehow? Rip Van Winkle? Well, why not? It's a possibility, isn't it? No. I thought of that, but it doesn't hold up. For one thing, it would make me at least 45. Unless I left town at the age of 10. And that couldn't be because I went to high school and college here. Except there aren't any records that I ever attended Corville High. And the university I worked for, it doesn't exist. It never existed. Well, what about your aunt? I just checked. There isn't a single trace of evidence that a Mildred Talbot ever lived here. Well, it was an idea. Let's go. Where to now? The cemetery. Gates open. Alan, what are you doing this for? To find out whether the world's gone crazy or I have. My parents are buried here, and if I can find their graves... At least this cemetery's been here for a while. Look at the vines on the statues. Angels, stone crosses. Do you recognize anything? Yes, over there. The two headstones side by side. But I don't understand. Mary F. Cummings... Walter B. Cummings, Sr. Is that your name, Cummings? No. Those are the ones? That's them, all right. What do you want? Leave him alone, please. This man says you created a disturbance at his house. It was a mistake. Says you claimed it was your house. I thought it was. I'm sorry. You want to press charges? Well, as long as he admits it, I, I guess not, but... You better not come around again, young fella. I won't. Go on back to the car. I'll be along in a minute. All right, Sheriff. It was all a misunderstanding. What's your name, son? Alan Talbot. This your wife? No, my fiancé. Well, Mr. Talbot, want to tell me what you're doing in Coorville? You're the sheriff? That's right. And I suppose you never heard of Carl Jasperson. Sure I heard of him. He's the man I replaced. You know him? He's my godfather. Where can I find him? Find him? Over there. By the monument. You mean he's... Here he is. Carl Jasperson. I have to get out of here. Alan! Miss? What do you want? I, I can't force you to do anything because you haven't broken any laws. But I suggest you take him to a doctor. He looks sick. You may be right. Ain't my business, but the way he was staring at those graves. Is he kin to Walter Cummings? I don't know. Now, if you'll excuse me. It's only a few more miles to New York. How do you feel? Alan? Alan, don't shut me out. I don't have anything to say. Honey, there's a rational explanation for all of this. There has to be. Dr. Matthews had a patient once who couldn't even remember her own name. Please don't humor me. She had no idea where she was or how she got there. When Dr. Matthews talked to her, she couldn't remember a thing about her life. But two weeks of treatment and she was all right again. It was a form of amnesia. You'll like Dr. Matthews. Then kill. You must kill. Wrong, Walter. Wrong. And he treated Sandy, my roommate. I don't know whether I told you about her. But anyway, she had a breakdown in... Stop the car. Are you going to be sick? Yes, st stop the car. Kill. 
No! Use what's at hand. A stick, a rock, anything. Jess, could you give me a hand here? Where are you? Over here. What is it? No, don't come any closer. What? Stay away from me. Get back in the car and drive away as fast as you can. Alan. Why are you holding that rock in your hand? I'll see you at your apartment. But how will you get there? Never mind, just go. For God's sake, just go. Now! If that's what you want. Run! Before I... Kill. Kill. No! Jess! Oh, Jess. Jess. What? Mister, are you all right? I didn't see you. Honest, I came over the hill and... Hey, mister, can you can you stand up? I'm okay. The fender just grazed me. Yeah, but your sleeve, it, it's torn. How's your arm? You hurt bad? I'm not sure. Look, I'll drive you to a hospital. No, I don't need a hospital. Take me to my place. Uh, where's that? In the city, the Chesterfield Hotel. I'd, uh, I'd rather see my own doctor. Look, anything you say. Come on. You, you can lie down in the back seat. I got a first aid kit. Look, is that a bad cut? No. I still think you ought to see a doctor. I will, as soon as we get there, but I'm not even bleeding. Not on the outside, maybe. I I've heard of accidents where you... I'm fine, I'm fine. I'll sign anything you want, absolving you of all blame, okay? Look, don't get sore, mister. I'm just worried about you is all. Sorry to have been so much trouble. Mister, I'm glad you're alive. Look, it's none of my business, but... How come you were standing there in the middle of the road like that? I'm not sure. I'm gonna find out. Yes? Alan? Oh, darling. I've been calling every 15 minutes. I'm so worried about you. Are you all right? I think so. I scraped my arm after you left, but I've got a bandage on it. Looks fine. Oh, Alan, are you sure? Yes, there's no bleeding. How did you get home? I caught a ride. Listen, Jess, why don't you just forget about me? I don't understand what's going on and... You listen, Alan. You'd do that after everything that's happened? You bet your life I would. Look, Mr. Talbot, I didn't plan to fall in love with you, but I did. And I'm stuck with it, for better or worse. Thank you. That means a lot. Want me to come over? No. No, I'd like to be alone, think things through. I'll see you in the morning. Good night, Jess. There it is again. The noise. The noise. Where is it coming from? Where? My arm. What's wrong with my arm? Oh, the blood. Let's take off this bandage and see. What in the... There's no blood because it... This isn't real skin! It just peels back. It peels back and good lord, I don't believe it. It's a... It's a circuit board! Hello? Hello, Alan. I've been waiting for you. You're real. That's a matter of opinion. Sit down, Alan. I'll fix us a drink. Go on. There's nothing to be afraid of. No? 
By the way, you almost killed me with those scissors. Did you know that? What scissors? I wish you'd succeeded, but nothing ever works out right for me. Scars next to my heart, close but no cigar. Who are you? You already know that. You must. You found me. I looked you up in the phone book. Walter F. Cummings, Jr.? You've been to Corville. Yes. I saw your father's grave. So you know my name. That's all? That's all. Well, then you better have some of that martini. What is this place? You were born here in this house exactly eight days ago. I made the delivery. You're drunk. <laughs> my boy, you're so right. Drunk as a hootie owl, but not drunk enough. Join me in another? I guarantee no hangover. Wasn't that thoughtful of me? I'm in no mood for jokes, Cummings. That's a pity, because this whole thing is a joke. But you see, the joke's on me, and the essence of humor... Get to the point! Well, you've been to Corville, so you know that Alan Talbot never lived there. You know that you've been behaving oddly of late, and from the bandage around your arm, I judge you've figured out the rest. What more can I tell you? Who am I? You're nobody. You're nobody at all. Who is this watch I'm wearing? Ask me that. Who is the refrigerator in the kitchen? Don't you get it? No. You're a machine, Alan. A mechanical device. I don't believe you. Not even after you've seen what's under your skin. I don't blame you. I wouldn't either, but it's true. The fact is you were born a long time ago inside my head. All kids have dreams, don't they? You're mine. A perfect, artificial man. Not a robot, but a duplicate of an actual human being. You're still dreaming, am I? It was harmless. Not even terribly imaginative for a child. But then I became an adult, only somewhere along the line I forgot to grow up. Like most geniuses, I kept my dream. Why don't you take off the training wheels and talk straight? <sighs> I created you. Is that straight enough? You're not only drunk, you're crazy. Then how would you explain the circuits in your arm instead of flesh and blood? A prosthetic arm? I don't know. You expect me to believe I'm a machine? It's ridiculous. I eat, I drink, I sleep. I just told you I wanted a perfect creation. Come with me, Alan. Where? Downstairs. Let's call it the delivery room. You didn't think I whipped you up in my living room, did you? What is this room? My lab, your birthplace. Over here, Alan. On the gurneys. Go ahead. Lift the sheets. No? Let me do it for you. What are they? Your brothers. Alan Talbot the first and Alan Talbot the second. You were number three in this batch. Hard to tell them apart, I know. They're only partially formed. I didn't add the finishing touches like circuitry. Call them factory rejects. Where'd you get the money for all this? Told you. I'm a genius. When I saw how much money I'd need, I developed a new kind of microchip. They turn out three or four hundred thousand a year. I get royalties. Money was the least of it. The failures, though. The failures? They were bad. I can't tell you how many times I had to start over. And you did it all by yourself? I'm afraid the day of the lone inventor is past. I had some of the best scientific minds in the world working for me. But of course, they didn't take the project seriously. It was just a game to them. How to create a nervous system, how to duplicate a brain. With all its subtleties, mere reactions weren't enough. Intelligence is what I was after. My creation had to have abstract reasoning power, a past, all the intricate facets of personality multiplied by millions that make up true consciousness. Now, accomplishing this from scratch would have taken forever. So, I decided to use myself. So you're telling me I'm you? On some of your cells, I made certain impressions, my own memories, some of my talent, some of my knowledge, bits and pieces of myself. It isn't possible. I'm me. This is my body. <laughs> Non-conductive plastic? Very lifelike. I've heard enough. Where are you going? Back to Corville? You lived there? Of course. I gave you my memories of the town. Some of them were outdated. I left 20 years ago. What about the university? Fictitious. I had to give you a job. And Aunt Mildred? All the old women I've ever known rolled into one. 
After my parents died, I lived alone. The reputation as a Don Juan, I regret to say, is imaginary too. That's about it. You can fill in the rest, up to the last week anyway. What happened then? I wish I knew. Something went wrong. You attacked me with a pair of scissors and ran off. I've been unable to find you since. What went wrong? I'm not sure. But whatever it is, it's wrong with me too, because everything you know or think or feel reflects some portion of myself. And if you wanted to kill, it means part of me wants to kill. <laughs> My own death wish, inverted. I don't have a death wish. Everyone does. We're all potential suicides or murderers. We all have the seeds of paranoia inside of us. In giving you parts of myself, I unintentionally gave you my latent psychoses. Big ones. To put it another way, Alan, you're quite insane. Then fix me. I don't know if I can. Why not? Because, much as I hate to admit it, luck had a great deal to do with your creation. You mean I was an accident? Trial and error. It was like a blind man with a machine gun. Finally hit the target, but it was off center. I don't know if I could... I, I don't know if I could come that close again. I thought you were a genius. That's the story of my life. Success in the little things, failure in the big ones. I think what I really wanted was to build another Walter Cummings without the drawbacks. Sort of a reverse Jekyll and Hyde, loneliness, pain, all unknown. <laughs> Alan, you were going to be perfect. That was the dream. That was the dream. A perfect version of myself. Well, there's somebody else involved. A woman. Does she know? I took her to Corville. We were going to get married there. She thinks I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown. She's in love with me. Pretty. And intelligent. And lonely. Like you. I'm sorry, Alan. Huh. That's a great consolation. Even if I could fix you, she'd find out. How? Well, for one thing, she'd grow old and you wouldn't. For another, being a machine, you'd eventually wear out. And those things never occurred to you? I suppose I didn't think I'd succeed as well as I did. You can still make it right. I'd give anything if I could. You can. You've got the tools, the instruments. You're going to build another Alan Talbot. Too risky. Only this time, you're going to get it right. One of these blanks, the rejects, with some modifications. I don't know if I can. With all that you know now, it'll be easy. He's going to walk out of here tonight, and he's going to marry a girl named Jessica, and for the first time in his miserable life, he's going to be happy. And so will she. You don't understand. The process takes too much time. There is no more time. Here, I'll write down her address. She was going to meet me tomorrow, but she'll be home now. Take it. That's appropriate. What is? This pamphlet, The Way to Salvation. Where did you get it? Somebody gave it to me. I was in, uh, I was in... Read this pamphlet. The devil means to have you, but I won't let him. I'll fight with you, mister, and we'll win. My train. The train to glory. Get on board. What's wrong? The noise. Make it stop. Are you hearing something? In my head, like computers and electricity. It's your circuits. They're going bad. And a train. Get on board. Walter, get on board. Your eyes. Your eyes. Get away from me. Now, Walter. Now. <laughs> Don't, Alan. The equipment. You take the address. Promise me. Stop. You. Walter, it's the only way. Get out, now, and remember what you've learned. Try to remember. <sighs> Just a minute. Who is it? I'm sorry to bother you, ma'am, but see, like, I belong to the junior woodchucks and... Helen! Is it really you? Mmm. You are pretty. I've been so worried. Why are you looking at me like that? I guess I never expected to see you again. Disappointed? Amazed. I mean, after this morning. Forget this morning. I have. We're gonna start all over. But, Alan... Please. It was a nightmare, that's all. Now you're awake and everything's gonna be fine. A second chance. A second chance for both of us. Do you believe that? Yes. Then so do I. If you promise you'll tell me about it someday. Someday. But now, how about a cup of coffee? Coming up.
And a couple of Mother Connolly's hand-fried eggs? Well... Guaranteed to make a new man of you. In that case, yes. <laughs> Too late to fight this fire. The whole place is gone. Whose was it? There's some scientist guy named uh, Cummings. Lived alone. He got out okay. Well, no more laboratory for him. Burned to the ground. What's this? Looks like a mannequin. Crash test dummy, huh? Nothing but melted plastic. Sick it's still going inside the head. Look at all those wires. Leave it for the cleanup truck. Fire crew, over here. This has been the story of Walter Cummings Jr., AKA Alan Talbot. In a way, he succeeded with his life's ambition, even though the man he created was, after all, himself. But that creation is now relegated to the junk heap. One more failed experiment. While Mr. Cummings has been given another chance, for better or worse, there may be easier paths to self-improvement, but sometimes it happens that the shortest distance between two points is a crooked line, one that leads directly through the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone after these brief messages. You are about to enter another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. 